In high school, Christian Weston Chandler took a visual design class and was tasked to create an album cover. His love of Sonic the Hedgehog, who's known for his cool, chill music, led Chris to want to put Sonic on his album. Chris's teacher told him he was not allowed to use a copyrighted character in his art, so Chris returned to the drawing board, dejected. Then, he combined Sonic the Hedgehog with Pikachu to create Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon. Chris would let the idea of Sonichu cultivate in his mind for four years until he wrote the first issue of Sonichu the comic, which he called Issue Zero. On the iconic cover of Issue Zero, Chris has front and center the copyright info and his name, even though the comic isn't officially copyrighted. Chris even signed the comic in the shadow of his own character. This first issue was drawn on November 24th, 2004. The first weird thing to note is Sonichu calls Chris father, which is just a little bit creepy. On the next page, we see Chris start to number the pages, and he repeats that it is copyrighted. Just to note, there's a typo in the very first sentence of the comic book. Our story begins in an open field five miles from the city of Station Square. Keep in mind that this was written and drawn by a 20-year-old. So the story starts from the perspective of a Pikachu five miles away from a battle Sonic the Hedgehog is fighting. The comic does nothing to introduce what a Pikachu is or who Sonic is, so it expects the reader to have prior knowledge of both Pokemon and Sonic. Sonic is fighting the perfect chaos monster, and since I have not played Sonic, I have no idea what that is. Chris decides to pop in and tell the reader that he is the creator of Sonichu and the writer of the comic, immediately breaking the fourth wall for no foreseeable reason. This Pikachu art is also... I mean, I mean, Chris's art isn't good. No one would call it good. But I'm so used to looking at him draw his own characters that there's something just so disturbing about seeing a Pikachu drawn like this. I, I don't like it. So on the first page, we have to deal with the pre-established lore of Pokemon, Sonic, the existence of Chris within the comic, and the comic's use of the creator talking directly with the audience, which is obviously all very confusing. On the next page, we get a meanwhile, and we see Sonic powering up with the Chaos Emeralds to fight the monster. The ordering of the panels is very confusing, but it seems to be cutting back and forth between Sonic powering up to face the monster and Pikachu running toward the city. On the third page, we see uh, whatever this is. I think Pikachu is looking at Sonic fighting the monster, but it really just looked like he's staring into the monster's mouth. Then this happens, and then Sonic gives Pikachu a little kiss. No, he is slammed into Pikachu by the monster, and they produce rainbow energy. Then, in the middle of the page, it flashes to 15 miles away. That's exactly 15 miles. It couldn't have just been by the ocean, or at a cottage. No, it's, it's exactly 15 miles away. And there is a girl Raichu. And the comic labels her specifically as a girl, and she's hit with the rainbow energy. We then see the Raichu and Pikachu slowly turn into what eventually would be called Rosechu and Sonichu, respectively. The text tells us that this is at the cottage, but because we haven't been introduced to the cottage yet, that isn't very helpful. This girl comes out, concerned about the Blast of Light, and she sees that her Raichu has transformed. The trainer comments that her Raichu, in her new form, looks as beautiful as a rose, and Rosechu responds that her new name should be Zapbud. I, I have no idea why it says that, because her name ends up being Rose Chu. Then, Sonichu wakes up in his new form and sees the perfect chaos monster still causing havoc, so he runs super fast towards the beast. Then, the comic gives us another meanwhile, even though it's still saying with the same characters in the same location. Sonichu uses his new electric attack to use thunder on the creature, but misses even though the art shows it hitting the monster's head directly. Sonichu can fly for some reason, even though neither Sonic nor Pikachu possess the ability to fly. I think Supersonic can fly, but you can usually tell that Sonic is in supersonic form because he's yellow, but since Sonic 2 is always yellow, I really have no idea what's going on. So Sonic flies in and creates a whirlwind or something, and then people are cheering his name. 
Then Sonichu looks over the sunset and thinks to himself that he's gained super speed and can talk now. The chapter ends with Sonichu naming himself Sonichu, and Chris popping up to tell us that this Sonichu will use his powers to stop evil. Then, instead of ending the issue, Chris goes right on ahead with a roll call of all the upcoming characters that haven't even been introduced. Keep in mind that this issue so far has been seven pages. So first, Chris tells us that the comic is titled Sonichu, and by that, we man the saga of the electric hedgehog Pokemon. Also, he always goes to the effort to make the E in Pokemon lowercase, but he doesn't put the accent over it. Technically, it's pronounced Pokemon, but since I've never said it that way, I'm not gonna start now. So the story is set in the city of Quickville, not Station Square or wherever that last battle was. Quick are Chris's initials, CWC, Christian Wesson Chandler. Also, Sonic's powers are to go very fast, so it's a great coincidence that his name also spells out Quick. That's the kind of ridiculous thing that I love about the story of Chris Chan. Chris is also the mayor of Quickville. Then we get the rundown on Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon. If you're wondering why he keeps saying that, each Pokemon has a description associated with it, like Pikachu is the electric mouse Pokemon, Charizard is the flame Pokemon, Bulbasaur is the seed Pokemon. So Chris took electric mouse and changed it to electric hedgehog, because Sonichu is a hedgehog. Also, he didn't use the lowercase e here in Pokemon, so I guess so much for that. Sonichu is 16 years old, is very active, which Chris isn't, and he's in love with Rosechu, despite the two of them not having met yet in the story. Then there's this weird smiley face at the bottom of the screen, I don't know what that's about. Then we have Rosechu, who Chris says is spunky. She's a girl electric hedgehog Pokemon, as if girl is its own species. Well, she's 15, likes frolicking through fields, cooking, and going to the mall. If you've ever wondered why people are dubious if Chris actually knows enough about women to be transgender, then that should tell you why. Her nickname is Rosie, and her favorite flower is the Zap Bud. Then we meet Kel, Rosie's Pokemon trainer, and Nate Cirque, the son of Giovanni. Yes, his name is Christian spelled backwards, which is obviously super uncreative. So continuing, now we get this Shadow the Hedgehog ripoff. It's Black Sonichu, or Blachu, and he's evil. He was created in Giovanni's lab, so he's kind of like Mewtwo, but he also had Cherry Cola spilled on him, so he's also like Shadow the Hedgehog or something. Then Chris explains that the energy from the Chaos Emeralds hitting Pikachu created five eggs, which means that Sonic did way more than just kiss Pikachu in that one panel. Those five eggs hatched into different colored Sonichus. There's Wild Sonichu, who's Grass type. Bubbles Rosechu, who's Water and Electric type. Then Angelica Rosechu, who's flying and electric. Angelica was raised by nuns and is very spiritual, meaning that God and Jesus exist in this Pokemon Sonic crossover. Then there's Punchy Sonichu, who looks more like Knuckles, and he also has not very well-drawn eyes. There's a reason the community has dubbed this character Asian Knuckles. And finally, we have Magichan, who's electric and psychic type, and just looking at him makes me very uncomfortable. This moment in Chris's life in 2004 when he drew this would go on to have a huge impact on the rest of his life, and it's actually very sad to think about what might have happened if he had just not drawn this comic, and Magichan in particular. It's, it's very rough. Then we have the Flame Sunbird, and then there's more Sonichus who apparently weren't hatched from eggs. That's Chris Chan Sonichu, who's blue like real Sonic, Samantha Rosechu, and Wesley Sonichu. And then more villains! In a previous video I made long ago, I said I would not give out the name of the primary villain in Chris's comic because she's named after a real person. But it would be kind of hard not to talk about her throughout this whole thing, and her name's already out there. Uh, Mary Lee Walsh was the name of the Dean of Students at Chris's college who tore up the sign he made asking for a white boyfriend to free girl, and Chris hated her so much that he made her the villain in his comic. The other bad guys are Jerk Ops, which is a portmanteau of jerk and cop, because Chris doesn't like mall cops who banned him from his town mall. Chris then talks about himself, his love for Legos and video games, he lists his height, his birthday, where he's going to school, and the fact that he wants a girlfriend. He then links to a webpage that doesn't exist. 
So Sonic 2 issues are split into chapters. This is issue 0, but it has multiple chapters. So next is chapter 2 of issue 0, titled Genesis of the Love Hogs, which is an obvious pun on the word Genesis, which is the name of the video game console that Sonic debuted on. So Sonic is wandering around really hungry, and he spots Rose Chew. Now, keep in mind that this is the world where Sonic the Hedgehog really exists, which means that Amy Rose also probably does exist, which means that there are other anthropomorphic hedgehogs who aren't Pokemon. So for Sonic Chew to look at her and think she, that she's a Pokemon is really weird. So he immediately falls in love with her and chases her for 15 minutes despite being super speedy. He follows her back to the cottage from before, and he calls it a cabin, which is something that should be consistent, but Chris obviously doesn't care. Sonichu sees Kel and thinks that she is Rosie's trainer, which, once again, makes no sense because there's no reason he should assume that Rosie is a Pokemon. So Sonichu thinks he can get a meal if he goes inside, and Kel says she's going to make Rosie some Brunswick stew, which is comically specific. Inside, Rosechu complains that she's lonely because there's no other Pokemon like her, so she can't find a mate. Now, in Pokemon, Pokemon can breed with Pokemon of a different species. It's this whole thing called egg groups, but yeah, you don't need two Squirtles to make a Squirtle, so Rosechu doesn't need another hedgehog to fall in love with. Kel suggests that Rosie dates her Dragonite, whose name is David for some reason, but Rosie says he's too big for her, which I'm, I'm not going to read into that. And uh, she says that Kel can have him, and that means that in this world, humans date Pokemon, which I... Moving on. Here we have Chris's trademark of taking up an entire panel with text and relegating the picture to literally just the side of a person's face. So to no one's surprise, Sanju knocks on the door, answering Rosie's prayers. He drops the coolest line ever. Hey. Then we get this magical panel. I... I don't believe it. A handsome Pokemon who I've is got to, like, learn me about him. <laughs> so Rosie pulls him inside by force and holds his hands and is immediately in love. Sonichu introduces himself, and Rosechu says, My name is Rosechu, but you can call me anytime. So, obviously Chris stole that pickup line from somewhere. Sonichu says he'll call her Rosie, which is lucky because that was already her nickname, even though no one talked to him about that. Rose then points out, oh my god, what is that? Chris is obviously trying to show Rosie turning around really quickly, so he drew this terrifying two-headed Rosie saying two things at once. Then Kel calls Rosie Risey and says Sonichu and Rosie are a couple, even though they haven't said anything of the sort. Then the story jumps a couple days in the future, in the last panel of the page. Time and location jumps should be like at the start of a page, so it's not confusing. Chris just really had to wait one more panel to have this time skip, but he didn't. So anyway, Chris forgets that he's writing a comic and not a manga, and has his characters talk in the wrong order. We then get the classic Chris Chan lines. This is one of the first memes associated with him. We're talking classic 2004 Chris Chan. I love you, Rose Chu. As often as birds tweet, you are my lovely heart sweet. And they kiss, and fireworks go off, and there's a full moon. The end. Next is perhaps one of the most fascinating aspects of Chris's comics. He draws a full-page advertisement for non-existent Game Boy games. It's like he's pitching Sonic U games to Game Freak, which he eventually actually does in real life after trolls convince him that Nintendo is interested in making a game about Sonic U. What's interesting to me, and maybe no one else on Earth, is that the games aren't actually normal Pokemon games. So, normally Pokemon games have two versions, like Red and Blue, and Ruby and Sapphire, and Sun and Moon, etc. But that's not what this is. One of the games is Pokemon Lightning version, starring Sonic U, but the other game is Sonic U Advance. So there's a series of Sonic the Hedgehog games called Sonic Advanced on the Game Boy Advance. So one game is a Sonic-like game starring Sonic U, and the other is a Pokemon-like game starring Sonic U. He even drew different logos for them, so one is a Sonic U logo and the other is a Pokemon logo, and I think I've put way too much thought into this, but Chris really did go to great lengths to make this as confusing as possible. Alright, so Chapter 3, Sonichu vs. Nate Sirk. Nate Sirk gives his Team Rocket spiel, and Sonichu announces that he must free Rosechu, who was apparently kidnapped. Nate Sirk then releases Zapdos to fight Sonichu, and we get a flashback in the middle of the page to how it all started. Sonichu and Rosechu went to the mall with Kel's credit card, and it was Sonichu's job to make sure Rosie didn't spend over $100, because, again, Chris believes in gender stereotypes. 
There's this gag where she falls for all the sales, and Sonichu can't stop her shopping rampage, and then they go out to lunch, where Sonichu orders a hamburger, and it comes with a pickle, and he really, really hates pickles. This is a reference to Chris in real life, who also really hates pickles, and that's because he hates penises. He was very anti-male anatomy back in the day, which is of course ironic now, because he is bisexual. So, uh, he would call penises pickles. And so, because he hates penises, he then, by association, hated pickles. So then Zapdos swoops in, steals Rose Chu, and Sonichu runs to save her. The flashback portion was narrated by Sonichu, which is weird because Chris has been the narrator so far, and he's the one who breaks the fourth wall. So now we arrive back in the present, where Sonichu and Zapdos have a Pokemon battle. He uses Sky Uppercut, and Drill Peck, and Mega Kick, and Wing Attack, and Double Team, and those are all real Pokemon moves. But in the games, Double Team just raises your evasiveness, which makes it harder for you to be hit. It doesn't make your opponent confused, but that's what the move does to Zapdos here. Then there's a countdown to the final blow, and each panel has a number counting down from 10, but it stops at 4, and then 4 through 1 are all in the same panel, so Chris really could have just started at a lower number, but he chose not to. Then Sonichu beats up Zapdos and saves Rosie. We also get this drawing of one of the Double Team clones, which, uh, you couldn't have tried a little harder there, Chris? So Nate Cirque recalls Zapdos and escapes on the back of a Raikou, promising he'll kidnap Sonichu for his father one day. Why does Chris love electric Pokemon so much? The world will never know. Anyway, we get this horrible image again, where Chris tries to depict Sonichu looking two ways at once, and then Chris himself enters the story. He thanks Sonichu for saving the day. Now, see, I thought Chris was Sonichu's father, which was explained earlier in the story, but here it seems like they don't know each other. Then we get this epilogue, and it's even more confusing because Sonichu calls Chris father again. How is Chris Sonichu's father? Did he give birth to Pikachu? So, I think I have it figured out. See, Chris says he thinks the comic was his best work yet, which is breaking the fourth wall. I think that in the world of Sonichu, the characters exist outside of the story itself, like in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So Chris, as a creative person, birthed Sonichu from his mind by drawing him, thus he created a tune. Then he has Sonichu act in these stories that he comes up with, so in that way, Sonichu is his son because he's made by him, but in the story within the comic book, he's just a Pikachu who was hit by chaos energy. That's also how Rose Chu can be Chris's daughter, but Sonichu and Rose Chu being married isn't incest. I, I, I think that's how that works, I don't know. Anyway, Sonichu makes a jab about Chris not having a girlfriend, and Chris goes off to the mall to find boyfriend free girl. Sonichu says to himself in the final panel, quote, There he goes, with a grin on his face. In the end, he'll say, one girlfriend, please, because he'll probably fail again. I'm proud to have a brave father. Now, I'm going to imagine for a moment what someone who knows nothing about Chris might think while reading this comic. And they just lost their sanity, just like me. Moving on. The comic ends with some strips Chris drew before making the full comic. So these are one-off strips like Sonichu 25 Years in the Future, where Sonichu cuts some logs, and a Valentine's Day comic where Black Sonichu follows Rosie and Sonichu around for no reason. Chris and Sonichu then corner the evil Mary Lee Walsh, and Chris lets out a Curse Hameha, which is a superpower that Chris believed he actually had in real life to curse people with bad luck. And then they, like, kill her or something in TIE 5. This is only the beginning of Sonichu being a power fantasy for Chris. Then there's another issue where Chris Chan Sonichu, which is another version of Sonichu, which Chris can transform into, fights Walsh and then collapses for no reason, and his friend, who's based on someone from his real life, friend zones him. And the back cover is Sonichu Adventure for the GameCube, which is obviously supposed to be Sonic Adventure. I love how Chris drew the whole thing by hand, but then he went online and got the only for Nintendo GameCube thing. Uh, and he put it there, because apparently that part was too hard to draw. <laughs> so, that's issue one of Sonichu, 35 pages. Next, there are some sub-issues that take place at random points in the timeline, and mostly focus on Chris. So we have the Jerk Cop Tastropi, because it's spelled wrong. These issues of the comics are semi-autobiographical power fantasies for Chris, and are actually the source of some of the stories we know about him. This issue starts with Chris lamenting that it's been over a year and he still hasn't attracted a boyfriend-free girl. If you're unaware of why Chris uses this strange language, it's because he would often ask out girls and they'd reply that they can't date him because they already have boyfriends. 
So he's not just looking for a girl, he's looking for a boyfriend-free girl. In this issue, we get two panels that are literally just back-to-back -back text. That's, that's not how comic books work, but to Chris it is. So a jerk-op comes up and tells Chris he has to leave, and Chris responds that he's only looking for true love. The cop, who's black, then calls in reinforcements. Chris kicks one of them in the nuts, and then, over the course of a page and a half, transforms into Chris Chan Sonichu. Chris's first line in this new form is, Here we go, let's rock and roll with things that make you go, hmm, everybody dance now. And below the panel, Chris points out that this is a reference to CNC Music Factory, which is the band that sings Everybody Dance Now, as if that wasn't obvious. So the black jerk op equips some metal clock-based armor and the two do battle, and Chris knocks the armor off with a lightning bolt. So then the jerk op shoots Chris with a real bullet, and Chris reflects it, and gives the cop a kursehameha, which Chris draws sideways for an entire page. The cop says the attack did nothing, and he didn't feel anything, and Chris says, Oh, you will. The cop then stands, and immediately slips on a banana peel. Then another cop arrives and tells the black jerk op that his wife is leaving him and taking the kids because he smokes cigarettes. Chris then explains that his kursehameha curses people with bad luck. Then, Chris gives this amazing speech, and I cannot make this up. This is both the epitome of putting yourself in a story, a power fantasy, and bad comic book writing. He says, This would not have happened if you had not challenged and threatened me, as well as not leaving me alone with my ever-frustrating love quest, calling me a lying solicitor, picked on my methods of attracting a boyfriend-free 18, my current age, year-old girl, whom I can love and trust, and, most importantly, handcuffing me on 9-11-2004 for no good reason. I hope that you learn to never mess with a truly frustrated virgin when he is on a quest for a girlfriend to share true love and trust with." The jerk -op then says, My soul hurts. And Chris says, So did mine, and my heart was previously shattered too. The ordering of the bubbles is a little confusing. Chris goes from a paragraph to speech bubbles and includes random asides like the exact date that he was handcuffed in real life, which is just astounding. Uh, but that's the end of sub-episode 1. Sub-episode 1 was 10 pages long. <laughs> Keep in mind that the actual first episode of the comic was 7 pages long. So that's Sonichu issue 0. Three chapters, some bonus strips, and the first sub-story. There's a lot to unpack in terms of Chris having multiple characters that are just Mary Sousa himself, but the story will just get weirder from here. Sonichu issue 1 begins with the birth of Black Sonichu whose Sonichu informs us is his clone mixed with Cherry Cola. The issue was drawn on March 31st, 2005, four months after the last issue. Episode 4 is titled, Black Sonichu in Darkness, Speed, and Lightning. This is clearly the Shadow the Hedgehog slash Waluigi with a gun of the Sonichu canon. The issue starts with a close-up of Zapdos' beak with Sonichu's hair in its mouth. Then we see Giovanni shaking hands with Dr. Robotnik, as Giovanni gives a speech praising his son for obtaining Sonichu's DNA. Then we see Sonichu's DNA and a can of Cherry Cola, and we know this because there's a caption labeling them as such. Bill, the scientist, accidentally spills the cola on the DNA sample and says, oh well, and then they put the DNA into the machine anyway. So in a weird mix of Shadow the Hedgehog and Mewtwo's backstories, Black Sonichu is born, and in his test tube, he thinks to himself that he will betray his creator when he gets free. Nate Cirque comments to himself, I'm not sure, but he looks black to me. Oh well, he'll still shock that hedgehog Pokemon. So they name him Black Sonichu, or Blachu for short, and give him Rocket Shoes so he can be as fast as Sonic. Then we get his training. He can run 200 kilometers an hour. He can punch and destroy 20 tons. And he can spin dash at 200 rotations a minute, which is 3 per second, which is not actually very fast at all. Then Sonichu and Blachu's stats are put next to each other, and we see that Blachu's attack is slightly stronger and his defense is slightly lower, and that's it. The episode ends with Blachu being sent on a mission to destroy Sonichu. Episode 5, Sonichu in informal meeting. I think Chris is just running out of like clever puns, so he thought that putting Sonichu in and then informal meeting would be like alliteration or something clever. The cover is a map showing all the locations we've seen so far, plus some locations that we haven't seen so far and never will. This isn't really relevant to the story, but it will be copied later in the parody comic Tales Gets Trolled, so I figure I'd mention it here. So Sonichu and Rosechu are just chillin' in some flowers, and they decide to go home. 
As they go home, they run into the real Sonic, with Blachu waiting to ambush them. So he jumps out and he steals Rosie, and Sonic and Sonichu crash into each other, and we get this pose from Sonichu, and I would say that this is disturbingly suggestive, but I know what happens later, so this is nothing. Chris keeps drawing these top, for like from the top-down perspectives of the action because he can't really depict where they are in relation to each other. So Sonichu and Sonic suddenly remember each other, and we get this mess of a conversation where Chris literally has to number each line so people would know how to read it. Then the two hedgehogs agree to team up, and we get this, out of nowhere, a message about autism awareness with their logo. If I came across this without any background info on Chris, I'd think it was an out-of-date joke, but of course Chris is just being completely sincere. <laughs> then we get an ad for the Sonichu expansion of the Pokemon TCG that Chris made, which leads us to Chapter 6. Sonic and Sonichu in Black Metal Gombat. Wait, no, Combat. Blachu's ears are just like the same color as the logo, so you can't really read anything. So then Robotnik lays out his plan, then he breaks into song. Robotnik, Robotnik, I'm a mad genius. Robotnik, Robotnik. See, he, he, he just rhymed Robotnik with Robotnik there multiple times. I create chaos with my machines. I'm the darkest evil and I'm mean. <laughs> I have a monkey in my robot. Wait, the monkey is a robot. I turned the animal into a robot. He just rhymed robot with robot three times. And then he ends it with, with the process that I call robotinization, which does not rhyme. That's a, it's great. Then Chris draws himself laughing at Robotnik and proclaiming that he hates Robotnik and that Robotnik's dumb, even though Chris himself just wrote Robotnik's dialogue for him, so I don't, I don't really get it. Chris then says that he idols Sonic instead of idolizes him. So Sonichu rushes in and he meets Blachu and they start fighting. Then Sonichu unknowingly steps on a giant X on the floor. It's just, it's just right there. Robotnik traps Sonichu in a glass container and says it'll sap his energy from him and he can't escape. But they all forgot that Sonic was also there. Eh? You were expecting maybe Bugs Bunny? What does that mean, Chris? So Eggman sends out Metal Sonichu, which is an exact copy of Metal Sonic, and Sonic calls Eggman uncreative. Is this Chris being self-aware or completely unself-aware? I have no idea. So Sonic is so fast that he dodges every attack. He calls Metal Sonichu a Metamon, which is probably a metal Pokemon? I'm not sure. So Sonic rolls so fast that he hits Metal Sonichu, who used a fence curl, and he hits him like a pool ball, and he blasts him outside the building, and he rolls up a mountain, and he flies into space, and he lands on the moon. <laughs> okay. So they free Rosie, and she punches Blachu. And the epilogue shows Rosie meeting Amy Rose, and they start talking, which ends the episode on this sexist joke. That's great. Then we get a drawing of Chris's band, Christian and the Hedgehog Boys, and then we're greeted with sub-episode 2. Christian Chandler in The Rise and Fall of My Heart. It's been almost two years since Chris started his love quest, and he thinks he might get lucky today. I know he means that he'll get lucky and find someone, but like, come on Chris, phrasing. There's a diagram showing his heart at 20% repaired since the last time it was shattered. A girl named Hannah comes over and asks Chris if she wants to go on a date with her, and his heart gets filled to 100%. He proclaims his love quest is finally over. So Chris goes on the date, and there's an ungodly amount of text, and things go well, and afterward, Chris asks his DS for dating tips, which I assume he's asking like a dating game that he has on the DS. He says, do angels have names, which is a supposed to be, do angels like you have names, which is a pickup line that Chris actually used on a girl in real life. Uh, but Rose Chu tells Chris that she overheard Hannah telling her friends that she was playing Chris for a sap and wasn't really interested in him. So Chris confronts Hannah and asks if it's true, and she admits that she was just messing with him, and his heart shatters down to 15%, 5% lower than it was at the start of the episode. So that night at home, Chris writes an email supposedly to the real Hannah, saying he enjoyed their date and asks if she smokes, because that's a turnoff for him. Chris ends the issue with a plea to his audience to make Sonichu more than a comic book. He wants a video game, a cartoon, merchandise, so he asks the readers to contact Nintendo of America and to tell them about Sonichu. And then there's this great drawing of Sonichu that I actually think is really good, and then the worst drawing of Chris that I've ever seen. <laughs> Moving on. April 24th, 2005, graced us with the third issue of Sonichu, titled Sonichu, issue number two. The cover is adorned with Chris-Chan, Sonichu, and two other characters that haven't been introduced yet, and one appears to be Mid-Dab. 
Behind them on the wall are ancient hieroglyphics that seem to depict the birth of Sonichu. This is explained on the next page in the title, Episode 7, Sonichu in The Ancient Prophecy. At first, I thought this was a spelling error, and Chris didn't really know how to spell ancient, but it's more likely that it's a combination of ancient and chu, like Sonichu or Pikachu. Below the title, we see the worst layout of boxes in comic book history, with absolutely no consistency in a load of white space. So Sonichu is running, and he sees a cave that can only be entered by a creature of prophecy and its master. There's a keeper of the cave, which is called the Destiny Cave, and he tells Sonichu that he is, in fact, the creature of prophecy. So Sonichu fetches Chris, and they return to the cave and go inside. The cave keeper tells them that the prophecy says the reincarnation of their leader will pen and combine a mouse and hedgehog and give birth to a new creature. This once again blurs the lines of whether Chris in the comic is supposed to be his own character or if he's actually the real Chris in real life. The prophecy says that Chris, his love, and his rival must enter the cave and have their magic powers awakened and then fight off an evil beast. Chris has to lay his Sanchu medallion on a pedestal to start the process, and the cave keeper says a nonsense magic spell. I thought it might be an anagram for something, but I checked it and it's not. One of my subscribers figured out that this was Spanish backwards, but the closest I could get to a proper translation was Haha Lambaki Create Pen Clea Zone, which just goes to show how bad Chris is at Spanish. And Oz Alec Amuk Uric Ika Bamal Aa. So Chris meets his past self, who's dressed in, like, magic Roman armor, and he says he's a member of the Cherokee clan, and there's just so much wrong with that, but let's move on. Chris gains the ability to transform into Chris Jan Sonichu, which he was already shown to do in a previous issue, but whatever, it's really, it's fine, it's whatever. Then we see two people, Sarah Hammer and the evil Wesley, getting medallions of their own. Chris doesn't know how old Wesley is, so he puts a question mark there. And then we get perhaps the weirdest advertisement yet, Chris is proclaiming the great scent of Axe Body Spray, and Sonichu tells Rosie that he didn't shower, but instead used Axe Body Spray, and Rosie responds, May I orbit your belt? Which is both an amazing pun and also a highly disturbing sentence because of who wrote it. We know Chris is obsessed with sex, but because he's so immature, so he has characters say things like, May I orbit your belt? It's just, it's, it's, it's just wrong. <laughs> it also reinforces that Chris doesn't shower and just uses Axe Body Spray. So episode 8 begins, Christian Chandler in Chaos and Serenity. Wesley is approached by some magic guy who tells him that he and Chris were rivals in a past life, so they must fight each other now. Wesley has the power of fire and can transform into a Sonichu, so he does and begins training. Meanwhile, the queen of the Cherokee clan, the wife of Christian's past life, finds Sarah and teaches her how to transform too. So then Chris Chan, Sonichu, Sarah, and Wesley all converge onto one spot by Giovanni's gym, and Wesley sends a blast of fire out at them. <laughs> they dodge it, and he comes rolling up in, uh, this... wheel. They got big wheel! And Chris tells Sonichu to run. Sonichu says, you don't have to tell me twice, but during the Stone Age, which makes absolutely no sense. This panel remained an enigma for years until Chris explained the full joke, which we obviously should have gotten from the comic. The full line is, You don't have to tell me twice, but during the Stone Age, you'd have to tell a caveman more than twice. So then Chris asks Wesley who he is and why he's attacking them, and Wesley gives out really intriguing information. He says that Chris got jealous when his friend Sarah sat on his lap, and Chris immediately realizes that he must be Wesley. I assume this is based on a real-life incident, and I just can't find any sympathy for Chris feeling jealous that a girl who wasn't his girlfriend did something like that, but obviously the comic wants Wesley to be the bad guy. Wesley's ancestor was apparently part of the Wasabi clan, and wanted to take over the world. He wanted to steal a crown from the Cherokees that would give them power, and he says they cried a trail of tears for centuries because they couldn't kill the king of the Cherokees, and I really want to know if Chris is just mixing real-life stuff into his comic because he wants to pull from history, kind of like how Yu-Gi-Oh pulled from Egyptian mythology, or if Chris really thinks that that's what the Trail of Tears was, and if he thinks that that is what the Cherokees dressed like. Speaking of Yu-Gi-Oh, Chris apparently laid down a trap card, because that's one of Sonichu's powers now. So Chris uses Magic Cylinder to redirect Wesley's attack back at him, and Sarah comments that it's sweet that Chris was jealous, which is something no girl has ever said in the history of the entire planet. 
So Chris asks Wesley how many life points he has left. Wesley uses the move Flamethrower, and this probably isn't the worst mashup of Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon ever, which is saying something. Wesley beats up Chris and takes the crown, which we didn't know he had, so there wasn't really any tension there. And then Sarah springs into action and shoots an arrow at Wesley, pinning him to a tree. Then Sonichu asks us if we've got milk in an ad before starting episode 9. Chris Chan, Sarah Ma, and Wesley in The Evil That Stomped Quickville. Sarah tells Chris that her hedgehog name is Sarah Ma, then scolds Wesley for hurting Chris and says they never should have hooked up together. Chris really seems to be working through his problems with this comic. Sarah tells Wesley she doesn't love him, and he screams, no! But she lets him go because the three of them have to fight the prophesized evil. Sonichu runs in and tells them a rock monster is attacking Quickville, so Sarah levitates them all away. The rock monster is a golem being controlled by Mary Lee Walsh, who has been trapped by the Wasabi and Cherokeean clans for hundreds of years. <laughs> There's a big Power Ranger-style battle, and they destroy the golem and discover it was controlled by a living orb named Count Graduan. Count Graduan is a metaphor for Chris's high school graduation because he didn't want to finish high school where he had loads of friends and he hated his college and beyond years. So I guess that that redeemed Wesley, even though he's based on a real person Chris doesn't like, and Chris's friends return to their real hometown of Rutgersville. There, Sarah tells Chris she broke up with Wesley and is now dating a guy named William and Chris is upset, but says she should come back one day. In the final page of the chapter, Chris recalls real details about the real Sarah, who he was friends with as a kid but doesn't see much now since he moved away. Then we get sub-episode 3, Christian Chandler and Sonichu in Witch Confront. I've taken many blows in my life, but the most devastating were blows from that Mary Lee Walsh. During the first months of my love quest, she intruded by destroying my advertisements, shattered my heart, hurt my soul, and threatened to make me look bad. She must be stopped before others feel her wrath." You'll note that those are real things that Walsh did to the real Chris, but in the Sonic 2 comic she's an actual villain, like, like she kills people, but Chris doesn't feel the need to mention those things as reasons for stopping her. This is a pure revenge plot for the fictional Chris, as well as a revenge fantasy for the real Chris. So Chris goes into Mary Lee Walsh's office at PVCC, which is Chris's community college, Piedmont Virginity Community College. I'm going to interrupt here to mention that I just noticed this while I'm editing that I accidentally just said Virginity Community College instead of Virginia. And seeing as we're talking about Chris, I think that's really funny. Anyway, moving on. He's in his Chris Chan Sonichu form and they do battle, but she beats him out of his transformation. If anyone touches Chris's Sonichu medallion, he transforms. This medallion is based on a real medallion that Chris made himself out of Crayola Model Magic. So then Sonichu arrives and fights alongside Chris, and they send one final blast and defeat the witch, even though we've already seen this in an earlier comic. This sub-episode is a remake of a comic I discussed earlier, and it's canosity, it's... it's kinicity. Whether or not it actually happened in the story is debatable, because Mary Lee Walsh is still alive after this point, so obviously they don't kill her here. This ends Sonichu Issue 2. This is not the last time that Chris will use his comic to work through problems in his real life, but the story just gets crazier from here when the other Sonichus are introduced. Issue 3, drawn June 2005. Episode 10, Sonichu Babies, which is just what we needed. So in this intro paragraph, Chris explains that when Sonic collided with Pikachu, six eggs were sent out all over the world and they eventually hatched into other typed Sonichu. He also mentions that the rainbow light that emitted from Sonic and Pikachu's collision will do something else in a future story. At the bottom of the page, Chris shows Sonichu and Rosechu in their baby forms, Sonny and Rosie. Of course, Sonichu and Rosechu never had baby forms because they were created as adults, so this makes no sense. Also, they are terrifying. So first we get the origin of Wild Sonichu, but the panels are too small to see anything and the dialogue is just Pokemon saying their names. It's basically just a montage of Wild Sonichu growing up and telling us he can fly with his propeller tail. Next we have Bubbles Rosechew, who was raised by a Swampert until a Whale Lord accidentally crushed her. This caused her to evolve in order to save the Swampert, unlocking her Rosechew powers. Next is the weirdest of the bunch, Angelica Rosechew. I get that Chris wanted a stereotypical light type, but he made her grow up in a Catholic nunnery. 
She evolved one night while she was sleeping for no reason, which has creepy implications. The nuns also equate Chris to God when they say that her life is predestined because God gave her a good script to follow. This might be the first occasion where Chris called himself a god. Also, Chris is watching her sleep and drops her off a pair of shoes. This would be really creepy if Chris wasn't Chris. He obviously thinks of his creations as his children, so this look in his eyes is one of pride in his daughter, but without context, it's just wrong. Punchy Sonichu might as well not be a Sonichu. If you look at his logo, he clearly has the same fists as Knuckles from Sonic, who's an echidna. The story is really hard to follow here because Chris mixes in Japanese phrases with the dialogue and breaks the fourth wall, admitting that he's copying from anime. Nani? I pointed this out earlier, but we really have to talk about Punchy's eyes. Chris slanted them like a stereotypical depiction of Asians, and I think that was on purpose. Maybe it's the only way Chris knows how to draw Asians, but what's the point of making him Asian anyway? He's not human. Then finally, we have Magichan. Magichan grew up alone in a cave until he was psychically contacted by Mewtwo. Mewtwo taught him how to use psychic powers and showed him popular Jackie Chan movies for some reason. Then, Magichan evolved, and the first thing he does is fart. Considering what Chris does with Magichan in the future, this is really strange. Mewtwo promises that he will meet Magichan in the future after saying he has a taught him everything he knows. This ends the issue. Then, Chris has an unfilled out approximation of a MySpace page of himself, for reasons unfathomable to anyone else. Hello, it's a me, CWC. His only friend is Sonichu. Episode 11 The Chaotic Combo in When Hedgehogs Meet. This chapter also begins with a wall of text, now from Flame the Sunbird, who protects a magic sunstone that makes everything on Earth grow like normal. If it falls into the wrong hands, humans could lose their limbs, or trees might grow legs. So naturally, Giovanni wants it, and he sends Blachu to steal it. Blachu arrives on the island and greets Flame the Sunbird with a what's up, Doc? Flame asks where Blachu thinks he's going with the stone, and Blachu responds, none of your birds wax, and then flies away on a hoverboard. So then some hijinks ensue, Blachu flies past Bubbles while she's sunbathing on a beach and causes a wave to splash her. He knocks Wild off of a tree branch and Punchy accidentally grabs his hoverboard while rock climbing. Angelica, who is growing some flowers nearby, saves Punchy, and all the members of the Chaotic Combo meet up in one spot, with Flame the Sunbird there too, while all except Magichan, who can see everything with the psychic powers and knows that the original Sonichu will arrive shortly to fight Blachu. So Sonichu runs into Blachu and a fight ensues, and Magichan teleports all the other Sonichus to the fight. Sonichu demands Blachu give him the stone, and Blachu says, You and what army? And then, of course, the other Sonichu appear. Sonichu thinks to himself, My cavalry, which is probably supposed to be my cavalry, which would also not make any sense. So then all the Power Rangers, I mean all the Sonichus are there to stop Shadow, I mean Vegeta, I mean me too, I mean Blachu. The fight begins and we see this amazing piece of modern art that I dare any of you to make sense of. Yes, I know it's a pinball game, but why? Then the Sonichus win and get the stone back, and with no resolution whatsoever, the episode ends. Blachu is bleeding on the ground. This is the first and definitely not the last time we will see blood in Sonichu. Chris also notes that this comic was finished in February 2006, meaning it took him eight months to finish this one book. Chris then made an ad for virgin males to order a girlfriend. Are you one out of two lonely males in the entire world? If you are, then call right now. Now this might not make any sense to the average person, but it makes all too much sense to me as someone who spent a lot of time following Chris. Chris believes in something called the infinitely high boyfriend factor. Basically, whenever Chris asked out a girl, they would say that they already had a boyfriend, so Chris got it in his head that almost all girls already had boyfriends. So he thinks that there are very few boys as lonely as him in the entire world. Then we get sub-episode 4, Christian Chandler in Mick Attack. Well, it's been well over a year and 10 months now since I started my love quest. I still haven't found an 18 to 23 year old boyfriend-free, caring, smoke-free, non-alcoholic white girl to build a relationship from the ground up with. I detest the men, except for my father and me, because they take all the pretty girls, 
leaving me with none to choose from. This sucks. I'm very lonesome, and there are propel around here who do what they can to keep me from getting one. I feel the world is against me finding a girlfriend of my own. Sad face. So two cops arrive with bionic limbs, sent from the jerk hop from sub-episode 1, and they call Chris a solicitor and tell him to leave. Chris says he's not a solicitor, and he's tired of men getting in the way of his love quest. So Chris stands up to fight with the cops and gets saved by... Dark Bind Sonichu. He's not a member of the Chaotic Combo, so it makes no sense that he exists, because his egg wasn't birthed from the Rainbow Energy. Dark Bind is a ripoff of both Darkwing Duck and Link, as he proclaims part of Darkwing Duck's battle speech, and claims he's on a quest to save Princess Zelina Rose Chu. Anyway, Chris transforms into Super Chris Chan Sonichu, who has a Mario wing cap for some reason. He gets this power boost from the Ancient Prophecy. A fight ensues. <laughs> and Chris rips off Monty Python. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I've heard worse. You liar. Come on, you pansy. Victory is mine. How about you? <coughs> I'll have your leg. All right. We'll call it a draw. And they win the battle with the help of pixel blocks, which are like little mini Lego toys, and Chris probably plays with them in real life. Chris then tells the cops that they should leave him alone because it's hard for him to find a single girl due to the infinitely high boyfriend factor, and getting their attention is even harder because they usually have shopping on their minds. Then, Chris gets attacked by the leader of all the jerk ops. Time out. This issue was set in Mall Wart, obviously supposed to be Walmart, but the cop introduces himself as a WM manager, as in Walmart manager jerk. Basically, Chris forgot that he had renamed Walmart to Mallwart when naming the character, even though it's on the same page. Issue number four of Sonic Chu has nothing to do with Sonic Chu and is all about Chris's love quest. Even though every issue of Sonic Chu so far barely pushes forward the story, we now get a full filler arc only five issues in. Amazing. A Sonic Chu special. Quick's Love Quest Saga, drawn November 2005. Virginia is for virgins. True love is illegal in Virginia. You'll never get away from loneliness, haha. Ha. My wooden badge was delicious. Wait, what? The thing is, this issue is just a combination of all the sub-stories that have been told thus far. From Jerkop, Tastropi, to Mick Attack. But we do get the conclusion of Mick Attack in Mick Attack Part 2. So Chris gets beat up by the leader of the Jerkops, and then his ancestor appears to him, and tells him that by touching a pixel hark block, Chris Chan can summon his dream sibling. Chris doesn't understand, but then suddenly realizes he means his dream sibling, Crystal, who's his female twin. This comes out of nowhere and makes no sense. This is the first instance of Chris using outside material as Sonichu canon, as in he'll refer to things that don't happen in the comics, but that he's talked about in other places. Chris infamously made his own set of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and one of them is his female twin, Crystal. Basically, it's just Chris as a girl. This is also the first time that we'll see Chris's desire to be a girl manifest, but more on that later. So that Yu-Gi-Oh card that the real Chris made, but wasn't mentioned in the story, is canon, and Chris is able to manifest a real sister in the comic because of the card. So both siblings transform, and Crystal's transformation looks suspiciously like Sailor Moon, but she comes out as Crystallina Rose Chu. She was not part of the Ancient Prophecy, and thus this makes no sense, although it is possible that, being Chris's twin, she is some of his power. She throws her crown, and Chris does a Kursehameha to defeat the Jerkoff once and for all. They knock off his head, which is contained in a jar, and Chris comments that now he can never be left behind. This is a weird twist of the phrase, you would lose your head if it wasn't attached to your shoulders, but Chris doesn't understand that at all. It's almost like it was translated into a different language and back 12 times. So they pump the head out the window back to Mary Lee Walsh, and it hits her on the head. Her base is in the private villa of corrupted citizens, which Chris thinks is clever because it has the same initials as Piedmont and Virginia Community College. Her cuckoo clock strikes 437, and the little bird comes out and says Mary is cuckoo for thinking Chris's method won't work. 
In Chris's real-life encounter with Walsh, she told him that his attraction sign was not a good way to find a girlfriend, and Chris obviously very strongly disagrees with that. Tell me why. Then we get episode 6, Christian Chandler's Backyard Safari, where he pretends to do a nature documentary on jerk-offs. It's not very interesting except for one detail that fascinates me. The jerk-offs apparently lose a single finger as they mature, and so some cover it up on their hands with black gloves. That's just so weird. He then does a similar breakdown for the black jerk-off, who's the jerk chief. He's apparently so fat that he's 1,500 pounds, which Chris notes is heavier than a Snorlax. Chris also says he's related to the Lummox from Ben and Stumpy, which is obviously supposed to be Ren and Stimpy. Why he would direct people to watch a real thing and then change its name is anyone's guess. So Chris is at a bowling alley or something, and then they jerk off attack. Then Crystal shows up and distracts them with her looks. Well, as we all know, all know being one word, all male creatures of any species will always fall for a very pretty face. And wow, does my twin sister Crystal have one. She is, uh, she's, she's beautiful, Chris. So Chris demonstrates a new power he's never had before, and teleports the cop's weapons to another dimension, and then teleports the other cops outside the building, so it's just him and the jerk chief. Then he picks up the jerk chief, who's drooling a river, and bowls him at the other cops and gets a strike. Chris's ability to teleport the guns away to another dimension is important because that would help him later, but he never uses it again. Have you ever heard of someone who got 300 and lose? Chris then gets really dark and describes that there are no female jerk-offs, so jerk-offs have to use a hypno-gun to brainwash women into being with them. Chris says it only works on slow-minded adults, so it wouldn't work on him, which is just not correct. He also implies that he's female, and we'll get back to that later. Chris ends the comic by revealing that an even stronger jerk-off, Scott Palazzo, has been watching the program, and he thinks to himself, that Chris must be an idiot. He hires more jerk cops to go after Chris. Also, his mother killed his father and then herself. Okay. Sub episode 7. Christian Chandler in, off target. So Mary Lee Walsh thinks about her last defeat at the hands of Christian, and sends a new threat after him. Chris is at the region of Gettar, which is the syllables of target reversed. So Chris is at target thinking about how he's been kicked out of all the other malls, but this one is so good because there's a bar that faces the exit and he can sit there all day and drawl. Fictional Chris says he's here because in all the other malls, having a girlfriend is illegal, so he's here to pick up women. This of course makes no sense, as there would be more single women somewhere where it's illegal to be in a relationship. Anyway, some jerk ops appear, and Chris blows them away with the power of Angelica Rose Chew. Then we get the classic Chris Straw meme. This image is one of the first memes people usually hear about Chris. His very phallic straw is the subject of much mockery, but I really, really wish it was the most phallic thing in this comic, because it gets so much worse. So Chris is attacked by the new threat, whose name is Baguette, and Chris transforms. So Chris and Baguette look at each other in slow motion, which makes no sense in comic book form. Chris zaps Baguette and says, As long as my heart beats, I will find my heart sweet. <laughs> Then Baguette summons a Transformer, and Chris dodges its fire attack. He goes in for a spin dash, but the Transformer grabs his tail, and he reverts back into his Chris-chan form. The Transformer picks him up, and Chris screams for help. Crystal rushes to help him, but the Transformer drops Chris, and the comic ends on a cliffhanger. Off Target, Part 2 Crystal catches Chris with her magical powers, and the jerk op tackles him. They smack Chris in the face and make him bleed, and then carry him into the Transformers' cockpit as it is now turned into a jet. Crystal starts to cry and tries to stop them, but they take off with Chris to deliver him to Mary Lee Walsh. Crystal turns into Crystalina Rose Jew. Mary Lee Walsh then suspends Chris over a cauldron and drops him in, but Crystal saves him just in time. Chris has no energy left, but Crystal begins to fight. It's good that my sister has come to my rescue, but I'm still without a girlfriend. Not only that, she's in trouble, and I am unable to help her. Chris obviously has great priorities there. 
Chris contacts his ancestor, and he tells Chris to focus on the friends he's made since starting his love quest, both in person and on MySpace.com. But instead of Chris giving Crystal his power, she gives him her power, and he transforms. Soldier of Love and Honesty, Chris Chan. Soldier of Soul and Heart, Crystalina. We are Chris Chan Pure. So then they combine their powers and send an electric bolt at Count Graduan. The orb explodes and the evil heir of Mary Lee Walsh returns to the peaceful Piedmont Community College. The comic says that all the students return to normal, even though it had never stated that there were any students, and Mary Lee Walsh and Count Graduan, who survived, plot to take over a high school next. And that's the end of issue 4. This issue was 100 pages! Hopefully we'll get back to following Sonichu next time, although I know that I'll regret saying that. April 2006. Almost a full year since the last issue of Sonichu. Mary Lee Walsh has kidnapped Chris, and Sonichu is gonna save him. Somehow. Chris notes at the start of this comic that some characters were originally created by his real-life friend Megan. He puts hearts around her name at the bottom of the page. This issue is also the first that's been influenced by fans of Sonichu. Chris had gained online infamy at this point, and everything he did was being criticized. He made sure to note that time had passed since the beginning of the comic, and all characters are now over the age of 18, which he thought was obvious. All Rose Chews are now 18, and all Sonic Chews are 19. This, of course, makes no sense, since the original Sonic Chew and Rose Chew were Pokémon before transforming. The Chaotic Combo weren't born until they were formed, meaning that necessarily Sonic Chew and Rose Chew are older than them. And, of course, since all the eggs were formed at once, it's impossible for the male Sonic Chews to be older than the female Rose Chews. Also, I don't think I need to point this out, but fictional animals don't need to mature at the same rate as humans, and Chris could have just said that they develop very quickly. Kind of like an opposite Baby Yoda, who's 50. At the bottom of this announcement, Chris shows a drawing of Rose Chew posing in a bikini, because now she's of age and is allowed to. That's how all this started, by the way. People were accusing Chris of being a pedophile for drawing Sonichu porn, and so he made them all canonically 18. Let's just get into the story. Episode 12. Chris Chan in My Best Friend's Cherokeean Wedding, with guest star Jax Knight, who plays the role of the groom, William Spencer. We see the inside of a church as two people are getting married. There's music, and the proportions are terrible. Chris is drawn in pencil because he's astral projecting himself there. This is Sarah Hammer's wedding, and in real life Chris didn't attend. So he had to draw himself there in spirit instead of allowing himself to attend, even in his own fantasy. So Wes shows up in his Sonichu form and says, If I can't have her, no one can. Wait, no. He says, If I can't have her, then I'll play magic. Or what? So Chris is sitting there thinking to himself about how he doesn't mind not being there in person, even though he can't catch the bouquet. Apparently he doesn't understand that that's only something women do normally. Chris mentions that he doesn't mind that Sarah, who he obviously had feelings for in the Ancient Prophecy issue, is getting married because he found someone new. This, of course, goes completely against Sarah being Chris's wife in a past life and then being bound by destiny or whatever. So the new girl Chris is talking about looks like Sailor Moon, and Chris mentions that they met after starting to play Heart of the Cards. So I guess I have to talk about Megan. Megan Schroeder was a girl Chris met in his local gaming store playing Yu-Gi-Oh!, the two became friends, and she was a genuinely nice person to Chris, but Chris wanted to be more than friends. He refused to get the hint, and she had to tell him multiple times that she didn't want to date him. Although I really don't mean to be cold, but please don't try and advance on kissing me, please. I've told you many times I don't want a serious relationship with you, or any other guy for that matter, and so you really need to give up on me because it'll only make you miserable. So please do not waste more thoughts on me. Of course we are friends, but friends only. Please detach yourself from me. Also, I'm just a little mad that I have to keep telling you to please stop touching me. It's like you're not wanting to listen to me. 
I tell you. Then you say, okay, but eventually you're back to the same tricks. He started copying everything she did and got into all the fandoms that she liked, which is how he started liking Sailor Moon and My Little Pony. Anyway, sometimes I get the feeling that you copy me to get me to like you. Like Sailor Moon, for example. The only Sailor Moon thing you had was that adult video. And since I told you how much I love it, then you start getting into it. Kind of like My Little Pony. That kind of thing really annoys me. Keep in mind that this is 2006, and Friendship is Magic wouldn't come out for another four or five years. Chris is the OG brony. So Chris proclaiming his love for Megan here is totally against her wishes, and she had been firm with him that she didn't want a relationship. But she did design her own character that Chris uses in this issue. So, back to the comic. Chris has a vision of the future where Sarah gets kidnapped, and Chris quickly plays a Yu-Gi-Oh card. The card is a trap card that makes Wes hear reason. This is your voice of reason. You don't have to do this. There are other girls behind the light magical curtain. Chris's inability to take his own advice, and to act like the villains in his own comic should become apparent when you take the Megan story from before and apply it to this quote. Chris began blaming people who he felt were keeping him and Megan apart for him still being a virgin. He entered a contest to win a trip for two to Sony headquarters, and for two PSPs, when he lost, he complained to Sony that them picking a different winner was preventing him from showing Megan that they should be together by taking her on the trip and having sex in their hotel room. I really wanted that trip so I could have a chance to impress my sweetest Megan and possibly fulfill my dream of getting married and soon have a daughter named Crystal. Yet now I, a frustrated, high-functionally autistic 25-year-old virgin, have been balls broken like I have through a big chunk of my life in America's favorite game, Kick the Autistic. I had my fantasies of having fun with Megan, taking her to a really extravagant destination. I am not rich. Taking a long-wanted tour of the Nintendo of America company tour, with her, playing Guitar Hero against the guy in the Parappa costume, gemming with Megan in the hotel room, and possibly our first time in bed. Back to the comic. So Chris is still invisible, and Wes shoots a flame arrow randomly into the church to fight back against what he thinks is his conscience. Chris blocks it, and transforms into Chris Chan Sonic Yu. He's now there, physically, in the church, meaning that Chris has the power to teleport. Chris thinks to himself that he can't ruin Sarah's special day, although this is secondary to his future with Megan. Remember Meg Chan. Future happiness for us, Sarah's future happiness, but mostly Megan. So he tells Wes that they should leave in peace for Sarah's sake. Wes says he will leave in peace, with Sarah, because he's going to kidnap her, which he then does. The Dane comes with me. He's big because of the Yu-Gi-Oh card Megamorph, which Chris, who's currently crushed under his shoe, complains about. So Chris chases Wes, and this incomprehensible dialogue happens. Hey Wes, Apple Corps, Baltimore, who's your friend? Me. This is a reference to a children's game that was popular in the mid-1900s on the West Coast. One child would hold up an apple core and say, Apple core. The first child to then say, Baltimore, would get to pick the target. The original child would say, Who's your friend? And the child who had previously said Baltimore would name one of the children in their group. The person with the apple core would then get to pelt that person with said apple core. This game was referenced in a very old episode of Chip and Dale, and then, that Chip and Dale episode was referenced in a 1990s episode of Johnny Bravo, where he crosses over with Scooby-Doo. Applecore. Blah, blah, blah. Who's your friend? Me. Applecore. Baltimore. Who's your friend? Me. Seeing as Chris lives in Virginia, it's very likely that he heard about this game strictly through the episode of Johnny Bravo, seeing as he quotes it word for word. Anyway, Chris plays Creature Swap, which is a real Yu-Gi-Oh card where the players exchange control of one of their monsters. This means that Sarah ends up in Chris's arms and Wes ends up with nothing, which isn't how the card works. Darn him and his stupid doe magic. I'm the one with the rabbit. Without context, this makes no sense, but Wes is a magician in real life. So here his character is complaining that Chris's Yu-Gi-Oh! magic is beating him. So 
so Wes uses a flame attack, but it gets reflected back at him by Meg Chan. Chris cries, yeah, she's here, with a heart. So Megan, or Meg Chan, is actually Sailor Megtoon, and she is a partner. Megagila Skunk, who was also designed for the comic by the real world Megan. Flamethrower. Rockin' Hurricane. Chris is on his knees in love with Megan, and then he gets slapped by Megagi. He then uses the card Dark Core, which can banish one monster. This whole time, he's been treating Wes like an opponent, not a monster, so this shouldn't work, but whatever. A portal opens behind him to banish Wes, but he gets stuck in the sand, so Chris makes a golf joke and puts him out of the sand trap. Back at the wedding, Chris laments that Megan doesn't share feelings for him. Sarah calls him to her balcony and tosses the bouquet down to him. Chris notes that traditionally, this means he'll get married soon, again, not understanding that this is usually just for women. Sarah then gets written out of the story with a pretty heartfelt line, I wanted to thank you for the wonderful childhood years between you and me, and for being by my side today. I wish you the best of your Megan's love. Good luck to you, Christopher Chandler. Grammatical error aside, that was very sweet. Virginia is for virgins! So this next section is supposed to be a new episode. It isn't connected to the last story at all, but Chris doesn't put a title. So this next couple pages are just in limbo somewhere between episodes. Two lovers are sitting on a park bench when a jerk-off slams down his baton and tells them that love is now forbidden. The same thing happens at a coffee shop and a sidewalk, with the jerk-off saying that Mary Lee Walsh is cracking down on love. Cut to the Quickville Mall, where Chris and Sonichu are hanging out. Chris notes that he designed the mall as part of his college CAD degree, which is really sad. He also admits to having a Sonichu scrapbook. Well, Sonichu, I've been feeling lots better since I've first Megan. She's the sweetest, and she has the right spunk amount among all ladies. Chris then abuses text again to talk about how he thinks that being nice to Megan over time that she'll be his girlfriend, which, spoiler alert, does not happen. The true story of what happens to Megan is very sad, but I'll get to that when it comes. Chris says he hasn't used his attraction sign since meeting Megan at the Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, and he's happy that she's boyfriend-free. Then the radio turns up, which had been playing light rock and anime music, and announces that jerk hops are harassing couples all over Quickville. Chris makes an announcement to all of Quickville that only black and blue cops are real cops, and all other cops are fake. Chris then checks his Nintendo DS, which connects to the Wi-Fi and a satellite to track jerk hops, and find that the real police force of Quickville are outnumbered. Mary Lee Walsh cackles that she'll be able to take over the world, especially with her adopted child in Viridian, which is implied to be Nate Zerk. Sonichu and Chris rush into battle, where Chris summons all the Sonichus, Megan, and Crystal to the fight. He also misspells Cavalry again as Calvary. Crystal notes that she was at the mall and was having fun sampling perfume, but she wants to come help Chris. Then Chris and Crystal transform for multiple pages, and the episode ends. Episode 13 Chris Chan Pure and the Chaotic Combo Inn, Smashed Hearts and Entrapment. All the Sonichus are posed, ready to stop this battle once and for all. Evil Witch of Dark Descent, return to the darkness which you came. Not only will I not retreat, but I will send out my big man to destroy you, Chris Chan. Come out. K k k what? Kenaru Menneth. Kenaru Menneth. Ken so then Chef from South Park steps out of nowhere to fight Sonichu, but he calls them Chicos. I don't know why and he curses at them and says Chris's mall design is bad. He's based on Chris's real-life CAD teacher, who Chris presumably didn't like. So Chris and Crystal run across what Chris realizes is construction steel, and he gets an idea. But I have no idea what that idea is. I don't know what this panel is supposed to be showing. Mary Lee Walsh says they can't unscrew Chef's head, so I guess he's a robot or something? I don't know. On the next page, we see Chris and Crystal in pain, and Chef is gigantic now but something spins through the air and hits him and knocks him over. It's Megan who's just arrived. Chris reuses his first drawing of her from earlier in the issue because he's lazy. Megan tells Chris to finish him off, and Chris and Crystal hold hands and deal a final thunderbolt and Chef explodes. Chris starts aiming a curse hameha at Mary Lee Walsh. Curse But Count Graduan stops him with a spell. He creates a dark mirror hole and Chris begins to fall in. We get reaction shots of all the Sonichus and Megan as he falls in the hole, reverting back to his normal Chris Chan form. So Megan and Crystal, whose faces you can't see, try to pull Chris out, but he begs them to let him go in so they don't get pulled in too. 
but then he says if he falls in, they'll be sad anyway, so he doesn't know what he should do. Classic Chris Chan logic. Then we cut to Nate Turk in Viridian City. Because Chris's Sonichu medallion was submerged in darkness, now Nate Turk is getting a power-up with his own dark Sonichu medallion. We only see his shadow, but Black Shoe comes in and doesn't recognize him. So back in Quickville, Mary Lee Walsh realizes Chris will suffer more if he loses both Megan and Crystal, so she flips the spell so that it's them who's trapped in the darkness. Crystal pushes Megan free, and she gets trapped alone in the dark mirror. So Megan looks really sad at Chris, and thinks he looks pitiful. My guess would be that Chris wants Megan to feel sorry for him so that she'll develop feelings for him, but it comes across... wrong. So the issue ends on a to-be-continued, with Mary Lee Walsh celebrating that she has captured Crystal. We also get Rose Chu talking to the audience, telling them that as much as Chris loves Megan, the hug on the last page didn't really happen. That means that Chris and Megan never once hugged, even as friends, which I think is really weird. I don't know what's with the pattern of Chris having his own characters make fun of him, but this is something that keeps coming up. The final page is a piece of art the real Megan drew of Sailor Moon, and it's really sad that Chris's art is what got famous from these comics because she's actually not bad. The comic was completed June 20th, 2006. July 4th, 2006. About two weeks after the last issue was finished. Tragedy struck the Chandler household as Chris's beloved childhood dog, Patty, died, and Chris decided to immortalize her in his comic. It's kind of sweet, he wants her spirit to live on with him in Quickville, so he added her to the Sonichu story. He starts the issue with panels of her looking up at the moon. The next morning, Patty realizes she can talk, and is now a cartoon. She tells Chris that she feels like a spry three-year-old, which Chris notes is 21 in dog years. So Chris takes her into his room and opens the portal to Quickville with a open sesame. So Chris either thinks that this is a clever pun, or he misheard open sesame his whole life, or he stole this pun from somewhere. I don't know which is worse. Chris takes Patty into Quickville where she can live with the rest of the anthropomorphic animals. He introduces her to his assistant, whose name is Amber, and who used to be an actress, but retired because she wanted to become a receptionist for someone like Chris. Think of that as you will. Chris gets a call from Sonichu, and his ringtone is Drive Me Crazy by Britney Spears slash Feel So Lonesome by Chris himself. Whenever Chris writes a song, he just changes lyrics to a real song, so it's his words with Britney Spears music. Chris has to leave, so he hugs Patty and tells her she'll be happy in Quickville. Then he dedicates the comic to her. Patty Chandler, March 17th, 1988 through June 27th, 2006. One sweet, pretty, lucky dog. And now back to laughing. <laughs> Remember laughing? I'm not crying, you're crying. Attention fans, are you ready to rock? Yeah? Good! Now you can groove to the inspired tunes of Chris and Chandler, Sonichu, and the band on their debut CD, Christian and the Hedgehog Boys. What a great album cover. Chris really went above and beyond. And to think, this whole thing started with an album cover. So now we finally get the next chapter. Episode 14, Evil is Afoot. Chris is worried about Crystal being trapped in the Dark Realm, and for some reason his face is drawn more anime than it's ever been drawn before. Meanwhile, Megan is a fish. So Mary Lee Walsh is cackling when Patty and Darkwing Duck Sonichu arrive and knock her out of the sky. Megan plays a song on her guitar, and it blasts Mary Lee Walsh up into the sky in a hurricane. Then, all the heroes go to Chris Chan's office, and all that matters in this scene with all this nonsense dialogue is that Darkbind senses two magic crystal balls nearby. Chris and Magichan say it doesn't look good for Crystal, and the Rose Chews start fawning over Bionic, who's a basketball-playing Sonic Chew. We haven't been introduced to him yet, but Chris actually drew him before the original Sonic Chew back in 1999. Magichan explains that the only way to free Crystal is with the Sonic Chew balls, of which there are seven, but they only have one. They'll need all seven to free her, Dark Bind to Sonichu is also trying to find the balls in order to save Princess Zelina. In this panel, Magichan is thinking about Dark Bind and the balls, and in this panel, Dark Bind is thinking about the balls and Zelina, and if you don't notice the subtle change in their eye color, this would be really confusing because the thought bubbles are linked together. Zelina was cursed into eternal sleep by Clawdorf, which is clearly some Zelda references going on here, and Dark Bind has to find all the balls to wake her up. His memories are interrupted by an explosion downstairs. See, Chris's mayoral office is above the mall in Quickville, 
and someone was trying to rob K Jewelers. A green Sonichu has taken a Sonichu ball that was apparently housed there, and he wants to use it to take over the world. Chris teleports behind him and the fight begins. Black Sonichu is there, and we realize the new green Sonichu is Nate Zerk. Black Chu and Nate Zerk beat up Sonichu and Magichan, and Chris grows another head. Chris curses. Super Califragilisticexpialidocious! Nate Zerk sucks Chris into the dark dimension so that they can chat alone. Nate Zerk explains he gained his powers from Chris's medallion being dipped in darkness, and he now possesses opposite traits from Chris. He is darkness. He is evil. He is... Dot, 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 open. Now, some people have interpreted this as Chris admitting that he's in the closet sexually, since the opposite of him would be out of the closet or open. This is reinforced on the next page, when Nate Zerk reveals his true form, Red Nalk Natsu Nate Zerk, which is Chris and Weston Chandler backwards. Chris curses, Oh my dog, my fantasies blow vastly toward my opposite gender. I am so offended. Put a shirt on. Outside the dark dimension, Sonichu and Magichan are trying to save Christian. They ask Black Sonichu what's going on, and he says Nate Turk has shoved Giovanni aside and is even treating him poorly. He's after the seven Sonichu balls to take over the world. He also expresses an attraction to Bubbles Rose Jew. Cowardly liar, you dare put me down with your insults. Where I lack in confidence, I make up for in heart, strength, and the caring, loving boost for my sweet friend Megchan. You weakling, your feeble autism and big heart hinder you vastly beyond belier. I have no such whackness. <laughs> Therefore, I am the strongest. Then the two transform across multiple pages and break out of the darkness, back into the Quickville Mall. Neither of you should interfere, Magichan tells Sonichu and Blackchu. Chris and Nate Turk are way too powerful for them. A complete, nonsense, blur of color and movement happens, and it probably quite well depicts what a battle between two Sonichus would look like, but I can't tell what's going on. Nate Turk then gets the upper hand due to the Sonichu ball, and is one second away from killing Chris in the gym of his old high school. But, from out of nowhere, a basketball hits Nate Turk in the head and knocks him over. The ball was thrown by Megan. This is the first time we've seen Megan not in her Sailor Meg tune form. Megan tells Chris, in an unnecessary long dialogue bubble full of spelling errors, that she and the other Sonichus were healed. Chris asks what happened to Nate Turk, and someone steps into the scene, calling Chris an old friend. It's Bionic the Hedgehog, Chris's first Sonic OC that he drew in 1999. He's a mixture of Sonic and basketball. Despite popular belief, he is not Bionic. His name is just Basketball and Sonic. Bionic says that Chris made him in a War Against Autism drawing that we will get to see later in the issue. Bionic had picked up the Sonichu ball from Nate Turk after knocking him over, and mentions that Sonichu had come by and explained everything to him while Chris was unconscious. Then he complains that Chris made a girlfriend for Sonichu, but not for him. Chris says he was naive about dating when he made Bionic, as if he isn't still now and so he hadn't thought about it. Chris then advertises to the audience a DVD he made about his life that he would eventually upload to YouTube. The DVD includes two times he was on the news as a child, an Animal Crossing video he made that is often credited as one of the first ever Let's Plays, a picture of his artwork taken by his PSP, and several photographs and drawings. The comic then cuts ten weeks later. Nate Zerk wakes up from a coma, complaining that he was about to kill that straight, goody twin of his, when Bionic came in and stopped him. He swears vengeance. The comic was completed on February 21st, 2007, seven months after it was started. Chris notes that this is three days before his 25th birthday. This is the kind of drawing that an almost 25-year-old makes, apparently. The final page of the comic is Chris's drawing of Bionic from 1999 defeating autism. I fought autism, and I won, Bionic's flag says. He's standing on the word autism, with the clouds above him spelling out at sick him. Based on Chris saying he drew this in 1999, we can calculate that he was 17 when he drew it.
March 2007 brings us the best cover of Sonic Chu ever. There's no dialogue and the cover is mostly taken up from a picture of Magichan, whose face doubles as a clock, surrounded by seven Sonic Chu balls. Around him are old pictures from over the years, including recent pictures with Megan and Chris's yearbook pictures. The theme of this issue should be obvious, time travel. Let's see if Chris has the intelligence to tell a time travel story. Episode 15, Sonichu, Magichan, and Christian in Time for a Ball. Bionic apparently had a date with Megagi and it went well, and Chris wishes he could hug Megan. He yearns for it, but she only lets him hold hands. Megagi comes in and asks Bionic on a date and suggests he might get a kiss at the end. Bionic shows off Chris's childish mentality about dating and says, a kiss after this date and after the third, wee hee, ya hey, and then they run off together, and Chris starts to cry because he's lonely. Megan takes his hand and he starts to feel better. Chris and Megan go back to Magichan and Sonichu, and Magichan is musing that he knows the Sonichu ball is somewhere in the school, but probably is back in time. He sees Chris, and it opens his psychic powers, and he realizes that the Sonichu ball was back in time at the moment Chris invented Bionic back in 1999. Chris admits that this is based on real-life events. He says that Bionic entered his world after he was hit in the head with a basketball, so you can think of that as you will. But in the canon of the comic, it wasn't a basketball. It was a Sonichu ball. I had thought it was a mistakenly thrown basketball. Hmm. This corrects that theory. I feel as silly as the time I temporarily gained weight, became stupid, and went to watch television at Ghost Command. This isn't just some random nonsense. This is Chris mimicking Family Guy. He adds at the bottom of the next page that Seth MacFarlane can use the sketch if he wants in a future episode. This next part of the issue, Chris labels as TV-14, despite the fact that there's nothing inappropriate in it. A group of people are watching TV, and one of the TV characters has to use the bathroom. Chris, who now looks like Peter Griffin, does too, so he goes to find one. He finds what he thinks is a toilet, but is really a machine that the characters use at Ghost Headquarters to get into their uniforms, and it spits him out onto a car. The car then complains that he's heavy, and Chris broke his axles. The punchline is... Oh boy, this is not the bathroom. Whoops. Then it cuts back to Chris and Magichan. Now it's TVY7 again. Keep this in mind, Chris just set a precedent that, unless otherwise stated, Sonichu is TVY7, meaning suitable for ages 7 and up. Magichan says he can bring them back in time to get the Sonichu balls, but they have to be careful not to mess up the future. Then the Peter Griffin character cuts in, and this is like really bizarre. The Family Guy sketch that we just watched was actually a sketch in the Sonichu world, and this guy is actually named Sammy, and he was only playing the part of Chris playing the part of Peter. He asks if he can keep his shirt, and Chris notes that Sammy's Sonichu medallion is just a prop, making sure that the audience knows that his is the only real one. Magichan then surrounds himself and Sonichu and Chris in a time bubble, and tells them that they'll be invisible as long as they're inside it. We then cut to the year 2000 and see a girl sitting in the bleachers of a basketball court. We see her reaction to something. Oh my god, Chris! But we don't see what she sees. Then the episode ends. We never come back to this, and the year 2000 on that yearbook means nothing because they go back in time further than that. As if a perfect metaphor for what the series has become, there is then an advertisement for Christian Chandler's adult life, coming soon to PS2, Wii, and PS3, which, note, is rated M. Episode 16, Quick and Sonichu in Time Hogs, featuring Bender from Futurama as well. They fly past a bunch of dates, including the Y2K scare on January 1st, 2000, for some reason. So Sonichu lays out the plan. They'll arrive five minutes before the ball hits Chris, and then Sonichu will grab it. Chris then cites Futurama in saying that you can't change the past, and notes how attractive he finds Meg Griffin. For some reason, Chris is using a lot of big words in this section, like pondered, observed, pondering again. 
He then calls Meg by her full name, Megan Marie Griffin. According to the official Family Guy wiki, which is something that apparently exists, Meg's full name is actually Megatron, not Megan, and she doesn't have a middle name, meaning that Chris was wrong on two of three counts. Then there's some binary at the bottom of the page, maybe indicating that Chris is stealing the time travel method from the first Futurama movie. It translates to 13,194,894,195. In other words, that's, that's just nothing, and Chris just typed it in randomly. They arrive in the gym on November 13th, 1996. Chris is 26, 5'10", which he sighs about, and young Chris is 14, 4'10", which he sighs about. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's uncommon to grow an entire foot after age 14. Chris also notes that young Chris is naive about dating, again, as if he isn't. Young Chris is starting his stuff. Another day of managing the varsity basketball team in my freshman year. Research into Chris's life shows that he was, at most, a glorified towel boy for the team, and certainly not their manager, but of course, Chris decides to glorify himself in his own comic. So past Chris walks up to his friend, Joe, who either just got shot by a bunch of paintballs, got kissed by someone wearing a lot of lipstick, or has acne. It is impossible to tell which. Past Chris says that he looks up to Joe like his real older brother, Cole Smithy. Then we have the ultimate culmination of Chris's bad writing. We have his trademark abusive text. We have text boxes in the wrong order. We have people talking off screen. We have Chris trying to make himself look cool while actually making himself look like a dork for reading Fear Street. We have Chris making a pop culture reference, but he makes it wrong and we aren't sure if it's a joke or if he's actually an idiot. We stick together like the Three Musketeers, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. I don't know if that's who he thinks the real Three Musketeers are, I don't know if he's making a joke at the expense of his past self, I don't know why he says Three Musketeers when there's only two of them. And of course, we have Chris fawning over a girl and using the full name of a real person in the comic. It's... it's maddening. So I'm going to read this page to the best of my ability, pretending that it's structured properly. You look sad, buddy. What's up? Well, I went on a first date with my gal, Lindsay, last night. We had dinner at a good restaurant, but it turned wrong with spilled soup, tossed salad. It was a mess. She blames me for it. I later asked her for a second date. She yelled at me to get lost and slapped the door in my face. I took a cold shower later and cried the night away. Well, there are a lot of cute girls here, like Laura Beth Dorzo of the cheerleaders there. Wow, she is so fine. She's gonna be mine. But I'll chill with you, man. We gotta stick together like the Three Musketeers, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. I-J-K-L-M-N Todd. What? I'll get that water for ya. Oh my pom-pom. I'll talk to ya later, man. Hey Joe, I need more H2O here. Cool Joe, I'll be reading R.L. Stein here. Chris, what does any of that mean? What does... What does this part mean? Oh, this is literally all the letters between H and O, because it's H2O, so it's I-J-K-L-M-N. That's the worst thing I've ever read. Chris, does he understand what tossed salad is? Was this a joke, or is it a coincidence? Who is Laura? Is she meant to come up again, or is Chris just saying that Joe should move on? Why can't Chris move on? Why is Joe calling Lindsay his gal if this was their first date, and obviously they weren't a couple if a spilled drink was enough to make her hate him? Why is a guy cool enough to wear a ripped vest admitting that he cried last night? So Joe goes to refill some guy's water, and Chris starts reading Fear Street, imagining two hedgehogs talking by a locker. Modern Chris admits, to no one, that he used to imagine Goosebumps and Fear Street characters as Sonic characters. Sometimes, I would put myself in a lead role, but before I was able to, I had to train my brain to visually remember what I looked like from a mirror. Also, Chris has been wearing glasses this entire issue, but that wasn't explained. So Sonichu sees the Sonichu Ball appear out of nowhere. Apparently the Sonichu Balls scatter through time and space, like how the Dragon Balls work, but also through time. What event caused them to scatter is unknown, but whatever. So the ball falls on Chris's head while he's reading the book, and he imagines Bionic the Hedgehog for the first time. He imagines him into the real world, as if he's actually hallucinating him. Sonichu grabs the ball and switches it for a basketball. Then they peel out of there, leaving past Chris behind to say that he's going to grab some pens and draw Bionic. In the vein of the Family Guy joke from before, Beavis and Butthead come along and see an open locker. 
In Chris's imagination, he pictures Bionic popping out of a locker, so these two come along to close it. Then they keep slamming it shut. In a nearby classroom, a teacher says they're all going to be having sex, and he gets all the girls. The joke here, I guess, is that Beavis and Butthead don't get to partake because they skip class to slam the locker shut. Chris apologizes to Mike Judge, the creator of Beavis and Butthead, keeping in mind that he told Seth MacFarlane to use his Family Guy skit, but then he apologized for parodying a Mike Judge skip, which was kind of similar, I don't, I don't understand. So the heroes are in the time stream again, trying to return to the present. Sonichu stops short when they arrive, and Chris gets tossed out of the time bubble, being thrown through space and time. See, around this time in the real world, readers of Sonichu were complaining that Chris was making the story too much about himself, and not enough about Sonichu, which is 100% true. So Chris decided to write himself out of the comic, and this is how. He's lost in time with two of the Sonichu balls. Sonichu and Magichan return to Quickville Mall two hours after they left. The two seem very blasé about having just lost Chris and two balls to the void, and Sonichu makes some innuendo about sex. This is rated TVY7, guys. My date with Reese Chu isn't until 8, then later at 10, heh heh heh, tonight. Ah yes, the bonus round of honest, true love and romance. Magichan notes that Black Sonichu is trying to date Bubbles, and Wild and Munchy are both going for Angelica. Keep in mind that all these characters are pretty much siblings. Magichan says he's too ignorant of love because he's too smart, and Sanchu says he'll find a woman by the next season. The two finally notice that Chris is gone. Magichan realizes that the power of the crystals allowed Chris to pass through the bubble, and now he's lost. They have to wait for a time warp to pen to get him out, but that could take some time. Sanchu breaks the bad news to Rose Chu during their date, and tells her that Chris, lost in time, is living out his timeline at a bunch of points simultaneously meaning that he can watch over them like our lord and god are able to. Chris calling himself God Counter? Two. Rose is upset, but at least Chris's secretart, Allison, can handle the city. Then, Rose Chu and Sonic hug, and we see a panty shot of Rose Chu, for some reason. It looks like she's wearing Depends, not panties. Rose Chu then says that they should go home and do our thing heart. Sonic Chu says they should get a ring from Walmart first. Not... Malwart, Walmart, because Chris is not consistent with anything. Then we cut to the new private villa of Corrupted Citizens, which is now a high school. Inside, a council of evil have gathered. Scott Palazzo, manager of the entire region. Cad Chef, Black Manager, the robot guy who Darkbind had cut the limbs off of earlier. Nate Zerk, Baguette, Jerk Chief, WM Manager, who's just a head in a jar. Two other guys we've never met, but have target cups, so we can assume that they're just regular target jerk cops. Wes Isley, Eggman, Giovanni of Team Rocket, Jason, a new villain that we're being introduced to now, and Kathleen, Jason's female slave. Jason is a personification of Encyclopedia Dramatica, which Chris was waging war with in real life at this time. They made a page mocking him, and he tried to have it taken down, but of course you can't do that. So Jason stands for the real-life Jason Kendrick Howell, who made Chris's ED page. Then we have Mary Lee Walsh and Count Graduan. She proclaims that with Chris lost in time, they can finally attack and take down Quickville. Then we cut to Chris lost in the time void, and oh boy. So these last few comics took a long time for Chris to make. You'll recall that Megan was in the beginning of this issue, and Chris actually held her hand. Well, in the real world since then, some stuff went down. In an effort to prove to people online who were calling Grizz gay that he was straight, he uploaded various drawings of himself engaging in sexual activities. One of them involved Chris being intimate with a girl with dark hair. The community mocked him for this, mistaking the girl for Crystal and saying that he was into incest. Chris clarified to them that it wasn't Crystal in the drawing, it was Megan. This made Megan very angry. The following are excerpts from emails between Chris and Megan during this time. I just don't know what to say now. I am very much scarred by that image, and it will never leave me. And I can't decide what's worse, the image in general, or the fact you intentionally drew it and gave it to the webmaster for that site that you hate so much. Not only have you poured gas on the fire by doing that, adding obscenity to the already horrific site, but you have also embarrassed and humiliated me, and degraded and demeaned me whether you realize it or not. I mean, I'm not that kind of girl, and you know that, so why? And you also lied to me about it. 
Chris from the comics says, What? An email from Megan? Dumping me? But why? You were never together, Chris. Forcentgarbage.com? That's what Chris calls Encyclopedia Dramatica and 4chan. Mocking me? Slanderous filth? A drawing of me and Megan? Intimate? And I drew that? She dumped me over that? Oh, that hurts. In the real world, Chris responded to Megan's email, seemingly missing the point entirely. I understand. You may, or may not, have had much exposure to sexual images as I have had, so the idea of a hand job, which was the act drawn there, as part of outer course versus intercourse, was a surprise to you. I'm sorry. If it helps put things into perspective, I can recommend finding information on the internet through this educational website I found through adamandeve.com. Or I recommend renting The 40-Year-Old Virgin. That movie touches on some of the issues around sex, and how it can really frustrate an older virgin who hasn't had the pleasure yet. Or, I can loan you my copy of The 40-Year-Old Virgin. The point is allowing yourself more exposure to sex acts to make yourself feel more comfortable with that fact of life. Unfortunately for Chris, the drawing wasn't the only reason that Megan dumped him. Megan was upset and asked Chris why he drew the image. Megan. Well, I'm sorry, but that just makes me more angry in a way. It's not the actual sex act that traumatizes me. It's the fact that you fantasize doing such things to me when you know I would never. It's like, how do I know you're not going to abduct me and such? That was a figure of speech. You know what I mean? It creeps me out you have such thoughts about me. It's like you're stalking me, so you really need to back off. Chris. If I didn't have the foresight to put my pent-up frustrations and feelings in the form of something, I might have become an abusive maniac, so thank God for allowing me to release my bottled-up frustrations in a more positive, yet not so politically correct, and not physically hurting others, method. Be the release as it may, I am hurting so much more than you can be. I'm sorry for uploading the drawing, and I really wish I could go back in time and stop myself from making the mistake. Yet, I do not regret drawing the drawing, because if I hadn't released my frustrations in the creative sense, I might actually have done something really dumb and stupid. Megan I can't put this behind me because I don't feel comfortable around you anymore, especially since you said you drew that so you wouldn't do anything stupid. What does that mean? Abducting me and raping me? I'm afraid I can't trust you anymore. That was the end of their communication for a while, and the death of their friendship. Chris mentions on this page one Joshua Martinez, who was a childhood friend of his that he kept in contact with through adulthood. Chris, tired of being attacked on Encyclopedia Dramatica, told his trolls to go after Joshua, who he thought was very successful, especially with women. Joshua didn't take kindly to this, and began impersonating Vanessa Hudgens, saying she found Chris attractive in an attempt to swindle money out of him. Vanessa Hudgens and me? She is cute, heart. Then, in a twist, Josh has Vanessa and him end up dating. Those things all happen to the real Chris as he drew this comic, but at the bottom, he goes back to the fictional Sonichu world. Mary Lee Walsh with all those villains? Terror around Quickville? He states that the Hedgehogs, who have to fight without him, win the battle, which is a dumb spoiler, and then he curses for sent garbage again. Chris notes that this isn't the end of the season. This isn't even the end of the issue, so I don't know why he'd have to specify that. So on this one page, Chris mixed the very real trauma associated with losing Megan as a friend, the lore associated with his childhood friend tricking him into thinking he could date Vanessa Hudgens, but then betraying him and dating her himself, and combines that with random Sonichu nonsense. This one page can really be Chris beginning to lose track of what is real and what is fictional. Tune in every day to See Quick for Everything, hosted every day from Jams to Sonichu and Melissa Rose Chu. Again, the Sonichu and Rose Chu are not part of the chaotic combo, were not born from the rainbow energy, and thus cannot exist, but whatever. At the radio station, we're introduced to pop sensation Blanca. In the real world, Blanca was a troll who pretended to be Chris's girlfriend after Megan left. Chris is introducing her into the comics now. There's this ungodly wall of text, and literally none of it matters. Bianca is Jigliami's manager. Jigliami is an anthropomorphized Jigglypuff who is designed by the real world Blanca. Blanca also plays Guitar Hero in Jigliami's band. 
She stands on stage playing Guitar Hero Wii while Jigliami sings. Yeah. Oh, I love this song. Well, I just can't help but admire how gorgeous you both are. She's, a uh, beautiful, DJ Gems Asana 2. Also, Lolisa Rosechu does an interview with Chris's biggest fan, who says he is also a lonely virgin and is taking Chris's advice. He is doing therapy with himself and a Furby named Michelle to relieve stress at home. This is based on a video where Chris tells boys to play with dolls to get more accustomed to talking to girls, and tells girls to play with Transformers so they can talk to boys. If you're a young gentleman, I recommend buying yourself a My Little Pony figure of your favorite color or whatever. Now, uh, stroking the hair of said pony is very relaxing and therapeutic, and also rubbing it against your cheek. That's nice. And also, uh, you can pretend that uh, the pony is uh, that girl you want to take you want to take out to, you want to take out sometime, and talk to the pony like you would talk to the girl. Now, for the uh, ladies, I recommend a good old Autobot from Transformers, because you can get to learn how to examine the mechanics and variations of each and every, I mean, of the uh, Autobot you have. Like uh, you would try, like you would learn how a man works, and it'll allow you to feel more comfortable in approaching and talking to that boy you've been flirting from a distance, or uh, just been uh, flirting with from a distance. The fan also says he uses Axe body spray, like Chris says. Lolisa asks why he hasn't found the right woman yet, and the fan says, "Ah, yes." The Big Pondering. That's apparently Kurtz's favorite word, this issue. Well, in addition to his proven fact of the infinitely high boyfriend factor, I have found women very beautiful, yet they can be frightening due to their surprising emotions and mood swings. Yep, that's, uh, that's how Chris views women. Again, he definitely understands women enough to transition to one. The comic ends with Boston's More Than a Feeling, and Chris completed it on August 20th, 2008. 17 months after it started. We get a full-page ad for Chris's PS3 game, and that is, thankfully, the end of the issue. The problem with this issue ending is that it means I have to cover what happens next, and oh boy, I am dreading that. This is not where the fun begins. And now, I leave you with the lessons that you should have- I hope you have learned from my message. You should all- you should stay in school. Learn as you much and try before you praise or despise. Never smoke, never drink, never worry about how others think of you when you do things, or when you play with things that may not, that may not seem like you or whatever. Don't be afraid to approach those of your opposite gender. And most importantly, please stay straight. I leave you with those words, as I have shared with you on this, my 25th birthday, February 24th, 2007. I am Christopher Christian Weston Chandler. Live long and shine on in your very own unique way. War is never the answer. Peace is. Never fight. Compliments will get you fuzzy wuzzies. War gets you prickly wicklies. As well as punches, they get you those too. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. At this point in his life, our humble author Chris Chan has become obsessed with sex. For years, he's called himself a virgin with rage and has tried to find his one sweetheart, but it's clear from his sex doll, the Sailor Moon adult video I mentioned before, that Chris is equally obsessed with sex. There are several drawings of him engaging in sexual activities with multiple women, including the infamous Megan drawing. He also drew images of his Sonichu characters, including Mary Lee Walsh. Three versions of this comic exist. In one, there is no censorship and everything is laid out to see. In another, Chris has censored the private parts with images of bananas and grapefruit. In the third, Chris has removed all sexual content entirely. But it is the uncensored version that we will be looking at in this video, because it is the original and has the most content. All of the censorship in this video was done by me so that it would be allowed on YouTube, and I promise his drawings are extremely disturbing. This issue is titled Rose Chew instead of Sonichu, 
but it is still labeled as issue 8. It was drawn in August 2008 and is titled Spring Break Concert featuring Blanca's Jigliami. As you can see, all the female characters are wearing bikinis at the beach, which of course raises the question as to why they have to wear bikinis if they normally don't wear clothes at all. So let's get into that. Chris draws Sonichu and Rosechu in their bedroom together. Rosechu initiates a sexual encounter in which Sonichu states he's glad they picked up condoms. It's implied that this is happening right after their date at the end of the last issue and that the raincoat they bought at Walmart means condoms. Well, sweet bolt, we're both nice and clean. You ready to get dirty again? You bet your sweet bod, girl. Good thing we stopped for a pack of condoms. It's too bad the regular size ones break easily on my 7-incher. So yeah, Sonichu has a 7-inch penis. Sonichu is canonically 5'4", meaning his penis is 1 9th the length of his entire body. So as the two get into what Chris calls Missionary Cowgirl, the narrator juts in, Let us pause for a moment to zoom in on how intercourse, as well as their parts, work for our electric hedgehogs. Kill me! So rose chews, like female humans, have vaginas, which Chris says are also known as China. Chris calls them this because he thinks vagina is a dirty word, yet he also uses it liberally. I love dykes! Dykes! China! I'm straight! Chris explains that the rose chew China physically seals itself unless the rose chew is urinating, having sex, or using a psych up attack. Keep that last one in mind because it will come up again later. Note that their vaginas don't open during childbirth, according to Chris. Their nipples also only become exposed when aroused by a sensual massage, creating the creepy implication that this has to be done before they can feed their children. Chris then explains that the penis of a sonichu slides inside their body when not in use and can only emerge with the help of gravity, meaning that the sex position on the last page would be impossible for sonichu to actually do. The testicles of a sonichu are also inside their body and protected by a bone so that they can't be kicked in the balls. Chris then describes sonichu sex, including the amount of semen released, the fact that STDs exist, only to then say that there are no sonichu STDs, and he even talks about Rose Chu's hymen. This part is dumb. Unless the love hogs are ready for the responsibilities of parenthood, they seek birth control from doctor-recommended prescriptions, or simply use a condom. av av -il -a -bull. At most grocery stores. Chris then confirms that condoms are also called raincoats. The rose chew, despite being a mammal, then lays an already fertilized egg after growing it for a few months in their womb. Chris then claims this was a PSA for the readers, and that we can learn from our hero Sonichu how to have safe sex with our opposite gender significant other. We then get a picture of the two naked, kissing. Sonichu performing oral sex on Rosechu, who for some reason is now super fat. Rosechu screaming, come on, big man, defy your gravity. Then the two 69. We get a close-up shot of each of their faces 69ing. A close-up shot of Sonichu's penis, covered in a condom entering Rosechu, and then more sex positions. Chris labels the different panels as different rooms in the house and different times of day, implying that they do this a lot. Then we finally get a full page drawing of the two having sex, and I hate Sonichu's face here. I can't show them, but Rosechu's nipples are also very hairy for some reason. Like, I know she has fur, but that's very unappealing. So that ends that bit, for now. And we get episode 17 prologue. Chris explains that Sonichu is 19 and Rosechu 18, and they live in a house paid for by tax dollars. He draws a terrible map of the town in relation to them, and then has to explain the map, adding, without any hint of irony, Thank God I took computer-aided drafting and design CAD classes to make these accurate measurements. What accurate measurements, Chris? This is the outside of Sonichu's house, and we get the actual episode 17, Rage Against the Garbage. So keep note of the date, it's November 2007. Despite the fact that it takes Chris months and sometimes years to finish a Sonichu comic, he keeps the timeline pretty consistent, meaning that he's writing events that continue to happen longer ago in the past as time moves on in the real world. So Sonichu wakes up and asks Rosechu for sex, and Rosechu says she's on a website called 4 that drags their and Chris's names through the mud. 4 Cent Garbage is supposed to be Encyclopedia Dramatica and 4chan. There's a kind of confusing joke here. Rosechu points out pictures on the website of them in compromising sexual situations, and Sonichu gets concerned, wondering if someone's been sneaking around getting pictures of them. Apparently the pictures are of him and Rosechu, Black Chew and Bubbles, something about Mary Lee Walsh, something about Angelica Rose Chew, and then the Chris and Megan picture. Rose Chew cuts in that they aren't photographs, they're drawings, meaning that the real world of Sonichu actually looks the way the comic is drawn, and in-universe's Chris's drawing skills are photorealistic. Most disturbing to Rose Chew is a drawing of her with a penis. 
In real life, people would often mock Chris with such drawings to imply his characters were either trans or gay because he hated both groups at the time. The image in the comic is stolen from the art of an actual troll. Sanju feels sick and almost throws up from the implication that Roshu might be a man, and mentions that she was the centerfold of that month's Pokeboy magazine, saying it should have proven she was all woman. That means that, in this universe, Roshu did softcore porn for a Playboy equivalent. It also means that such thing as a Pokeboy exists, so there is porn of other kinds of Pokemon, which is also disturbing. To get revenge, Roshu then takes a bunch of pictures of herself naked. In this one, shown to the audience through the lens of a camera, she is naked with her legs spread apart. In this one, she is stripping in the shower. In this one, she is washing herself in the shower. In this one, she is bending over in the bathroom. In this one, she is bending over at a different angle. Chris puts a disturbing amount of detail and emphasis on her vagina, making it look like there are giant flaps that close over it, which of course, for rose shoes, there are. Four more shots of her naked in the bathroom doing poses with bedroom eyes, and finally that's over, and I can wash my eyes out with bleach. She uploads the pictures and waits 30 minutes, but now she sees that there are even more drawings of her online with a penis, so she decides to ask Bubbles and Angelica for their assistance. Sonichu is upset, not from his wife posting these pictures everywhere, but by the drawings of her, and Rosechu says they should go to Forcent Garbage's headquarters and try to reason with them. So Rosechu, Sonichu, and Wild Sonichu arrive at their headquarters, which is in Tennessee for some reason. The logo on the front of the building reinforces that this building also represents the website 4chan. Sonichu had made an appointment to meet with Jason, the eyepatch villain introduced in the last issue, but he says he didn't give a last name. Two characters walk by in the background. We cut to them having a conversation. Lovey, if I've told you one to a million times, that's not an expression, Chris, you shouldn't leave your purse at our mansion. I'm sorry, Thurston, but we were on that island for so long I've gotten used to strolling without it. Indeed. These characters are clearly Thurston and Lubby Howell from Gilligan's Island. A millionaire and his wife. In the corner, Chris asks the reader to guess Jason's last name. Jason in the comic is based on the real-life troll Jason Kendrick Howell, so Chris seems unwilling to actually name his character Jason Howell, but he'll hint at it very strongly by including these two Howell characters in the comic. I like to think that in the Sonichu universe, Gilligan escaped the island and the Howells are actually Jason's parents. This all, of course, would have to happen after Gilligan's Adventures in Space, of course. Wild Sonichu mentions that the sixth Sonichu ball is inside the building, making this all highly convenient for the plot. Chris can get his revenge on 4chan and Encyclopedia Dramatica while also moving the plot of his comic along. Chris then adds to Wild Sonichu's backstory. He literally labels that he didn't think of this until August 2008. Apparently, Wild Scyther Father was stolen by Pokemon poachers and taken away in a van, despite being a Pokemon who, like, you know, can be caught in a Pokeball. Wild cried while trying to cut through the truck, but the Scyther told him to give up. This now motivates Wild to get revenge. This never comes up again. Wild Sonichu has the ability to turn invisible, saying he learned this move from a Porygon, who can't turn invisible, so this is stupid. Kecleon would have been a much better Pokemon for this because they actually can do that because they're chameleons. The interior of the building is red, and looks like an evil villain's lair. The receptionist is a demon, who faces away from the door for some reason. Sonichu says they're there for a meeting. The demon says for them to go to the 66th plus 6th floor, and Sonichu comments with a raised eyebrow, Wouldn't that be the 72nd floor? As if this is some sort of clever joke or something. Sonichu is mad that the demon was rude, and Roshu tells him to remember Joseph's story and forgive him. They're suddenly in a church in front of a cross and dove. Keep this in mind for later. Rosechu is preaching forgiveness. That's that's going to be important. Sonichu wonders what kind of evil could be done on the other floors if the receptionist is this rude. This seems to only be an excuse to show other floors as they go up because you know that's not that's not how elevators work. They don't just stop on every single floor. We then see Wild sneak in the fire exit. It's hard to make him out because Chris just drew him as an outline in pencil and he blends in with the background because he's invisible. He swings off a chandelier to ascend. Again, it's kind of hard to see. So then we see what Sonichu and Rosechu pass on each floor. Chris notes that the page should be read from the bottom to the top because the characters are going up an elevator. This is dumb. On the second floor, a bunch of workers at their computers are passed out and two talk about hangovers and drinking. This is a depiction of evil to Chris because he thinks alcohol is really, really bad. Just as bad as child pornography and pedophilia. Chris steals artwork of Pedo Bear in a bath or something, 
with the Powerpuff Girls, who are naked. And yes, the drawing is explicit. Chris obviously doesn't understand what Pedo Bear is, because Sonic Chu says, I don't understand. What's the deal with that? Chris went to all this effort to make sure his crayon-drawn hedgehogs were explicitly 18 before they started having sex, and then he puts competently drawn naked human children in his comic for no reason. That's, that's, that's great, Chris. This one says, I hate Sonic Rocks My Socks. Sonic Chu doesn't understand it either. Sonic Rocks My Socks is an artist with their own ED page. The seventh floor shows an artist drawing Rose Chu with a penis, implying it is a full-time, paid job to do this. Rose Chu exits the elevator and slaps him. The eighth floor is hard to comprehend, but Sonic Chu is spin-dashing this worker, who made a nude Mary Lee Walsh leading Sonic by a leash. This image is covered by Sonic Chu mid-spin-dash. On the ninth floor, the electric hedgehog Pokemon zaps a worker, drawing Sonic Chu, giving Rose Chu a blowjob. On the 10th floor, Chris pops out of the time void to slap a worker who is drawing a parody of the Chris Chan straw image. On the 11th floor, there's parody art of the gorillas or something. The 12th floor, Knuckles is a gangster. The 13th floor, gender bent Sonichu Knuckles and Tails. 14th floor, Pedo Bear as Phoenix Wright. Sonichu comments, it's that bear again, proving that Chris doesn't know who Pedo Bear is. 21st floor, a classical painting of nude women bathing, but the captions are impossible to read. 22nd floor, Dark Magician Girl from Yu-Gi-Oh! with exposed breasts is doing some sort of sexual act. Her crotch is also exposed. Chris calls this a dark magic attack. 23rd floor, anthropomorphized Charmeleon in a sexual pose with human genital anatomy. Sonichu comments that he could beat it in any Pokemon battle. 24th floor, Chris seems to have run out of clever commentary. They just say this girl looks freaky. 33rd floor, Transformers porn. 34th floor, Sonic and Amy having sex in the same position Sonichu and Roshu were in earlier, making it clear that Chris traced or copied this image for the comic. 35th floor, multiple nude Sonic characters. 36th floor, a Magic the Gathering card called Strip Strip Fever, featuring more nude Sonic the Hedgehog characters. Sonichu asks what card game it's from. It's unclear whether this is a joke and Sonichu wants to play a game with nude animals, or if Chris actually doesn't know what Magic the Gathering is. Next, we get the entire White House contained on the 51st floor, with a grass lawn and everything. Sonichu and Rose Chu have no comment. Obama, who Chris draws wearing a turban, is painting the White House black, which was a pretty common joke back in 2008, but George W. Bush pushes him off his ladder. On the White House lawn, Sarah Palin, Hillary Clinton, and John McCain are watching, and McCain says Obama can't paint the White House black until he's been elected. Chris notes that this joke was originally thought of by his father, again, despite being a common joke. Keep in mind this issue takes place in 2007, long before anyone knew who Obama was, but it is a product of Chris drawing it in late 2008. Floor 61, Dot, the very underage sister from Animaniacs, is pole dancing nude. 62nd floor, nude Lois Griffin. 63rd floor, nude Marge Simpson. 64th floor, nude 10-year-old Misty from Pokemon. During this part, Sancho and Rose 2 are kissing, so I can only assume that they're actually aroused by this child pornography. 69th floor. Despite the obvious joke, this floor does not contain nudity, but instead the Xbox 360 in the form of an anime girl. These anime video game consoles are pretty popular and have been for a while. Chris seems to lose focus on the fact that these floors are supposed to be about bad things, and next shows a 360 being destroyed. Chris was a huge Sony fanboy and hated the Hexbox. Floor 71, trophy unlocked. Killed the Hexbox, now play your PlayStation 3 or Nintendo Wii in peace. Cut to Wild sneaking on floor 36. Chris says, insert Pink Panther theme here. Sonichu and Rose Chu pass on the elevator as Sonichu is asking what card game the magic card is from. Wild finds a locked door. How he knows what door he's looking for is unclear. He picks the lock with a leaf, breaks in, finds a safe, but then notices the Sonichu ball is just sitting on a shelf, so he picks it up. Picking it up actually causes his invisibility power to deactivate. This is actually consistent with the other two Sonichu balls giving Chris the power to phase through the time bubble. Wild then uses a spell to make the ball enter his body physically. Chris actually also did this in the last issue, but it wasn't explained. Sonichu and Rose Chu finally get to the top floor. Jason is on a throne with his female slave. He announces, Visitors, welcome to my heck. I am Jason Kendrick Howell, one 20-year-old troll who only offers slanderous mockeries. He then points out that his sex slave is 17, meaning all his activities with her are absolutely illegal within these 50 states. This is untrue as, of the 50 states, only 10 have the age of consent set at 18. Virginia does, so Chris is right about that, but 8 have it at 17 and 32 have it at 16. 
It's also 18 in Tennessee, so it's likely that's why Chris has the 4 cent garbage building in Tennessee. But if he knew that, then he wouldn't have written this line, so it's illogical in every sense. Sonichu pleads for Jason to take down the webpage, and says some schlock about America and the flag or something. It's really dumb. Jason then says he is a troll whose mission in life is to cause torment, and that he won't take down the page. Sonichu becomes enraged. What you say? Then he sends electricity at Jason, who blocks it with no effort. Sonichu runs up super quick and Jason tosses him aside with telekinesis. Rosechu catches him. She says they should leave, and brings up Joseph again. As they leave, we get a panty shot of Rosechu. But the camera is like not below her, it's just from the back, meaning that that's just how her skirt is and everybody can see her underwear all the time. So in this image, on page 29, Rosechu hugs Sonichu from behind, and then on page 31, Chris feels the need to explain that Sonichu and Rosechu's needles are flexible, allowing them to hug, and their skin is tough as leather. Thank you for reading. There's some very unhelpful diagrams to go along with it. Wild Sonichu is sneaking on the ceiling with the Sonichu ball, then we cut right back to Sonichu and Rosechu. Jason tosses a pickle at them, which to Chris is a symbol of a penis. Jason says, That's right, Rosechu, go, go and play with your pickle. The pickle hits her in the back of the head and she gets enraged. Then we get a super angry panty shot. She then strips off her clothes and says, I've got three shocking bits for you, jerk. The three bits are implied to be both of her breasts and vagina. Chris also has to make sure to note that she has a C cup. She then unclasps her bra from the front, which is not how 99% of bras work, not that Chris would know that, and Chris draws her exposed breasts over two different panels, but they're lined up horribly so the proportions look terrible. Rose Chu then leaps into action, nude, with fangs, powered up by her anger. Chris has just invented Mega Evolutions for Pokemon in 2008. I am woman, hear me roar. She leaps toward Jason, wraps his head in her thighs, and squeezes. We then cut to Wild Chu just climbing around again. There's an explosion of energy. Jason, bleeding, collapses, and says, I should be dead, but dark forces keep me alive. What a show. Rose Chu gets dressed in the elevator. Wild sneaks towards the exit and meets them on the bottom floor. Rose Chu says they can only pray for Jason's downfall, and Wild says he found the Sonichu crystal, and Magichan says he can teleport them home. Allison has a photo of Batman on the wall for some reason. Crystal is still trapped in the Dark Dimension, and they have a portal in the office. Wild gives Patty the Sonichu ball he found, and now they have four, with the two Chris lost in the time void. That leaves one left to find. Later, in Sonichu's backyard, Rosechu has gathered all the female characters, including Lolisa Rosechu, who Chris notes is age 20. They're going to be shooting more nude photos to take on those trolls, and Bubbles screams, Victory for Women's Liberation! Angelica Rosechu hopes they can win this fight peacefully with God's support. We're then introduced to Simone La Rose Chu, who's 19. She comes in with this awful line. I hope this is the right place. I hate making that mistaken turn in the wrong place. <laughs> this is obviously a reference to Bugs Bunny's ongoing joke about making a wrong turn at Albuquerque whenever he pops out of his hole, but Chris just butchered it. It's like this comic is written by a robot. I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. Oh, I get it. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. I wonder... Uh, you know, I just bet we should have turned left at Albuquerque. Simona is actually a plagiarized character from one of Chris's fans who submitted a drawing to him of a male ground sonic shoe named Simon. Chris gender-swapped the character, and she became Simonla. The real-world origin will become important later, when Simon's creator demands Chris stop plagiarizing and remove the character. So Rose Chu is happy that the women are all there. Splendid. With our protest group growing, we will really hit those garbage sacks hard with our glorious womanhood. Then a small flying Sonic Chu zips in. She's a Pina, and she's 14. But Chris draws her with an exposed midriff, plenty of cleavage, and short shorts because he can't help but be creepy. Zepina wants to help, but Rosechu says she can't help because she's too young. Uh, I don't know, child. What with the dumb laws? One interpretation of this quote is that Chris is complaining that 14-year-olds can't shoot porn, but if you read the text from right to left, Zepina is saying that she can light the photo shoot with her glowing tail power, then Rosechu says she doesn't know because of the dumb laws, so the dumb laws might refer to child labor laws. For our rights as women among all people, I will overpower those slanderous jerks. What rights, Chris? Why is this suddenly about women's rights? In the beginning it was just slander. 
The end. <laughs> Just kidding, this issue's only half over. Next, we get a sex PSA from Sanchu and Rosechu. It's dumb. They mention that sex should be between opposite gendered partners, and Sonichu says Chris recommends that beyond sex ed, there should be a dating education class where people learn how to get to the third date where they can finally have sex. Then we get this ad. It's a tribute to the creator of Ren and Stimpy, and it's an ad for a knot hole. You can wear it as a ring, paint it, use it to hold stuff, whatever, moving on. Chapter 18 Prologue, Rose Chu's 19th Birthday. The chaotic combo is 19th birthday. Sonichu's surprise, 20th birthday. On Black Chu's birthday, even though he doesn't have one because he's a clone, Bubbles gives him a cupcake and they kiss. But Black Chu promises to keep their relationship secret. This reaffirms that the chaotic combo are all the same age, making Chris's decree a few issues prior that they are different ages, pure nonsense. It's spring break and Chris shows three different TV stations reporting on it. The first show is a white girl from UMP TV, rockin' spring break. Then we get a black woman in a bikini. Hey sisters and brothers, this is PHI and we're rockin' wild with spring break. Then we cut to FQX News, probably supposed to be Fox News. Leaving hundreds injured for Fox News, I'm Greta Squall, keeping it real and rockin' hard at spring break. She then strips and runs in the water. This is an exact joke Chris stole from Family Guy. This is MTV and we're rockin' at spring break! Hey, this is VH1 and we're rockin' at spring break! Leaving thousands injured. For CNN, I'm Bernard Shaw. Keeping it real and kicking ass at spring break! Woo! Episode 18, Spring Break 2008. DJ Jamsta and his assistant return to promote an upcoming Jigliami concert. DJ Jamsta is grateful that Chris Chan has banned all alcohol and cigarettes from Quickville so everyone can have good, clean fun. We get some moments of Jiggly preparing for her concert and Angelica asking Bubbles why she doesn't need sunscreen. She explains that she's 90% water so she can't get tan. A black Rose Chu then walks by and Rose Chu says, That's a wired woman. Do you know who she is? Bionic and Mega Gi walk over and Magichan telepathically tells Bubbles that the final Sonic Chu ball is in the ocean. Black Chu kicks sand all over the Rose Chus for no reason and Bubbles gets up and says that she's going to go tell him off but it turns out that he only kicks sand at them to hide the fact that he's dating Bubbles. This is pointless because the others see right through their ruse. They start calling Black Sonichu Blake at this point. We have a panel of Sonichu surfing drawn by Panda Halo, a troll who convinced Chris she was a girl interested in him. Blake and Bubbles agree to meet at Pier 969 in 15 minutes after Bubbles gets the final Sonichu ball, and then we see this transformation from the Black Rose Chew before into Bubbles. It turns out that she is Silvana Rose Chew. Another egg that was created when Sonic hit Pikachu all those years ago. Chris explains that the rainbow light transformed a bunch of other Pikachus into Sonichus, which is where people like DJ Jamps to Sonichu came from. Wish that had been explained issues ago, but whatever. Sylvana's egg landed on the moon in 1989, where Count Graduon eventually found her. Graduon grants Sylvana the power to transform like a ditto and gives her both sex organs, although she can never give birth. Back under the ocean, Bubbles swims past a bunch of Pokemon looking for the Sonichu Ball. Magichan says the ball is about 2 or 5,000 fathoms deep, so that's either 12 feet or 5.5 miles. On land, Sylvana, disguised as Bubbles, meets up with Blake, and Chris notes that she's capable of paralyzing people she's had sex with. So they start having sex under a pier, censored by word Bubbles, and Blake falls asleep. Sylvana takes his phone and sees a text from the real Bubbles that she's found the ball and will be coming to find him soon. Sylvana teleports Blake away to hide his body, and then takes his form. Bubbles gives the ball to Angelica to give to Patty, then says she has to meet her boyfriend. Five pages ago, her being with Blake was like a big secret, but now she just openly has a boyfriend. We cut to Punchy and Wild talking about how they don't know much about dating and want to take a class on it at the local university. This comes up again later. Backstage, at the stage, Jigliami stumbles on Blake's unconscious body and gasps. Magichan, who's been watching all this happen psychically, warns Bubbles that Blake isn't really Blake, and tells her to test him by having him use his electric powers. She ignores him and goes to meet the disguised Sylvana for sex anyway. Then she gets a call from Jigliami telling her Blake is unconscious backstage. Bubbles wonders who this imposter in front of her is, and decides to do what Magichan said and test him. She tells him it'll turn her on. Sylvana fakes a thunderbolt with a psychic attack and we get a shot of Bubbles being turned on. 
My favorite thing about this comic so far is that Bubbles is wearing a bikini, even though she doesn't normally wear any clothes at all. And when they had sex before, she wasn't wearing a bikini, but nothing was censored because she normally doesn't wear clothes. So then Bubbles attacks Sylvana, knowing it's not really a thunder move. Sylvana says she was sent by a friend of Chris Chan, and Magichan teleports Bubbles safely back to Blake's side, where she calls Sylvana a troll. Then Jigliami has her concert, with lyrics written by Blanca, who, remember, is an actual troll, which is some cruel twist of fate there. Then we see Chris back in the time void. In real life, Chris had been flirting with three trolls who he believed to be real women interested in him. He said he was conflicted, but God made his choice for him. One of the girls died in a car crash, and he actually drew an 18-wheeler hitting a car. He names a character after her on the next issue. He found out that one of them was a troll, and that one of them is Blanca, so the person who he features most in this issue he found out halfway through drawing the issue was actually a troll. And yet he does nothing about this and doesn't even draw Jigliami as a character. So all this leaves him with is Sarah McKenzie. She makes the third Sarah in Sonichu so far, with Hammer now married to a guy named Jack, Sarah Jackson now dead, although a character named Sarah Jackarass will appear in the next issue, and now Sarah McKenzie. Sarah McKenzie is also a troll. Sarah McKenzie has previously been called Panda Halo in the comic, and we'll get back to her when that time comes. Chris then spoils that in the end of the next book, he'll get out of the time void. And now for the uh, OK version of book number eight. And by OK version, I mean the OK version of, of the uh, next episode. Inside the master bedroom that night after their fun date. Well, sweet boat, we're both nice and clean. You ready to get dirty again? <laughs> you bet your sweet bye, girl. Good thing we stopped for a pack of condoms. It's too bad the regular ones break easily on my 7 inch. It's more like it's more like size 5 or less to measure those wimps. Hmm. Well, maybe the devil extra length will stay long, stay stronger and longer on your healthy girth. Well, I'm well, I'm itching for a little missionary cowgirl. Can you think you can handle it? I think I can hot shot. I think I can hot shot. Insert right A into slot B. Hmm. Let's pause for a moment. To, to, oh, never mind. We'll skip that part. I need to edit that part out. Anyway. Well, I'll start by placing their slanderous mockeries with an equal number of my own self serifolds. Beep, beep. Doing this in the bathroom. Click war. 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 Three minutes later, she comes out of the bathroom with her pictures on the memory card. Beep, 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 beep. Hmm. Shoot. About ten more or so of those dang images there were than there were earlier well, showed up. Hmm. And then they go to the next floor, then they see this little, then they see this little thing happening, and then I... Mm, yeah, I don't understand what's the deal with that. A big a bear? I don't know. Mm, and then and this, and this person saying, I hate SRMS, whatever that is. Yeah, I don't get this either. I don't even get it myself. I Seriously, as the author, I do not get it. I never really understood that. Anyway, continuing on. I have a vagina, uterus, and ovaries, you freak! Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, Sonic should comments on one of the floors that's omitted. Uh, what card game is that from? That's right, Roshu. Go, go and play with your pickle. And he throws a, he throws a real pickle, a veg, the vegetable pickle, and hits Rosie on the head. Boom. She lands midway between Sancho and Jason in her, in her bra and panties, and she says, I've got three shocking bits for you, jerk! I am woman! Hear me roar! And after a transformation, she lunges right at him. And she sits on, and she sits on, his, sh on his shoulders, but a front to his face. And then she digs into his head. Lakes a hope, lakes a hope, makes a whole bunch of scratches. <sighs> and then she leans, leans down to chop him on his, chop his head. 
and then he, she lets out a mighty thunderbolt. <laughs> and Sancho's like, whoa. December 2008. There are a lot of characters in this comic now. Some introduced at strange times, and others brought up once and never mentioned again. Their backstories and egresses only understandable to those following Chris's personal life. But even though that's a complaint and a negative aspect of the series, there is something really cool about this cover featuring all of the Sonichus and Rose Chews in battle poses. Even Bionic is dunking a basketball. Episode 19, Date Ed, aka Dating Education, even though the idea sounds dated. That's supposed to be a pun. Wild and Punchy are walking through the halls of Quickville University, discussing the dating class they're going to take. Unfortunately, this issue is handwritten by Chris instead of typed, which makes it lose some of its charm and legibility. The university is also a high school for some reason, and Zapina, the 14-year-old Rose Jew, is there. Her babysitter tells her to find a good 16-year-old boy for some reason. So they all go to class, taught by Miss Jackarass, and she gives a long speech. This is the problem with Chris handwriting the comic, he crosses out words and takes up significantly more space than he actually needs. So Mrs. Jackarass tells them that they will be secretly paired with members of the opposite sex, excluding herself, both because it would be illegal and because she's dating a cowboy, and they should practice dating one another and use the tips that they learn in class. The teacher, Sarah Jackarass, is based on the person, Sarah Jackson, who was featured in the previous issue who Chris described as being hit by a car. She was a troll in real life that Chris believed was his actual sweetheart, and this character is a tribute to her. She then says that they should start as friends and eventually move on to being a couple, meaning that Chris's ideal high school date ed class would just assign you a partner at random. She also passes out dolls. It's unclear if they're supposed to practice talking to these dolls to get over the fear of the opposite gender or if they're sex dolls. I'm going to assume the former, especially since they're referred to as Barbara and Robert dolls, which are the names of Chris's parents. During Roll Call, we're introduced to Ivy and Reginald who will become important soon. Reginald is a Sneasel, even though this is the worst attempt at drawing a Sneasel I have ever seen. The class is mostly populated by South Park characters, with Wendy and Cartman very recognizable. As the class is sitting down, nervously waiting for the pairings, the camera zooms in on Ivy's eyes, and we see Chris Chan floating inside them. Then we see Chris with Ivy inside his eye. Chris then gets a vision from God and Jesus that he and Ivy are destined to be together. Before we continue, I must address a special issue of Sonichu that Chris drew. Ivy is a real person. Well, Ivy is actually not a real person. She's a troll pretending to be Chris's girlfriend, again. But Chris drew a special issue of Sonichu for her in which he saves her from the villainous Clyde Cash. Sometime during the writing of the last issue of Sonichu, Chris said that he didn't want to actually finish the comic so a troll pretending to be a teenage boy named Ryan said he would commit suicide unless Chris drew more. Chris refused to do so, and so the boy, Ryan, died. Clyde Cash is Ryan's brother, and various trolls would use Clyde's identity to troll Chris over the years. This panel down here is from the end of that comic that he drew specifically for Ivy, although its canonicity is unknown, as Chris would be in the void at this point and be unable to save her. The pairings then get announced, and Reginald, who looks more like a Digimon than a Sneasel, is upset that he didn't get the pairing he wanted. He wanted to be with a Flappy named Layla, but she's Punchy's partner. We get to see Chris's amazing writing skills as he places Ivy in this class only for her to refuse to participate because she wants to date Chris. Reginald sees Punchy buying a soda and gets mad that he's paired with Layla instead of him. His rage builds, and the next day, the class is separated onto opposite sides of the room by gender so that pairs will remain anonymous. There's a montage of Punchy and Layla getting to know each other better, and Reginald getting more and more jealous. And yes, Chris literally calls it a montage. The next day in class, Punchy and Layla are getting more serious, making plans for a real-world date. Reginald sneaks under the table and cuts the wires to Wilde's computer, so he can't type anymore. Layla asks if he wants to meet up with her and Punchy gets upset that he can't respond. He asks Wilde to go tell Layla that he really does want to go on a date, but he's unable to type it. So Wilde walks over to Layla and tells her that Punchy accepts the date. Then he sees that Simonla is the person he's been messaging with, and the two instantly fall in love. 
They go home together, and there's a bunch of diagrams of the houses because Chris is a bad storyteller. Punchy and Layla ride on a motorcycle to go to McDonald's and order a salad. Punchy feeds her with his fork, and we get this shot. Reginald is upset that he didn't get a date, and Angelica comes down to keep him company. Angelica tells Reginald he should learn the lesson to ask someone out before it's too late. Then, Reginald asks Angelica out, and she says yes. All the couples watch the sunset together, all except Ivy, who sadly awaits Chris's return. Then the day of the final exam comes. They have a new teacher, Rita, Sarah's sister. Sarah died in a car accident, so she's the teacher now for no reason. This is because Chris thinks that the real Sarah Jackson did actually die in a car crash. Here's the best word bubble in the entire series. Good morning. I, Rita Jackarass, Sarah's sister, sob, sorry, sis recently passed in automobile accident with truck. Chris did not even attempt to use proper grammar. It's possible that Chris is attempting to have her have an accent, but sis tell me a lot about you all. Or it's also possible that he ran out of space in the word bubbles. The students get their grade, after individually toing them, with Punchy being the only 100, but Ivy gets a 99 despite not actually doing anything in the class because she was waiting for Chris. A character named Clyde gets a 65, the lowest grade out of the bunch. Then Chris finishes the episode with a copy of the test they took, and invites people to send him their answers for him to grade. The test has to be seen to be believed. About blank percent of regular girls ditch boys, and blank percent of pretty girls ditch boys. The answers are 10 and 100, 50 50, 73 and 98, or 75 and 13. The answer, according to Chris, is 73 and 98. If 98% of pretty girls ditch boys, then how are they in relationships, Chris? Wouldn't they all be single? How does that fit in with the infinitely high boyfriend factor? It doesn't, you're dumb. Which characteristic attracts the opposite gender the best? Class clown, full show off, Silent types, or none of the above. The question is formatted with which of the following does X the best, and Chris says that the correct answer is none of the above, and that is not possible. None of the above cannot be the best of the options. When is an appropriate time to ask for a phone number? Up front, middle of conversation, or end of enjoyable conversation? Chris says it's the third one, obviously. Boys can be like magnets, and girls like metal, when the boy is confident, honest, and smart. True or false? Chris says this one's true, but I'm not sure why he has the weird magnet metaphor. When there should be a girl for every boy, all people of your opposite gender is already taken by some other dude or gal. True or false? This is a pretty hard question to parse what he actually means, but I think he's saying that if there is someone for everybody else, then is it true that everyone of the opposite gender is taken? Based on the infinitely high boyfriend factor, you'd think that Chris would agree with the statement, but apparently the correct answer is that it's false. If the relationship or crush doesn't work out, you worry, move on, cry and pout, none of the above. Chris says that the correct answer is move on. How should you approach the person of your opposite gender if you are really shy? As a friend first, run away. If we run away, Chris, then how are we actually approaching them? That does not make any sense. With hanky in mind, hanky being sex, send someone else. Based on what happens in this comic, which is that Punchy asks Wild to ask a girl out for him, and it goes well, and then they immediately start dating, you'd think that that's the right answer, but no. Chris says that the right answer is A, as a friend. If they give you a wrong number, try harder on that person. True or false? And Chris says that it's false. To keep your girl guy liking you, you should keep clean, act normal, show off a skill, or all of the above. Chris says that it's all of the above. Then the essay question says to make a 10-step approach to walking up to and talking to people of the opposite gender. Chris wrote this on April 11th, 2009. I don't know why he includes that detail, but it's neat that we have that as a part of history. So the next page needs a little bit of explanation. Some trolls claimed that Billy Mays was the mayor of Quickville, and of course other people went along with the joke, and Chris didn't realize that it was a joke and felt the need to set the record straight. They actually made Chris make a video declaring Billy Mays was the mayor by threatening him. So now Chris is adding a page into Sonic 2 canon, saying that Billy Mays is not the mayor. Hi, Billy Mays here. Allison, the secretary, was also the vice mayor, and now is mayor in Chris's absence. Billy Mays tells people to respect Quickville and Chris. I really don't know if Chris thinks we're all going to listen to him just because he's Billy Mays. 
Chris writes, I'll see you at the next Dogwood Festival, which is a local festival where Billy Mays goes to in Virginia. But unfortunately, Chris would never see Billy Mays at the Dogwood Festival again because he died two months later. Rest in peace. Next, we get a very long cold open for episode 20. A whooshing sound awakes Wild Sonichu. Punchy and Angelica roast you from their beds. Punchy apparently likes to drink a lot, and his girlfriend thinks the sound is wired. The sounds were Sylvana, Wesley, and Nate Cirk running toward the city. Chris was told by his readers that it would be unlikely that he could get Sonichu published if he used the names of real people in his stories, so occasionally you'll see alternate names for characters, like him calling Mary Lee Walsh Slawil Ryam, which is Mary Lee Walsh backward, or changing Wes's name to Walter Grisby. We cut to Sonichu and Rose Chu's house, where Rose Chu is doing laundry, and Sonichu gets to look at her camel toe for literally no reason. Rosie approaches him admiring her, and then Sonichu gives the bad news that some of their homosexual fans have been drawing Sonichu and the others in gay relationships. He says he appreciates having homosexual fans, but that he is straight. Sonichu's eyes burn as he says he's upset at being called a homo. What really grinds my gears is that homosexuals have misunderstood parts to all of the comic series heavily wrong. Contrary to their individual perceptions, all of our comics, drawings, and words were never ever meant of anything homosexual whatsoever. We promote being straight, no question or shadow of a doubt. We all, and Christian, do not appreciate at all being wrongfully mislabeled as homos. It really infuriates me. We are all straight in and around the world of Quickville, Virginia, USA. We promote being straight. I, Sonichu, you, Rosechu, our true creator, Christopher Christian Ricardo Weston Chandler of Rutgersville, Virginia. We are all straight. Sonichu then smashes a potted plant. <sighs> then we get an author's note from Chris. I am straight. Do not label me otherwise. I would rather suffer a painful gender change surgery than ever be a homo. This is, of course, amazing, unintentional foreshadowing to things to come. Sonichu and Rose Chu prepare to have sex noting that the children are outside playing, despite us never having been told before now that they have children. But before they can do anything, they hear an explosion from outside and decide to go and save the day. The existence of their children means that months, if not years, have passed since Chris entered the Void, which I think is a fitting punishment for him, but it also means the villains have been plotting ever since his disappearance and are only now jumping into action. I'm glad we skipped Rose Chu's pregnancy, to be honest. Haha, <laughs> wouldn't it be terrible to see Chris drawing a bloated Rose Chu? Allison, the city's acting mayor, gets a call about the destruction, and presses a button to call in the police force, the Power Rangers, and a pizza. She has a PlayStation on her desk as well. A blue, pink, and green Power Ranger then all rush into action, and we cut to Punchy Sonichu fighting some jerk-offs. <laughs> After all this, we finally get the title card, Episode 20, Quick Defense. Wild Sonichu and his girlfriend stop a group of oncoming jerk-offs in the woods. At the church, Reginald slices a car in half, and slits the throat of a Transformer. Another Transformer appears and shoots an energy beam at Reginald, who hits it back at the robot, killing it too. Angelica cuts some jets apart in the air, and admires the destruction and death she caused around the church. Bubbles and Blake combine their water and electric attacks to destroy more cars, and the battle continues. I like this attempt to censor the robot cursing when Blake punts its head, and then there's this amazing panel, True artistic genius. Blake runs so fast past a Transformer's gun, and he makes the gun do a 180, and the robot shoots itself. <laughs> then, Blake and Bubbles kiss. In the heart of the city, Sonichu and Rosechu begin to fight the robots. Keep in mind, Chris spoiled this battle two issues ago by saying that Sonichu would win. Patty and Zapina join in the fight in the mayor's office, Patty is using magic to make a shield around the mall, and Darkbind takes out some Durkops. Even DJ is here for half a panel, punching some Durkops. Magichan is downing jets with his psychic powers when he's stopped by Sylvana Rosechu. Magichan tells Sylvana that he can turn her good again and return her to her birth gender, but Sylvana says that she is afraid of change. Magichan has no choice but to fight her. Mary Lee Walsh has been prevented from joining the battle because she has to fly around jets and a Megazord on her broomstick. Wes reports that they can't enter the mall because of a force field, and only Mary Lee Walsh's magic can break it. Sonichu defeats a group of jerk-ops in the main city, but the Transformers are giving him a hard time. Suddenly, and randomly, 
Chris's car, driven by an inexplicable hologram of Chris, arrives, and it turns into an Autobot Sonichu called Sunchu. Transformers actually have the ability of using a hologram to project a driver driving their cars, but Chris does not explain this in the context of the Sonichu comic. Then we get a roll call of other good Sonichu Transformers. Prowler. Bumble Wumba. I can't read this one. Armor Axe. A Transformer grabs Rose Chu and transforms back into a car, speeding away with her, much to Sonichu's terror. Meanwhile, a building is burning down, and a woman is trapped inside, trying to free her Pokémon. She tosses her Pokémon out the window and then dies. The Pokémon are released in the street, and they are two new Sonichu, Chloe Rose Chu and Blaze Bob Sonichu. Their trainer was Sarah McKenzie, the girl Chris chose as his sweetheart at the end of the last issue, also known as Panda Halo. They cry as they realize their master has succumbed to the flames. Chris dedicates the page to her, as he believes her to have died in the 2009 Australian brush fires for literally no reason. He knew she was from Australia, and then the fires happened, and she stopped talking to him, so he concluded that she died in the fires. And then he names her Sonichu Blaze Bob. Inspired by her death, the Sonichu and Rosechu decide to join the fight and fight for good. Sonichu is still chasing after Rosechu and decapitates a Transformer. Chris puts a note about a guy named Timmy in here. Timmy was a YouTuber who made a fan video about Sonichu that Chris liked, but he took issue with the dialogue. So here he's telling Timmy to redo the video with the proper dialogue. Chris has the Transformer say, Ow, my axles, a reference to his Family Guy skit, and he wonders if Seth MacFarlane stole his Ghostbusters sketch for an actual episode of Family Guy. This is Chris's sketch, where Peter needs to find a toilet and finds a ghost machine. And this is Family Guy, where Mort needs to find a toilet and finds a time machine. Oh, I hope there's another bathroom in here. Oh, God. Oh, thank God, a porta potty. It's probably just a coincidence. Magichan tells Sonichu he'll be aided once he arrives with a slam dunk and a slice, obviously referring to Bionic and... I'm not sure who the slice is. Then a new Sonichu shows up. I be a Chandler. He's here to stop Sonichu. He is clearly based on the appearance of Liquid Chris, who usually wore a brown striped shirt. Liquid Chris was this kid who was very good at Christian impressions, and Chris called him an imposter. People began to pretend that he was the real Chris, dubbing him Liquid Chris and Chris Solid Chris after Metal Gear Solid. And Chris was really pissed about the whole situation. Y'all already know me of the cre as the creator of the Sanchu franchise and comics, and uh, the uh, the Rosechu comic uh, as well. This Sanchu is supposed to represent Liquid Chris. Sanchu defeats him with an iron tail, and he transforms back into a human. Sanchu notes that Liquid Chris's medallion was paper thin. A comment on how Liquid Chris's fake Sonichu medallion was made of paper, compared to Chris's which is made of Crayola model magic. Sonichu finally catches up to Rosechu and finds Giovanni, Nate Cirque, and Robotnik in the park. He asks where Rosechu is, even though she's right in front of him. Giovanni makes a demand for Sonichu to make Nate Cirque the mayor of Quickville. What's more important, your city or your sweetheart? But before Sonichu can respond, Bionic hits Giovanni with a basketball from off-screen. The Transformer's arm is sliced off with a blow from Darkbind, and Rosie begins to fall. Sonichu catches her and tries to wake her up. She wakes up, confused, and Bionic and Darkbind come over to help. Nate Cirque gets up and throws a Pokeball at Bionic. It hits him in the head the same way Bionic had hit Nate Cirque earlier in the school with a basketball. The Pokeball releases a Nidoking, and a fight begins. Nidoking forces the Hedgehog backwards, and Sonichu steps in and kicks mud in the Pokemon's face. This hurts it, and Nate Cirque curses. Bionic then kicks Nidoking in the balls, and he faints, and Nate Cirque recalls him to his Pokeball. Nate Cirque then does his own energy attack, and launches it at the Hedgehogs. This is a version of the Kursehameha, but instead of bad luck, it curses someone with embarrassment. Bionic catches the attack, and does tricks with it like it's a basketball, then tosses it back at Nate Cirque. He immediately soils himself, and then teleports himself away in embarrassment. We cut back to Magichan and Silvano's duel, where Magichan has already won. He calls Sonichu back to the mall. At the park, Megagi is cheering on Bionic, using a cheer from Chris's actual high school basketball team, the Lancers. On their way, 
Magichan explains what they've missed. Ivy was in an elevator of the mall, and the tremors in the ground from the battle raging outside caused the floor to collapse, and she got her neck tangled in the cable. Billy Mays tried to save her, but she died anyway. In real life, Chris was led to believe that the real Ivy had died too. He dedicates this page to her, Ivy O'Neill, which he spells wrong. Sonichu and Rose Chu arrive at the mall at the same time as Mary Lee Walsh, who does her spell to take down the mall's protective shield. Sonichu then takes off and snatches Walsh's broom from underneath her, and he does a what's up doc joke. Walsh then pulls a wild e coyote, and realizes that Sonichu's taken her broom. She looks down and then falls. Count Grajoan slows her fall and makes a floor for her to stand on in midair. Then we get a nice view of Rosie's backside as she watches the action from the ground. As you wish, mouse. I am a hedgehog, not a sand shrew. Yes, because when I think of Pokemon and mouse, I think of sand shrew, not, not that other one. Walsh sends some attacks at Sonichu, who dodges them all, and he hits her, and she almost falls off the floating floor. Grajuan thinks to himself that Walsh has done nothing to try to resurrect him, and isn't very powerful, so he decides to let her fall to her death, but Sonichu reaches down and saves her. Walsh then teleports away, and Grajuan thinks that she'll die soon enough. Rosie asks Sonichu why he saved Walsh, and he says that as a hero, he had to. Also, Christian gets to kill her, which does not sound very heroic to me. Then we finally get to see Rose Chu and Sonic Chu's children, and they are overwhelmingly creepy. Epilogue Wild and Magichan spot the time portal opening up and save Chris. There's a 15 minute time skip for some reason, where the story skips over a scene that we'll see in the next issue. Then Chris tells them to meet him in Tennessee, which the reader should remember is the home of Four Cent Garbage. The issue ends on page 100, as Chris Chan, in his Sonichu form, promises the audience that soon he will separate his real-life stories from the stories of Sonichu. This is a lie, but before that, I'm just warning you, it's going to get very graphic. Chris also gives names to Sonichu's children, Sarah, Christine, and Robbie, because we really needed another Sarah, although this one is spelled differently. Christine is also obviously the female version of Chris, which will get confusing when Chris becomes transgender and goes by the name Christine. And Robbie is a version of Chris's father's name, Robert. Chris is clearly not very creative when it comes to making names, despite coming up with all of this nonsense. Hey Ivy, I'm doing this video for you. Oh, we are going to have so much fun together when you and I are together. Hmm. You know, my mommy and I, my my family and I will come and meet you at the airport. And you know, your choice will take you to your hotel or uh, bring you back to my house. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, we'd be hanging around so much and sharing so many fondful memories. Mm. And you know, we can enjoy a movie in the theater or at home or watch a television rerun. <laughs> Family guy! <laughs> Family guy. And you know, I look, you know, I look forward to the eventuality of uh, you and me having our sex time together. <laughs> I'll do you so many. I'll, I'll do my best to pleasure you and keep you satisfied. This is Ivy, just for you. Just for you. <laughs> Being the good boy, just for you, Ivy. I love you so much. I love you so much. <laughs> it's a jolly holiday with Ivy. Ivy makes my heart so light. When the skies are gray and ordinary, Ivy makes the sun shine bright. All happiness is blooming all around her. The daffodils are smiling at the dove. When Ivy holds my hand, I feel so grand. My heart starts beating like a big brass band. <laughs> I love you so much, Ivy. I love you. I love you. Mm. Love you later, sweetheart. September 2008. Sonichu issue number 10 had its cover drawn by Panda Halo, who, remember, is dead now. 
let's jump right into what is probably tied for the most controversial issue of Sonichu. The first page is a recap of Magichan saving Chris in the Time Void. Chris explains that he was sent forward in time and lost his virginity to his future wife in the year 2015. Her name is Lovely Weather. She confused modern Chris for the 2015 Chris, and they had sex. Here is 2008 Chris compared to 2015 Chris. They are totally the same person. Magichan says that it's been nine months in the real world, and Chris said it's been about one month for him. In the future, Chris also took part in a medical study trying to isolate the gene that makes people homosexual. They needed a volunteer with untainted straight blood to be able to make the vaccine. Chris was then given the vaccine so he could never become gay, and was given two syringes to take back in time. He wants to use one of them to turn Nate Turk straight. He wants Magichan to travel forward in time to get enough of the finished vaccine, and then he wants him to put it in the water supply to stop anybody in the entire world from becoming gay. Then he wants Magichan to telepathically contact all the heroes and give them specific instructions. Chris then tells Billy Mays to get Sunchu, which is Chris's Sonichu Transformer car, his PS3 and Guitar Hero set, so they can play a song at the 4 Cent Garbage headquarters. Sonichu is going to pick up the Sonichu balls from the office and bring them to 4 Cent Garbage, and Blake and Punchy have to meet them there too. Episode 21, Director Amenities. On the next page, we pick up where we left off last time, seeing Chris Chan running. He fights some trolls, depicted as troll dolls, to protect his favorite things from being defiled. They were hosted on a tripod website. Chris then says that all things should be kept rated E or T for families. Chris then blows up the tripod building, saying it's dumb for not supporting Flash. Chris then goes to Barnes & Noble to meet the 2008 Lovely Weather, and sets up a date with her. We then see Jason, the head of 4 Cent Garbage, laughing to himself that Chris is running right into his trap. At the bottom of the page, Sackboy from Little Big Planet tells you to never pirate a video game, and to buy a PS3 so you can play Chris's Sonichu level on Little Big Planet. Don't buy or download illegal copies of Little Big Planet on Wii or Xbox 360. That is not even possible, Chris. Chris then stops to think about his PS3, and a cage falls on his head. He can't get out of it, and is reverted back to his human form. The devil from the tower's lobby comes and takes Chris's Sonichu medallion, but Chris reveals that his power resides in his class ring, and he teleports his medallion off to be with Blanca Weiss, who is another real fake girlfriend that Chris mailed his medallion to in real life. The troll that was posing as Blanca in real life then filmed himself destroying the medallion, so Chris had to retcon that he actually got his powers from his senior year high school class ring. He also refused to believe that Blanca was a troll, and instead believes that the package was intercepted by the trolls. Chris transforms and hyperbeams and destroys the cage. So let's pause again and discuss more events in Chris's real life. Chris was convinced by the trolls that a man was selling unofficial Sonichu merchandise, and making a lot of money off of it. His name was Jimmy Hill, and this hyperbeam flew and hit him in the face. Chris then has Bugs Bunny call him a thieving imposter, and Sonichu curses him out. So Chris is resting for five minutes, and Nate Circuit comes and hits him in the back of the head. They fight, and the production quality is significantly better than normal. Chris must really have blown the budget out for the final Chris Chan Nate Circuit battle. They knock each other out of their transformed forms, and then Nate Circuit gets up to deliver the final blow again. Nate Circuit asks for Chris's last words, and Chris says, only three words, drink my blood, and he injects him with the gay vaccine. The narrator tells us that Nate Cirque turned straight again, and was actually Kel's sweetheart. Kel is Rose Chu's Pokemon trainer from, like, issue number zero. So now they're a couple or something. The Hedgehog boys arrive, and Sonichu puts on a Parappa the Rapper hat, and becomes two-dimensional. Chris picks up his guitar and becomes real, which is horrifying. He tells us that he's wearing a different shirt than the one that he depicts himself wearing in the comic, because it was dirty that day. So then Sunju turns into a huge stage, and they can start playing music from the Chris Chan and the Hedgehog Boys album. This picture of Chris is its own work of art, and needs no description. 
We then get the lyrics to Chris's song, They Need to Revive Zordon, which is about how the original Power Rangers was the best. The song is played to the tune of Cat Scratch Fever. Smash this tune while lost in space Then he was gonna save the human race Yet more evil forces showed up And they lost their good fans when they killed Zordon They need to revive Zordon They need to revive Zordon Presidents tried to enforce But that plot was too trite Zordon was better than the police He had great powers and then some Might and magic world and five swords Two trolls run up to Jason and say they need to evacuate because Chris's music is making the building collapse. Jason says, Like Chris, and unlike you two gay wads, I am straight. Then, I, I, I don't know what happens here, this drawing makes no sense. Jason retires from his hobby of trolling Chris forever and survives. On the next page, the trolls ask Satan why he's still alive if Chris killed him, and he steals a joke from South Park. Where was I gonna go, Detroit? The two trolls are Thaddeus and Clyde Cash, two real trolls who tormented Chris. You might remember Clyde Cash as the brother of the fictional boy Ryan who committed suicide. Satan tells them that when they die, they'll be forever tormented for being homos and slandering Chris. The two trolls decide they would rather commit suicide than be killed by Chris, so they lament making homos look even worse in Chris's eyes, then they hold hands and they jump down the 72-story elevator shaft. Jesus Christ, this wall of text! Okay, so a bunch of trolls died when the building collapsed, and so they put up a memorial, but the memorial wasn't for the people who died in the building falling down, it was for the victims of the trolls who died. And also, all of 4chan and Encyclopedia Dramatica was wiped out from existence forever. Chris then complains that TMZ is still around, and then cuts to a camera filming Rose Chew on the toilet. Then one filming Sonic and her having sex in BDSM gear, and then one filming their son in a sandbox. Then, Magichan appears to tell Chris that his mission was successful. They put the cure to homosexuality in the water, and by February 24th, Christian's birthday, all homosexuals will be cured. And from that day on, it will be known as Christian Love Day, a second Valentine's Day to celebrate straight love. Magichan also says that this will cure Silvana Rosechu of being a hermaphrodite. Christian then meets Meg from Family Guy, even though he had met his future wife like an hour ago, and they make out, and Chris says he would have sex with her if Seth MacFarlane, who is Family Guy's creator, would let her turn 18. But it turns out that Megan was Silvana. Dun dun dun. Chris then addresses the audience, and apologizes if he offended anybody, with all the anti-gay messages in the last few pages. But, he hopes that now everyone will accept that he, and everyone in Quickville is straight, because their whole world must be straight due to the vaccine. Then, finally, with the Sonichu balls, Chris becomes Colossal Chris Chan. Sonichu turns red and becomes Ultra Sonichu. With their new powers, Chris is finally able to save Crystal. 
Ultra Sonichu flies to find Darkbind and saves Princess Zelina from her slumber. Their homeland is called Roll Quick, which is obviously Hyrule plus Quick. Chris and Sonichu then go to Minnesota to the house of Alec Benson Leary. In Chris's real life, there's a parody comic of Sonichu called Asperchu. It's about a Sonichu who has Asperger's. Chris really hates Asperger's because he thinks it takes away from people's attention on autism, so this greatly offended him, and he wanted people to know that Sonichu did in fact not have Asperger's. Back in the comic, Chris is disgusted to find that Alec Benson Leary has an Xbox and a Microsoft computer. Chris then opens his third eye. He magically gets inside the computer and deletes everything. While Chris is doing this, Sonichu finds the Asperchu characters, and it's actually really cool how Chris draws these characters more poorly than usual to explain that they're parody characters. Sonichu then cures them of their Asperger's and their homosexuality. Chris then makes all the versions of his characters from Asperchu canon in Sonichu, but reveals that they all wanted different names for the ones that they were given, and so he makes them their own characters. Chris arrives and asks who all the new people are, and Sonichu says that they think of him as God and Jesus. Chris calling himself God Counter, three. Then a big robot comes in, and Chris uses Protect, and they fight, and Chris says, Hasta la vista, Roboto, and it explodes. Then Alec, the writer of Aspergeu, appears, and all of his own characters beat him up. Chris says now he has to finally deal with Mary Lee Walsh. On this page, Chris, it's been, it's been, it's been 10 issues, or 11, depending on how you count. Please stop writing blocks of text. Chris says that even though he made the Aspergeu characters canon, their comic book issues are not canon. Crystal, who's free of the Dark Void now, says that she will have President Obama remove the Aspertu website. Sonichu brings all the Aspertu people to a soup hotel to get back on their feet, and then is accosted by a smoking Jamaican man on the streets of Quickville. My name's Inos. What you up to? I am eclectic on the hedge high on the hog. You want some of this DJ mon? So that's, that's, that's supposed to be a bunch of puns, like saying chew, like Sonichu, and I guess eclectic is a little like electric, and then hedge, the hog, and then dig, mon, digimon, it's, it's a joke. Uh. Sonichu tells him that smoking is illegal and gives you cancer, and says no, he doesn't want any dig. Is that how you pronounce that? He informs Magichan that Magichan missed this drug user, and then Magichan calls the police. The police then show up and they're going to send the drugs into space on a NASA rocket and puts Inos in a hospital. Sonichu then flies around the city and turns all the brainwashed jerk ops into normal people again. Chris then goes to find Mary Lee Walsh herself. She says she turned to witchcraft because no one could love her, so she tried to stop Chris from ever finding a sweetheart of his own. Walsh then wants to fight him with only her own power, so she gives Count Graduan to Chris and he smashes his orb on the floor. The battle begins. Chris gets two swords from nowhere, and they clash. Whack! Wham! Bam! Kablam! Whoosh! Wacha! Zoom! <laughs> After a battle, Chris paralyzes her with electricity, and she concedes. The comic then cuts to later at the shopping mall. Everyone has gathered to listen to a message from Chris. He states that Walsh has lost her power and is in jail forever. He is also making it legal for gays to be together, but gay marriage is still illegal, even though the vaccine should have cured them, but whatever. Chris also says that he will still be mayor, but will be bowing out of Sonichu's adventures. We cut to Wild in the crowd, looking at his newly laid egg, or I guess his girlfriend's newly laid egg. His girlfriend, Simonla, is going to the bathroom, but when she sits down, we see a Voltorb next to the toilet. Chris is saying that her character was originally based on fan art from a fan who doesn't want Chris to use her anymore. The Voltorb in the bathroom then explodes and Simonla dies. Dr. Bill from earlier in the comic, the guy who spilled soda on Blake's DNA, tells Wild the bad news that his girlfriend is dead, and Wild is upset. Magichan says he knows who murdered her, but they're already in jail. The murderers are the original creator of Simon Chu, and Simon Chu himself. The trial is set for next week. Wild's egg hatches, and he names his daughter Sandy. 
Over the next week until the trial, Wilde puts the thoughts of revenge into Sandy's mind, and at the end of the week, she evolves fully into a rose chew. Throughout all of this, Chris is cutting in with apologies, like apologizing for stealing Simonla as a character, apologizing for breaking into the creator Vasperchu's house and implying that he had women tied up in his basement. He's apologizing for these things, all in the issue where these things happened. Then we get the trial of Evan, Alec, and Mao. These are three real-world trolls who Chris is now pinning the responsibility for Simonla's death on in the comic. The trial starts, hosted by Louis Black, and one lawyer is half-human, half-Blaziken for some reason. Blaziken says that a good person would understand why it takes so long to produce art like comic books, and that the trolls are evil because they portrayed Chris as dead in their own comic book. This is once again referring to Aspergue. The trolls talk about how high they got last night, and the judge charges them with the murder of Sandy's mother and copyright infringement. Each troll is then killed in a horrific way. Alec was given the 10-button electric chair, meaning that 10 different people got to shock him to death, including Chris, who is upset that he was set on fire in Aspergue, Sonichu, who is complaining that he was portrayed as gay in Aspergue, Wild, who is mad that his wife died, Sandy, who is mad that her mother died, Bubbles, who Alec called, quote, retarded, and Bionic, who is mad that it's implied that he is, well, Bionic, in Aspergue. Alec then gets horribly fried. Evan is tied to a wall, and Wild and Sandy get to kill him together. Sandy rips at him with her claws, tearing his arms and penis off, and then she and Wild kill him with their magic powers. The third troll was hung from the ceiling by his wrists and shot full of holes as target practice. This is the first time that we've seen Kel in the flesh in a long time. Then, Chris kills Mao himself, using psychic powers to make him explode at every joint. Chris then copies the speech from Independence Day to talk about how the world is safe now. Mankind. That word should have a different meaning for all of us today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interests. Perhaps it is fate that today is Mexico's Flag Day, and we will once again be saluting an image of freedom. Not just from trolling, loneliness, or persecution, but also from heartbreak. We are fighting for our right to love, to be honest. And when the sun sets today, the 24th of February will no longer be known as only a Mexican holiday, but as the day Sonichu fans and I declare in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight, we are going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Christian Love Day. And that was the end of Sonichu issue number 10. Chris has gone completely mad at this point, and part of me doesn't blame him. Sonichu issue 11 begins with a special episode, a Sonichu Christmas, beginning December 2008. In the Sonichu household, one of the Sonichu children named Christine steals a joke from Family Guy. I am the Virgin Mary, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Sarah and Rose Chew are making cookies because Sarah's school friends are coming over. Sarah made a special cookie for her Jewish friend that's Hanukkah-themed and vanilla-flavored in case he has an allergy. The life of the Sonichus is incredibly mundane as they talk about the weather. Look at our children, Sweet Bolt. Look at how much jow even a little snow can bring. Then, Christine quotes the Bible. She has a little dance thing going on with sparkles and a dress as she sings Mary's song. Sonichu dips out and doesn't listen to the song. Same. The town gets two feet of snow and all the schools are cancelled. They talk about watching the Charlie Brown Christmas special and drinking hot chocolate. In order to get outside, Sonichu has to jump up the chimney, then he spin dashes all the snow away. This is page 12 and so far nothing has happened. There is no conflict or story progression, just a slice of life story from the Sonichu family. It's probably for this reason that Chris abandoned the comic for six years. It was not until September 2015 that Chris drew the next page. The Sonichu children find things to do as they have off of school for several days. Sarah goes over to Kevin's house, Kevin is the Jewish kid who was mentioned earlier, and they play Call of Duty World at War. 
They get 10 million points, and Sarah shoots down a plane, and the plane lands on Kevin. And neither of those things is possible in World at War. Kevin gets mad that his character, who he's been leveling up for a month, is dead, which is also something that you can't do in Call of Duty. And then to make it up to him, Sarah shows him her candle cookie. Kevin freaks out at the sight of the flame on the candle. Kevin throws the cookie and breaks it. Then we see Sarah crying, alone, thinking that she should leave. Later, she's in her room crying, and Imagichan contacts her psychically, telling her that she should use this as a learning experience. She says she shouldn't have shown an image of a burning candle to someone who is just traumatized by an explosion. That, that's, a, that's a good moral. That's a, we, I, I can apply that in my daily life, thanks first. Then we get this scene of utter, pure nonsense. Sonichu and Robbie spot a woman crying on a bench, and she tells them that she was fired from her job, could not afford rent, and is now homeless. Sonichu tells her about the soup hotels in Quickville, which are a thing that Chris made up, and offers to bring her to one. She says, Really? Oh, thank you. My family went on vacation. My phone died. I left my charger at the office I was fired from. Hardly a payphone anywhere. Crazy. My ex-boyfriend went crazy and joined a forest living group. Threw his phone away. I'm losing focus from stress in life. My clock fell into a night schedule. Sonichu then says he too was homeless when he became a Sonichu, and his Pikachu family threw him out. The homeless woman jokes that she majored in finances, but is failing in that regard right at this moment. We then cut to Blake and Bubbles, as a Jamaican man wishes Blake a happy Kwanzaa. Blake is really upset about this, because he is an African American, he's black. How many times must I be mistook for African American? I'm black only by genetic accident. <laughs> He also describes black skin as sunburn color, which is just... No? Did he mean tan? Even then it's wrong. Blake tells Bubbles that he hates this time of year, because so many people wish him a happy Kwanzaa. This scene was actually inspired by a real conversation Chris had with a guy named William that we'll get to meet later. He asked if Blake could celebrate Kwanzaa during the Christmas issue, and Chris took offense to that, so he had it in this scene. Then we get a flashback to Simone LaRosechu in the hospital, after the Voltorb assassination. The doctor proclaims that her bones are made of a substance stronger than adamantium, something called simantium. This allows her to heal, which is not how adamantium works. So then, by mid-December, she is let out of the hospital. All of that melodrama about her death and getting revenge now means nothing. So here's the thing. In the years since the last issue of Sonichu, Chris went back and retconned some of his more controversial moments. He cut out the sex scenes, he took out all the anti-gay dialogue and plot points, and he changed the scenes of torturing the trolls into them being forced to live in the Amish country. I guess in that time he decided that he didn't care that Simone Le was violating the original Simon's drawing, and brought her back to life. Wild and his family then go home, and Chris notes that Rose Juice and Sonic Juice all drive hybrid cars, probably because he thinks it's a good, funny joke that they're electric cars and they're electric hedgehogs. In the mountains, Magichan and Silvana are discussing their relationship. With Count Graduan dead, she has become good, but Magichan warns that Graduan will return. The two then begin to make out and mate up. At Christine's play about Mary, things start to go wrong. Christine, in front of the crowd, begins to evolve. She runs into the bathroom and grows into a Rose Jew, ripping out of her clothes. Rose True tries to calm her down, and so her and Christine then sing Britney Spears's I'm Not a Girl, Not Yet a Woman. Sonichu runs home and gets her a new dress and tells his kids his speed mented the snow. Then we get introduced to Miss Christine Rose Chu. Christine then comes out and rejoins Kevin on stage. Keep in mind that Kevin is Jewish, and this is a nativity play where he's playing Joseph. Christine is also now twice his height. After the play, Sarah gives Kevin dreidel cookies. Kevin then, uh, breaks up with Sarah? He says he's not only scarred from death and flames, but also of disloyalty from his friends, and that she deserved a court-martial. I wish you luck in growing up and maturing more, says the person who freaked out because of a video game. It also never mentioned at any point that the two were dating. Finally, after many years, Christmas arrives, and everyone gathers at the Quickville Mall. The kids open presents, and the adults make out. Punchy says his girlfriend left him because of the Bananasaurus, and Angelica and Reginald broke up because he used claws to thrash her bed. There is no context to either of those things, but they will be revisited later. 
Simona asks where Chris is, and Roshu says he's been suffering from future shock after his experience in the Time Void. He left the Time Void in August, and it is now December 2008. Rosechu explains that in 2014, Chris realized he had always been a woman. He legally changed his name to Christine, which, yes, that did happen in real life, and is still attracted to women, making her a lesbian. Chris was in the Time Void until 2015, but then came out back in 2008. He talked with Magichan, Rosechu, and Sanichu, and decided to transition early in 2008 rather than waiting for 2014. This goes against Chris saying that changing the past with time travel is impossible earlier in the time travel issue of the comic. It also goes against him saying that he has a wife named Lovely Weather, or at the very least, it makes it less believable that Lovely Weather would believe that 2008 Chris and 2015 Chris are the same person. This also means that the gay vaccine didn't work. Funnily enough, if Chris's blood was distributed to the masses and he is now gay, that would imply that more gay characters will start popping up in Sanichu, which does in fact happen. Sanichu then apologizes for a lifetime of homophobia by saying he didn't hate all gays, he just hated being called gay. He has a lesbian neighbor that he lets babysit his kids, and now that Chris is a woman, he considers himself an ally. Because fictional Chris is fictional, I have no problem calling her Christine or by female pronouns. To keep things from getting confusing, and because Chris the author isn't really trans, I will continue to call the author Chris Chris and use male pronouns for him, and use female pronouns for Christine, the fictional character. On this page, Magichan says that Chris came out to the public in August, during that same speech where Simone Lo was hospitalized. This goes against what Rose Chu just said a page earlier that Chris confided in her and Sanichu. Rose Chu explains that Christine has retired from her job as mayor, and Allison has taken over. They all decide to go visit Christine and make her Christmas a joyous one. Wild makes a comment that the months without Chris have felt like years, which is actually a funny fourth wall joke. Good job, Chris, that's, that's one very okay joke in 11 issues of a comic book. This is terrifying. Blake then looks at Christine and says, nice rack, and we get this great group photo. Chris photoshops in his parents, who haven't been in the comic yet, and then this episode ends. I'm done adulting, let's be Sonichu and Rose Chu. We get this great SLGBTQ poster, which is one of my favorite Christianisms. Uh, SLGBTQ stands for Straight, Lesbian, Gay, Bi, Trans, Queer. And Chris added the straight because he thinks that straight people shouldn't be left out of the LGBT community. <laughs> so that's the Christmas episode, but this issue contains two more episodes. Episode 23, Simon Chu and Banana Funkle. Simon Chu is a new Sonic Chu we're introduced to in this chapter. You'll recall that Chris plagiarized Simona from a fan drawing. Chris has now totally co-opted Simon Chu and made him his own character. The beginning of this story takes place in late August, so right after the big battle in issue number 10. Simon is the brother of Simone LaRose Chu, and he's responsible for planting the Voltorb that almost killed her. Simona texts him, and says she made a full recovery and apparently has forgiven him. In a flashback to the hearing of the murderers, it's stated that Simon Chu, as the murderer's Pokemon, is going to be released, so their brainwashing won't control him anymore. I guess Pokemon don't have any agency in the Sonichu world if they have a master. So now it's almost present day, December 18th, 2008, a week before the last Christmas episode ended. Simon enters Simona's home, and Sandy, who is Wild and Simona's daughter, freaks out at the man who tried to kill her mom. Wild then walks in and wants to fight Simon too. Simona makes them all calm down, and they have dinner. Simon then describes his backstory. Evan, who is the author of Aspertu, caught him as a Sonny, along with the other Aspertus, and forced him to evolve. They tortured him, and made him sleep, showing him videos of the seriously mentally deranged. When the 4 cent garbage building fell, Evan and the other trolls wanted vengeance, and wanted to kill Chris and all the Sonichus, starting with Simonla. Simon was forced to carry out the deed, and then sentenced to jail with the other trolls. While there, his conditioning started to break because he was kept separate from the human trolls. So now he's a good guy, and he gives Wild a razor claw he dug up. Wild gives the claw to Angelica, who gives it to Reginald, because it would allow him to evolve as a Pokemon. That night, Reginald evolves, seemingly by accident, and goes on a rampage. Look at this piece of art, though. That's like, that, that's like really good, especially keeping in mind the perspective of the shot. I'm actually kind of impressed. Anyway, we get this on the next page, which doesn't even bear a passing resemblance to a weevil. Reginald says he must leave Angelica, as his personality has changed too much and he is a threat to her. 
Then Christine pops in as the narrator, and says that she forgot to name the episode, and calls it Simon Shu and Banana Funkle, which is a really, really bad name. He had two stories to tell, one about Simon Shu, and the other about a creature called a Bananasaurus, and so he goes with this title. The Bananasaurus was actually a story that someone paid Chris to write, so he was forced to include it in the story. So at the Quickville Museum, where they fly the LGBTQ pride flag, uh, Simon and Sandy head inside to revitalize the fossil that Simon found while digging. Sandy, despite being four months old, is in fourth grade. The scientist at the museum is a blue rose shoe we've never seen before, and apparently the fossil is of a new Pokemon, the Bananasaur. He looks like a green Digimon, but really he's a grass dragon Pokemon. Despite Pokemon being able to understand each other, Sandy says that she cannot understand the Bananasaur. Then Punchy wanders in, and for some reason, he can understand the Bananasaur. Chris obviously doesn't know how long it takes something to become a fossil, because the Bananasaur starts talking about what it was doing right before it died. That being, listening to ACDC and being hit by a car. Anyway, they give Bananasaur to Punchy, and tell him to take him to the daycare to breed him because he's the last of his kind. Then, for seemingly no reason, he evolves into Bananasauros. And no, that is not a mistake on Chris's part, because William actually released an ad for Bananasaurus where he also spells it that way. It's just I have a hard time saying it, so sometimes I'm going to slip up and call it Saurus in the rest of this video. So this is a Bananasaurus, and it is a monstrosity. He evolved because Punchy was nice to him, so now he's the same size as the other characters. Then we get an insight into the Bananasaurus' mind, and we see that he used to be a human, and a normal high school student named David Rotgard. I swear, this is reaching Kingdom Hearts levels of why is this so complicated. I'm so glad that Sonichu lore goes so deep as to know the name of the girl that Bananasaurus cheated on in high school, and his GPA. So, Layla isn't too happy that Punchy has a Bananasaurus in their home. Everyone besides Punchy hears him as garbled nonsense, and here he says, Wham Bam Nippon. Based on his gamer leet lifestyle, I'm guessing this is him expressing his desire for a Japanese waifu. But the two start playing video games together anyway. The next day, Punchy takes Bananasaurus to the daycare center to breed and leaves him alone with a ditto. The two get it on, and Bananasaurus proclaims that the ditto was ferocious, and he wants to be snipped, so he never has to go through that again. Seeing as other Pokémon like Sonichus are viewed as people in this world and not animals, this whole thing is highly disturbing. So Punchy and Bananasaurus start training together in the dojo, both in martial arts and skateboarding. They hurt each other so bad that the dojo owner has to call 911. They return home and find out that Layla is leaving Punchy. She's going to move back in with her trainer. She tells Punchy she never wants to see him again, and then punches Bananasaurus in the face and says, You are bruised, moldy, and downright not fruitful, which is almost a pun. If Chris had established throughout the comic that Bananasaurus was costing them money and not spending his own very well, and had taken out the word moldy, then this would have been a good pun. So that's, that's, that's a nice one-third of a joke. So then Chris pops up to talk to the reader and tells them that he's running out of time to make the issue, so he's just going to summarize it. Come on, Chris, that's my job. So Layla goes home to her trainer, whose name is William, because we really needed more characters with the same name as other characters. And then she runs into Reginald, who left Angelica Rose to earlier in this issue. The two start dating. Despite the person who paid Chris money to add Bananasaurus to the comic wanting him to be Punchy's roommate, Chris says that this is a bad idea. The person who paid Chris $100 to include Bananasaurus is named William, which is probably where Chris got the name for Layla's trainer from, because he's uncreative when it comes to names. Bananasaurus goes by David now, and we get this funny insight into how Sonichu is written, because Chris includes this panel of handwritten text, then crosses it out and types it down here. David gets hired at the dojo, and Punchy is really depressed, and the issue ends with Magichan telling the reader that the reason evil has been at bay is because he's so powerful. But, the trouble will begin brewing at the 2009 Pride Festival. This entire episode happened before the Sonichu Christmas episode, so it should really be placed before it in the issue, but of course Chris has to just make things more confusing than they need to be. Then we get an ad for a Bananasaurus browser game paid for by William. Then it starts to get weird, which is an unexpected sentence for me to say this deep into the 11th issue of Sonichu. We get the cold open of the behind-the-scenes prologue. This is the prologue for part one of a clip show, as Chris calls it, that we're about to get. Currently in Sonichu, we're in December 2008. 
but in real life, Chris is writing this in 2017. So he wants his characters to catch up to the modern day. To accomplish this, he's doing a montage of small events, starting with this strange setup where Sylvana transforms into Sonic to go on a talk show with Sonichu. Sonichu and Sonic, kind of, in Episode 24, Part 1, The Clip Show, Catching Up. So this part has flashbacks to Sonichu and Sonic talking, and I guess Sylvana is playing the part of Sonic in a recreation of the events. Sonichu tells Sonic he's married and that Black Sonichu is good now. He says that when their daughter Christine Rosechu evolved, she skipped from 4th to 9th grade. But Sandy, who is also fully evolved, just entered 4th grade, so this is very confusing. Sonic alludes to Sonic 06 and says that Sega needs to take more time with Sonic games now. Flashback to February 2009. The Sonichu kids are at school and it's 65 degrees. Robbie, the only son of Sonichu and Rosechu, is getting bullied by... Uh, a, a bully. Chris draws him kind of like Binky from Arthur meets Harold from Hey Arnold. He, and I quote, has no parents, lives with drunk uncle, hates on those he's jealous of, and does not really know how to speak love yet. He calls Sarah Triceratops, and this is probably supposed to be either a, a pun or an insult, I don't know. The two children fight back, so the bully calls over a jerk cop, but the cop does nothing. In order to get the jerk cop's attention, and I'm serious about this, the bully calls over another boy and kisses him without consent to surprise the cop. The cop, who is a jerk cop and of course hates love, springs into action and fights against the bully. Robbie and Sarah then must stop him. Sarah, the pink rose tree child, yells, Love not hatred, and beats up the jerk cop, showing how much she hates him and how terrible of a writer Chris is. From this, she's able to then evolve into a fully grown rose tree. She's naked, but thankfully we have this speech bubble to cover her up. Then Sonichu tells Sonic that Robert, the male Sonichu child, is transgender, and two months after this event, he underwent surgery and evolved into an adult female Rose Chu. I really don't understand why this flashback is a clip show, because that's that's not what a clip show is. Robbie Sonichu claims to have a female soul, which is also what Chris is doing in real life, and in the comic, Magichan uses magic to help him transform. Sonic thinks this is about as crazy as Shadow using guns in the video game Shadow the Hedgehog. Then they discuss how Sonichu was inspired by Chris's transition, and how he learned to be respectful of the LGBTQ community. Because if there's anyone who should teach you to respect the LGBT community, it's the guy who, a couple issues ago, wrote about a cure for gayness. Christine then actually arrives in the comic. She transforms into her new Sonichu form, and they make a big deal about this being Christine's new female redesign. Because of this, Chris also has to make male Rose Chews and female Sonic Chews, which kind of defeats the purpose of them having gender dimorphism in the first place. Then there's a flashback to Chris defeating Mary Lee Walsh, and he has a vision of him having a female soul, which is how Chris came to think that he was a woman in real life. He says he doesn't like brutish things that men do. Despite being a superhero who blows up stuff and punches people, he's not a brute guy, it's just, just, just trust him, believe him. This also goes to show that, like, for the tenth time in this comic, Chris's understanding of gender is very basic and built on stereotypes from cartoons. If you express feelings, you're a woman. If you're a rough brute, you're a man. Then he magically grows breasts and just literally becomes a woman. Then the seven Sonichu balls form into one stone, a mega stone, Chris Chen Sonite. Then more stones rain down all over the world, and Sonichu and Rosechu get Sonite too. Sonic at Sonicite? Son Sonny? Sonicite? I don't know. They transform into their more powerful modes. Rosechu gets her beast mode from when she attacked the troll, and Sonichu becomes orange like his ultimate form. The comic notes that the readers would only have seen Beast Rosechu in the expanded rated R version of the comic. After the transformation ends, Rosechu is naked. She's the only Rosechu who wears clothes, so this is still silly. Also, squirt gun toy? Why, why, did, why did Chris label the squirt gun? In real life, Chris put the stone behind his medallion, and in the comic, the Sonichus put them in their socks for some reason. Christine explains that with Magichan's help, they took bits from male Chris, meaning his semen, and mixed them with female Christine, and then he gave birth. Yet yeah, he impregnated himself. Christine had two Sonichu children, Russell and Cynthia. They stay in the Sonichu world while Chris is in the real world, meaning that this is the real Chris, I guess, kind of. The problem with the distinction between the two right now is that Chris doesn't believe in the dimensional merge fully yet, and that makes it more confusing, but we'll get back to that. Then Chris has to leave to go pick up dinner at Walmart for his father, and the issue ends. Still not a clip show. So that was Sonichu issue 11, and I'm fairly certain Chris has totally lost his mind. 
it cannot get any more deranged than this. Right? Right. This issue took, in total, eight years to make start to finish. August 2017. This special 12th issue of Sonic Shoe heavily features Robbie Sonny, Sonic Shoe's son. Although on the cover, Robbie is dressed like a girl. In this issue, Robbie will transition to female, just like Chris, which makes the use of his dead name on the front cover questionable. Roberta, as he will come to be called, and a new character are having a romantic picnic together, showing that Robbie, like Chris, has become a trans lesbian. Sonichu is looking down with anger upon the couple, indicating that, much like Chris's own father, he's not too happy with his son transitioning. Remember when Chris said after issue 10 the comics wouldn't be about his own life anymore? Yeah, that was a lie. The name of this comic is To Be or Not a Tom Girl. To Be or Not to Be a Tom Girl would be an interesting title, keeping in mind that a Tom Girl is what Chris referred to himself as before he accepted his own transition. Chris forgot the second half of the To Be or Not to Be quote, and he also wrote Not instead of Not. So now the title reads To Be Zero a Feminine Male. We also have Christine popping up to say that a girl he was dating turned out to be a troll, and this pink rabbit was her OC, so Chris had to write her out of the story instead of just changing the cover. Episode 25 of Sonichu. You'd think that episode 25 of anything would be pretty far into a story, far enough that there wouldn't be any real exposition, but not far enough that the whole story is wrapped up. Unfortunately for us, Sonichu's story has been wrapped up for multiple issues at this point, and we're stuck with this. The issue really dives deep into Chris's own perception of gender. I was self-aware of what set me apart from a typical boy or male. I rarely was able to understand why things like destruction, pain, blood, zombies, and such were so fascinating to other boys in my class. I also empathized and felt sad for the people who were hurting, or just felt really sad and upset. Don't boys care? Yes, boys do care, Chris, but boys also know that it's not real. Chris just does not understand gender because he gets all of his information on life from Family Guy and anime. Sarah, who is one of Sonichu's daughters, then calls all boys dumbg. No, Chris, you're dumbg. Christine, not Chris, Christine Sonichu, Sonichu's other daughter, named after Chris, tells a story about a girl who dated a jock and a nerd. The jock was a jerk, and juggled snails at a French restaurant, and the nerd pranked her by tricking her into thinking she was rescuing a cat, when really, it was a skunk. Since jock and nerd are the only types of boys in existence, and both are bad, she must mean that all boys are bad. Magichan then tells Robbie the future, and says that his soul is female, taking away the entire point about this story being a journey of self-discovery. One day, Robbie is about to be beaten up by the school bully, but then he talks him out of it, and the bully admits that he is gay. I guess Chris cannot get away from making all of his bully characters gay. Robbie tells the bully that they're both part of the same SLGBTQ community, and the two bond. Keep in mind that the SLGBTQ community was something Chris made up himself, and the S stands for straight, meaning that even if the bully was straight, they would still be part of the same community. So then Robbie comes out and is officially now Roberta Rose Chew. Roberta then evolves when her sisters hug her, and like all the other Sonichu evolutions, all of her clothes get ripped off. This leaves her naked in her sister's room, with her dick hanging out. Apparently, she has a massive erection because one sister likens it to morning wood, and the other uses an elephant metaphor. So Roberta got an erection after being hugged by her sisters, and I cannot believe that that is something that I need to say out loud. The next page confirms that they have to clean the carpet with a carpet cleaner, meaning that not only did she have an erection, but she ejaculated after being hugged by her sisters. Thank you, Chris, for putting that into a comic book for children. Roberta then goes and visits Magichan, who gives her a CD that will send signals through her body to change her into a woman without surgery. By the end of the month, Roberta had sprouted double D cups. By six weeks, and I quote, Part M shrank and part F opened. Listening to a CD literally grew Robert a vagina. Chris then puts a PSN trophy on the page to show that Roberta is now a full woman, and Magichan notes that she's fertile. Keeping in mind that Roberta is in fourth grade, 
She starts a relationship with another student for no reason, and then the student moves away. Her name was Volva Pai. Chris apparently did not understand what that word meant, and no, it is not intentional. Volva's mom is the troll that trolled Chris in real life, and also apparently in the comic too, so she had to skip town and be on the lam. That implies that it is illegal to troll Christine in Sonichu, like she's some sort of tyrannical dictator who cannot be questioned. So Sarah and Roberta go to the mall, and both are lesbians, so they spot cute rose chews. Now it's 2014, five years after the end of the last comic, and five years after Roberta's transition. Christine is complaining about Sonic Boom getting Sonic's arm colors wrong. Roberta starts dating this green rose chew, Mimi, and I just realized that this makes Roberta Chris's third Mary Sue character. He put himself in the comic, he put Sonic Chew in the comic, and now he has Roberta. They are all versions of himself that he wishes he could be. So then Roberta and Mimi have sex, even though they're... let's do some math. They are... 12! Fantastic! And the comic makes sure to note that they're not in a committed relationship for some reason. For no reason, the episode ends on Roberta dressing up like Rainbow Dash from My Little Pony and attempting a sonic rain boom. Okay, I would say that the rainbows are all symbolism for this being an issue in which Roberta joined the LGBT community, but I'm pretty sure that Chris just copied this from My Little Pony and put absolutely no thought into it. Then Chris quotes Michael Jackson, If you're not happy with yourself, take a look at yourself in the mirror and make your change. That is not the correct quote, and it's about changing who you are on the inside, not the outside, but whatever, of course Chris takes everything literally. The comic ends in July 2017 with Roberta saying that she loves her friends and family with all of her heart. Happy Halloween 2015! All the Sonichus dressed up as the human versions of the My Little Ponies, and Chris makes sure to note that Sonichu, despite being dressed up as a girl pony, is not trans or anything. Episode 26. Chris once again forgets to start his story with a title, so we have a cold open. Christine Sonichu is fighting against Nature and talking about the haters and trolls. My self-awareness and love for myself and everyone I care about will always dispel the darkness. Chris makes an important note at the bottom of the page asking why he doesn't just reboot Sonichu, and he says he won't because he hates reboots, and because his past issues have all been mostly practice and because they're true histories, and doing that would hurt the real Sonichus. Yes, Chris believes that if he were to reboot Sonichu, it would mean creating an actual new universe, and that would hurt the Sonichus that he's been chronicling this whole time. This episode, episode 26, is called Prideful, because the last episode didn't have enough LGBTQ stuff in it. Now, I don't have a problem with gay characters, but this is literally an instance where characters being gay has taken over the main plot of a story. It's like a Wattpad fanfiction, but it's being written by the actual author, and it's totally derailing what little plot already existed in the comic. Jamsta Sonichu and Lolisa Rosechu are attending the event, as are most of the main cast. Punchy, Silvana, Christine, Sonichu, Rosechu, Crystal, Blake, Bubble, Silvana, Wild, and Magichan are there. Roberta and whichever Sonichu daughter this is, I can't tell them apart come up, and Rosechu asks them if they've been having fun. I don't know what's happening to Sonichu's face in this panel. Nothing happens for a while until Punchy puts rainbow bands on his arms and calls himself the colorful Michelin Tire Guy. We are then introduced to Christine's children, Russell and Cynthia. Remember, Chris had Christine impregnate herself by having Magichan artificially impregnate her with her own semen after transitioning. Also remember that Christine in the comic is not always the real-world Chris that gets confusing continuity-wise based on when Chris started believing in the different dimensional merge stuff. In the comic, Christine's children are Russell and Cynthia, but in the real world, Chris wants a daughter named Crystal, not to be confused with his comic counterpart twin sister whose name is Crystal, who is also here. But the Sonichu kids don't get to see Christine very much because she spends her time in the real world, even though she's not Chris? Uh... This black Hispanic woman is Russell and Cynthia's babysitter, and she and Christian speak half Spanish to each other, and I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know what's happening, but according to the quickie, it's not proper grammar, and nobody can really understand what's happening. She does remove the kids from the plot, though. Silvana says that she's impressed that Christine was able to raise such good kids, 
despite Christine being extremely neglectful, and Christine makes a joke about them either taking after her or their father, which is also her. And then Punchy has to point out to the audience how funny Christine's joke is. Christine is also reading Sonichu number 10 for some reason. So then all the Sonichus arrive, including Darkbind and Bionic and Mega 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 whatever the skunk Megan Skunk. I hate this word. And Nate Shark arrives too and sees that Chris is a woman now. Chris asks Nate Shark why he's there. Last they knew, his homosexuality had been removed and he had left to date Kel. Nitzirk explains that he was happy in their relationship, and in their Pokemon journeys for a while, but he kept seeing himself more and more as his evil Rednalk form. So eventually, he left Kel a note, stole a motorcycle, and ran away. He can't transform into the Green Sonichu anymore, but he came to the Pride Parade to confront Christian, not knowing he was a woman now. Chris then reads the next page as M for Mature, but only, only for this one page, guys, don't worry. Nate Shark reminds Chris of the time Chris tried to cure the world of gayness and insults him, calling him fat, autistic, and says that he's afraid of getting a job because once he was fired for an altercation with a fellow employee. Chris then proves at least one of those observations true by pointing out to the reader that he is purposefully juxtaposing Nate Shark and Christine to show that they are opposites, and Christine basically says that she learned and isn't homophobic anymore. He also says that Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z are opposites, which is just not true. One's about a girl and the other's about a guy, but they're not opposites. Goku isn't a toxic male and Sailor Moon isn't some perfect girl, which is what Chris is trying to explain with that line. Christine says that she has changed, and then she offers to shake Nate Turk's hand, and they make peace. Christine tells him her name is Christine now, and Rednalk says, that's two whole letters, but that he's not going to change his name, because his name is Christian backwards, so now it should be Christine backwards, but he, he's making a point that he's not going to change it. So then Magichan senses that Nate Turk has vanished from the world, and figures he was taken into the dark void, and he sees the future, that there's going to be an attack on the festival. Nate Turk then contacts Metal Sonichu, who hasn't been seen since Sonichu issue number one, where they launched him with such force that he landed on the moon. Nate Shirk calls him a Headmaster Toy. Headmaster Toys are a brand of Transformers that have a robot form, and then they transform not into a vehicle, but into just the head of the robot. So he's just implying that Metal Sonichu is now a head. Just as Christine was able to convince Nate Shirk to be good in two pages, Metal Sonichu is able to convince him to be evil again in two pages. Let's, let's just focus on this, this meanwhile text box on the next page for a second. How hard is it to draw two straight lines of a box and make them straight? It's almost like Chris doesn't care about his work and is just making Sonichu because he gets paid for it. Also, Silvana is Russian now for some reason, which Chris notes. I will return immediately after for the battle. That came out a little more Transylvanian than I'd like, but whatever. Magichan takes the stage and tells the congregation of the Pride Festival that there is danger coming. Everyone in attendance of the Quickville Pride Festival, listen up. I am Magichan Sonichu, and this is an emergency announcement. Meanwhile, Metal Sonichu gifts Nate Zirk the power to become the Green Sonichu again. Christine then has a vision of the future, which is apparently a power that she has, and sees some guy knocking a Sonichu out cold. It's hard to tell which Sonichu it is without color, but it's wearing something on its neck, so it's probably Chris and the Sonichu medallion. So Chris and Crystal do their transformation and turn into Chris Chan Sonichu and Crystalina Rose Chu. Nate Shark arrives and announces that love is stupid and good is dumb, and receives an Xbox achievement showing that he has reached his full potential. This is, I guess, supposed to mirror uh, Roberta's PlayStation trophy when she became trans. So then the great battle begins, and a jerkop sneaks up behind Christine, but because she saw this attack coming earlier, she's able to dodge it using Double Team. The jerkop is actually Chris's half-brother, Cole Smithy, who Chris said earlier in the flashback to his high school days that he really looked up to. You've been double teamed. Christine then has to lock him away in the subspace cube and cries about it. So Christine and Nate Zirk begin to tussle with lots of punches. Nate Turk reaches for Christine's amulet to transform her back to human, but Christine says it's been upgraded so only she can use it now. 
Does anyone else remember when Chris said that his power wasn't in the amulet, it was in his class ring? What happened to that? The next two pages are a huge mess. Chris tries to show what's been happening with the rest of the fight, but he feels the need to quote-unquote break the fourth wall and tell the audience that he couldn't be bothered to redraw the beginning of the fight from other people's perspectives, so he just shows the battle raging, and for no reason he leaves a lot of white space. It looks like Chris drew a bunch of Polaroids and then gave them captions to describe what was happening. It would have made more sense to have each be its own page with enough detail to show what was happening, but this is Chris we're talking about. Bullet zap punches. Dig rise repeat. Citizens defend too. Steel wing bulldozer. Zap cannon. Barriers and collecting snipers. Then we turn from move names to paragraphs about what's happening. Lightning bullets, plus Roberta accidentally learned how to make the clouds she can run on. She cleared M in lines, uh... Dazzling gleams, thunder waves and stylish pirouettes. Whirlpools and thundershocks. Christine left her share of jerk-ops confused and paralyzed. Thunder punches, vine whips, harmony blitzes, thunderbolts and flamethrower, untitled. Slashes and lightning arrows. Duet dribble. Friendly fire protection. Energy beams and tiara boomerang. The battle ends with zero casualties on the hero's side, but some possessed jerk-ops did die. Chris says that he'll get more into that in Sonic U 14. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see about that. We'll see that that does not end up being entirely true. Sarah, Sonic U's daughter, gets a picture with her first one-hit KO, and Chris mentions that he doesn't like this, and also doesn't like when people do this in real life with hunting. Magichan says they've captured 1,500 Durkops, and they worry about Count Graduan's next move. The next page is a tribute to Chris's late father, who did not accept Chris as a woman, as shown in this panel Chris drew of his father telling him to wear pants right above a memorial for him. Robert died in 2011. Chris claims he accepted Chris's cross-dressing right before he died. We miss him every day. Anyhow, my mother had to get used to my subtle and more changes come July 2014. I was further soul-searching deep in thought. And then I get the image, a memory from my past life. Before this life, I was a lesbian woman, and I even went to Woodstock. Yes, Chris believes he is a woman because he has a woman's soul. And he believes this because he had a vision of a past life after beginning to believe he actually had magical powers. And then he puts all of that out into the world in stories like this, which are all about the trans experience, even though he doesn't really understand it himself. Chris ends the page by talking about how he had his driver's license and name legally changed, and no longer hates men for taking all the women away from him. A combination of the female soul thing, and a theory that Chris only transitioned so he didn't have to compete with other men to get women because now he'd be going after lesbians, are the two main reasons that many people do not accept that Chris is actually transgender. Then we get the conclusion to episode 24, the quote-unquote clip show starring the shape-shifting Silvana as Sonic. Episode 24, part 2, catching up. The episode starts with a flashback to Sonic and Rose Chu's wedding in 2007. Chris served as the father of the bride, which is weird because he's also Sonic father, which makes them siblings, but whatever. All the women are wearing white, even though it's a wedding. Chris goes back to his old method of having to number speech bubbles so that the reader can follow the dialogue, this time using Roman numerals. Bubbles then sees a spinner rack and uses surf to wash it away. This gets her dress wet, so she has to go to her room to dry it. Sonichu realizes he left his phone in the same room and goes inside to find it. Magichan chuckles to himself, knowing what's about to happen, but lets it happen anyway to ease the tension. So Sonichu walks in on Bubbles naked, even though they are all always naked all the time, so this makes no sense. Then Rosechu walks in on Sonichu with Bubbles naked, and Sonichu gets defensive, saying nothing happened. Literally all of this was pointless and made no sense. We get this weird joke where a cat is playing piano and it's making bad noises, then another cat jumps out, and the cat playing the piano calls him Cousin. Chris, I, Chris, I don't get it. Silly cool cat. I'm cool cat, and I love all kids! So Sonichu and Rosechu get married, and Chris doesn't even make a Sonic Rings joke. So do you see this rabbit over here? 
Do you wonder why there's a rabbit over there when there was no rabbit in the entire comic up to this point and it seems random? Well, let me tell you why. So a fan drew a comic about Sanichu and Roshu's wedding, and let's just say that Chris didn't like it too much. But because Chris thinks that whatever anybody writes about Quickville is real, he mostly stuck to the same story, but changed the details that he didn't like, so he could say that his version was the true version. Drawn August 2009 by John Crayon. See, John knew to put the bridesmaids in different colored dresses. Rose Chu is saying that she's unsure about marrying Sonichu, and Bubbles says he has a nice butt, and Rose Chu is like, Bubbles, and Bubbles is like, I'm just saying what everyone's thinking. Flashback to when Rose Chu and Sonichu first kissed under fireworks. Sonichu gives Rose Chu a lucky rabbit's foot he owns. In a faraway dimension, a rabbit demon finds out about this, and vows vengeance against Sonichu. Back at the wedding, Rose Chu wants to talk to Sonichu, so she runs to find him, and he's with Bubbles, naked. Unlike in Chris's version, this upsets her a lot, and she runs away. We then discover that the rabbit demon dropped a spider on Bubbles, who did the whole water attack thing and the clothes got dissolved, and it, it's the same as in Chris's comic. Turns out that the rabbit is the rabbit to whom the rabbit's foot Sanchu gave Rose Chu belonged to. He was killed for his foot, and resurrected by Mary Lee Walsh. He curses Sanichu with so much bad luck that he'll never be able to beat Mary Lee Walsh. Then, Anne Boleyn, who Chris claims is his ancestor, but totally is not, pulls Sanichu out of the comic and tells him he has to use his mind, his brains, to defeat them. Sanichu figures that if he's unlucky, he's likely to be hit by lightning. So he uses this to his advantage, and uses the lightning bolt to supercharge himself, powering up into a mega form. This causes Mary Lee Walsh to run away in fear. Sanichu shocks the rabbit, who is taken to jail, and Sanichu and Rose Chu get married. So Chris turned the events of this fan comic into his real comic, and added the bunny to show that no bunnies were harmed during the wedding. We cut back to Sanichu talking to Sonic in the mall, saying, Also, despite what Mr. John Cryon would have you think, no rabbits were harmed before, during, or after the wedding. And yes, I do normally pronounce this word as crayon, but John Crayon rhymes, so I'm assuming that's what it's intended to be pronounced as. Sonichu starts telling Sonic another story about a time when all the girls in his family were shopping for clothes and accessories, and he was looking at treadmills with his son, because, you know, th 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 those are the two genders, clothes and treadmills. Rose Chu trips down some stairs carrying heavy boxes of clothes outside JCPenney and is hospitalized. Chris makes a note that Sonichus go to the hospital, and not a Pokemon Center, because they don't like being put in Pokeballs. So Rosie's legs are broken, and because of this, she starts to put on weight. She chugs down broccoli and potato soup, and then the comic turns into an inflation fetish. Thanks for, uh, thanks for drawing this, Chris. Love it. Sonichu starts playing with Rosie's belly to make her feel better, and it gets kind of disturbing. Chris implies that they have sex, but skips it to keep the comic Y7, because yes, this is still for kids. The Sonichu children try to get her to exercise, but all she do is play video games, watch TV, and eat cookies. She's really turning into yet another version of Chris inside the story. Between the beginning of this story and now, Robert has changed into Roberta, meaning that this is happening simultaneously with the story of Robert evolving. She ate. I fed her. She was getting bigger. Wowie. Sarah also got fat during this time. Uh, so this was this part of the story is based on a real life event where Chris was quote unquote dating someone over Facebook who is believed to have a fat fetish and enabled Chris and allowed him to get more overweight and that this arc in the comic was her idea. So it's not just out of nowhere. One night, Rosie gets kidnapped by Count Grajewan and Sonichu has to save her by swimming through pickle brine, which inflates him to her size. Then this is immediately undone as he passes through a magic tunnel. Chris apparently just really needed to draw an inflated Sonichu. For his final task, Sonichu has to choose between saving Rosie and Christine. He wants to save Rosie, but if Christine dies, all of Quickville will plunge into darkness, so he makes a needs of the many versus a needs of the few decision. By which I mean, he chooses Rosie, and then finds out that Rosie, who is now thin for no reason, has already saved Christine. Rosie then starts to grow and crushes Sonichu, only for him to wake up with her actually on top of him and realize that that part was just a dream. 
Rosie then decides for herself that she needs to work out to lose weight, something Chris will never do. She is literally back to normal in 12 days, losing 200 pounds. There's a visual gag in the background that, while Rose Chu and Sarah lose weight, Layla Flaffy gains weight and Reginald has to drive her around in a cart. At the end, finally, Sonic Chu and Sonic part ways, both walking away with their wives in their carts, which Chris felt the need to label. Because this was all a conceited TV production, Sonic turns back until Silvana and Amy Rose turns into a ditto. It's thought that Chris did this to get around not owning the copyright to Sonic, and he thought that if it was his own character pretending to be Sonic, then he'd be fine. Finished October 2017. Except it's not finished. This issue comes with a little bonus, a little mind-bending bonus episode of some Sonic Chews going to Equestria to visit the main characters of My Little Pony. And together they sing a song. Chris writes it, saying it's a mix of country and techno, which is just not a genre that exists, or at least I hope it's not. Look at these ponies' eyes. They're so disturbing. We then meet Nightstar, Chris's pony OC, and they sing Chris's song together. This song joins the ranks of the brilliant other works of Chris, including Yellow is a Mellow Color and Revive Zordon. I'm a little country pop We're gonna make your hatred stop I tell you straight up, no lies Our emotions, thoughts, and love Come from deep in our hearts and souls Our solid, truest alibis We are prideful We've got love is love We're not stepping down We've got heart, we've got soul No trolling bully's gonna tell us You've been pwned I share a hug, I share a smile, I share a prayer My love goes on many a mile Kindness and honesty, my care and go Show me hatred, cuss and fuss I shall not bend or cry Shield of heart, confidence and will I don't hear you troll We are prideful We've got love, there's love We're not stepping down We've got heart, we've got soul No troll and ball is gonna tell us You've been called Put us down I show my heart in the right place. Love for you, Tart. Jam with me. Share a tune. Sing the song. Let's croon. Our pride is my pride. We stand strong and tall. Love is love. Conquers hate. We will not fall. We are prideful. We've got love is love. We're not stepping down. We've got heart. We've got soul, no trolling boy's gonna tell us you've been pwned. Sonichu issue 12.9 is mostly about ponies and not really about Sonichu, as if Chris really needed an excuse to go off on another tangent. It was drawn in August 2017 and is considered a Sonichu special. Chris also notes that he wants his pony to be canon in the real My Little Pony on the front cover. Chris's pony OC is named Nightstar and seems to be a pink unicorn with a Sonichu medallion. Let's check out her backstory. Unfortunately, Chris did not upload standalone pages online as images, so the best we have for some pages are pictures of the physical comic book. Chris also notes that there is now a way of discerning between the real-world Chris and the fictional Christine and that the real-world Chris's name will be written in cursive within the comic book. That's actually very helpful. Chris's usual insane ramblings about copyright are even more insane here, as his rationale for this being protected under fair use is that it's possible for fictional characters to exist in another dimension, and thus they cannot be owned by a company here on Earth. He is now a full true believer in the dimensional merge. The beginning of the comic is narrated by Nightstar, who is an artist with psychic powers and can traverse universes and can even traverse planets, which are definitely harder to do than entire universes, I guess. 
Nightstar says that there are no planets that have more alternate versions than Earth. And that's not counting the other planets of our solar system. That implies that the other planets in our solar system do have more alternate versions than Earth, but I'm pretty sure what Chris means is that there's just a lot of planets across different dimensions. Nightstar explains that we, meaning us, you, us listening to this video, exist in the prime reality. Chris calls our dimension 1218. Sonichu lives in the cartoon dimension, C197. Around the time of when Chris was writing the Sonichu, he watched one too many episodes of Rick and Morty and became so unbelievably smart that the knowledge of parallel dimensions opened up to him. Instead of understanding that multiverse theory is just a way that philosophers explain dependent and necessary events, and that physicists use to discuss quantum particles, Chris came to believe that there actually exists a universe where Sonichu exists, because if there's a universe where everything happens, then there is definitely a universe where his comics happen. C-197 is where most fictional characters live, according to Chris, which confuses his point slightly. If Spongebob and Sonic Boom take place in the same cartoon world, but within their show universes they don't take place in the same world, then really Chris has just invented another universe where similar characters exist. This kind of goes back to my theory from the first Sonichu issue, where I posited that Chris views his characters almost like tunes from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where they both exist and have the personalities used in their stories, but then also play the role that's written for them like it's a TV show. For some reason, the My Little Pony world isn't on the same world as Sonichu, so Equestria is a different dimension than C-197. Nightstar shares a birthday with Chris, and is now the fourth Mary Sue character Chris has written into the story including himself, Sonichu, Roberta, and now Nightstar. Chris says that after Nightstar was born, she was young. <laughs> I was aware when Tyrek was turning ponies into dragons, and Firefly got Megan to help us. This is describing the events of the first generation of My Little Pony, which aired in the 80s. So that happening when Chris was a child lines up with it happening when Nightstar was a child. But I'm pretty sure that Generation 1 My Little Pony has no continuity with Generation 4, which is Friendship is Magic and it's that continuity that Chris is mostly pulling from in the comic. Nightstar then starts talking about the first time she used magic. I, too, had a bit of the autism. <laughs> Nightstar received visions of Chris during their first three years, and mostly watched him watch cartoons. We both were wanting to be kind, friendly, and sharing fun and smiles with others. Like him, that was me. Very much so. And then, my eventual happened. I swear that Chris's writing is devolving. I also don't know whether I like this new font or not. Rip Comic Sans. So this eventual that happened was Nightstar getting her cutie mark, which ponies usually have to earn through undergoing some sort of metaphor for coming of age, and it's like their My Little Pony version of Patronuses or something. But Chris also implies with this that this is Nightstar speaking for the first time at age 3, and he also says that this is an early age to begin to speak, and that it was also around the time that Chris himself started to speak. This contradicts Chris saying in other places that he spoke his first word at six weeks old, which is impossible. But if he really did start speaking at three, then that is actually kind of late. Nightstar's cutie mark is a heart with angel wings, I think. Nightstar had to pass an exam to get into Princess Celestia's special magic school. She had to hatch a dragon egg, and she said that she did this unconventially. And then it shows her using her magic powers and an egg just cracking open, and I don't think that that's how it works. Nightstar gives up the dragon for adoption because she's not ready for responsibility and doesn't even remember who adopted it. The years pass, and Nightstar has apparently been dimension hopping a lot because she's met the Autobots, who actually do cross over with My Little Pony sometimes, so that at least makes sense. But she's also met Usagi, the Sailor Scouts, the Smurfs, Red Skeleton, Lucille Ball, Britney Spears, and of course, Sonichu. Nightstar's right eye changed colors after a drop of slime fell in it during a science experiment. This is supposed to mirror Chris's eye changing color after getting pink eye as a child, which just did not happen. Chris has a very mild case of heterochromia, which is something that you're born with. It is so mild that I actually cannot tell the difference, but other people assure me that they are different colors. So now we cut to around present day of the comic, 2017. Nightstar is traveling to Quickville to make arrangements with DJ Gems to Sonichu for the concert that they put at the end of the last issue. 
There's a My Little Pony TV special where the ponies become human, so of course Nightstar can become human. She transforms, and Chris makes sure to note that she's not a ditto. Transformed, Nightstar looks a lot like Chris, except of course her skin is a little more pink. DJ Jamsta calls Nightstar the unicorn with a scorn, which I guess is supposed to be a pun. They ramble about nothing, and then Nightstar leaves. She warps to Canterlot High, which I'm assuming is the dimension in which the My Little Pony characters exist as humans. That would be the Equestria Girls universe. She runs into this yellow thing, which she says is an old prototypical friend of her and Christine's. The two say to each other, You're supposed to be in Quickville! Which is confusing, because Nightstar isn't supposed to be in Quickville, she's supposed to be in Equestria, so I guess the yellow person thinks that Nightstar is Chris? But even then, Chris isn't supposed to be in Quickville, he's in the real world? So Nightstar calls the yellow thing Nightstar, and says that she's her pony alter. So, Nightstar is the Equestria version of Chris. Real Chris is our Chris. Comic Christine is Quickville Chris. And this yellow thing is Equestria Girl's Canterlot High Nightstar, but Nightstar is Pony Chris. What? Okay, let's, let's try that again. There is Real World Chris. Real World Chris has a counterpart in Quickville named Christine. Real World Chris has a counterpart in Equestria named Nightstar. Nightstar is a pony. Because Nightstar is a pony, and because ponies have equivalents at Canterlot High who are humans, Nightstar has a counterpart in Quickville who is this yellow thing. Nightstar reveals her cutie mark to the yellow thing, and the yellow thing turns pink. So, Pony Nightstar in human form tells human version of Nightstar, I hate this, that in Equestria, she's dating a pony named Diamond Melody, which means that it's likely that the human Nightstar will date a human Diamond Melody. Human Nightstar is named Christine Knight Weston Star Chandler. I guess Chris couldn't work the Ricardo in there. And Christine Knight calls Human Diamond Melody Kwai, and has to note that this means cute. Human Pinkie Pie walks up and impulsively grabs an s ball from Nightstar and gets herself trapped inside. So I guess that the humans, the human version of ponies are also Pokemon? Or only, th is everyone a Pokemon? I don't get it. Then Pinkie Pie rolls her way to class in her Pokeball. Nightstar goes to the lab at the school where Sunset, another human My Little Pony character, is developing permanent hair dye. Nightstar juts in as the narrator to explain that this high school is located in the same universe as Sonichu, but is in a different town, and then goes into detail about the months in Equestria. Nightstar then jumps into another story, this one about how she met Diamond Melody at a Slayer concert. Diamond Melody is talking about her favorite flyer, Spitfire, and Nightstar, who falls in love with Diamond immediately, walks up and says Rainbow Dash is better. Diamond says she doesn't want to get into this argument because she's there to see DJ... DJ Pwn3? DJ Pony? Whatever. This, this person. Perform. I thought they were at a Slayer concert. Nightstar says that she's there for that too. And then Diamond, who, the only thing that she knows about this person is that they like the same musician, but don't like the same racer, asks Nightstar to get a hot dog with her. They split the hot dog and run into Nepgear from the Hyperdimension Neptunia series. This isn't just another intellectual property Chris is stealing from. Hyperdimension Neptunia is going to have a huge effect on Chris's sanity in the real world, because it convinces him that he is a goddess, and actually controls C-197, and has magic powers in our world. At this point, we run out of high-quality scans and are left with these pictures. Thanks, Chris. Re re really good. We then get some deep lore, as Diamond explains how Nepgear is in Equestria without turning into a pony, and she explains that she can keep her human form by using the Konami code. Nightstar says the Konami code is up up down down left right BA start, which is incorrect. It's actually up up down down left right left right BA start. He missed a he missed one of the left rights. The Pwn 3 concert starts, and Diamond thinks to herself that Nightstar is cute. She then thinks that she can see a bit of herself in her, because I guess that's how Chris views relationships. It might be a side effect of his egotism, but I don't know, I'm not a therapist. Nightstar tells Diamond that her mom is from a place called Quickville, and Diamond says, uh Quill Sounds like a place with a lot of hedgehogs. That would be an okay joke if Quickville sounded anything like Quill. They go on a date to Quickville, and both are in their human forms. They sit down to eat, and I would love to tell you what happened, but it doesn't look like Chris left enough space for the staples in the book, so that entire part is cut off. They slept in Christine's house that night, and the next day, Nightstar baked a pie for them, and Chris lists all of the ingredients. 
Yes, we soon romped the hay together, Diamond Melody and I. Hey, that's a, that's a horse pun, get it? So yeah, Chris just inserted pony sex into his My Little Pony fanfic for kids. So Diamond Melody, who Chris spent this entire comic building up as Night Star's love interest across multiple dimensions, was the OC of one Jessica Quinn, a troll who Chris thought he was dating at the time. Quinn was the one with the fat fetish and was responsible for the Rose Chu and Sonic Chu inflation arc in the last comic book. It is unclear whether she and Chris were ever dating, but she encouraged him to gain weight and defended him from trolls. During this time, Chris was being influenced by the Idea Guys, a group of trolls who gaslit Chris into believing increasingly outlandish and dangerous things. We will see more of that in the next issue. The Idea Guys convinced Chris of the existence of other dimensions and said that Quinn was really a villain from another world. Or at least they attempted to convince Chris of that last part. All of this to say, another girl, another troll, another comic book plotline stopped in its tracks by Chris's naivete. Nightstar and Diamond break up, and she's comforted by Applejack and Twilight Sparkle. Twilight tells Nightstar that she's the most valuable unicorn in Equestria, despite Twilight also being a unicorn. Chris really just has to make himself the most specialist person ever, I guess. Nightstar talks to Discord, a reformed My Little Pony villain, and Discord suggests a charity event for Quickville. A few weeks later, Nightstar happens across her real sweetheart while buying apples from Applejack. This real sweetheart is a male pony OC made by the Idea Guys. He's a Vietnamese earth pony named... this. Uh, this is vaguely Vietnamese looking, but the Idea Guys were just trolling Chris because it's supposed to be pronounced... Y yeah. The Idea Guys told Chris that the name meant happiness, and after the Idea Guys were removed from power, Chris changed the pony's name to the actual Vietnamese word for happiness. Han 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 Hang Fu. Hang, hang Fu? I, whatever. Hang Fu? I'm just gonna call him Kun. The Idea Guys also made him male in order to pressure Chris into becoming gay, which they actually succeeded at. Around this time, Chris came out as bi, despite his hatred of homosexuals being well documented in this comic series. After the Idea Guys left and Chris retconned most of their influences out of Sonichu, he remains, to this day, bisexual. Kun works in and is interested in technology and science. Nightstar wants to impress him by showing him the advanced tech in Quickville, so they make it a date. Nightstar contacts Magichan to make an appointment to tour Quickville's General Electric plant, and Magichan says that he foresaw her calling, because of course he did. Chris's father, Bob, worked at General Electric in real life, which is probably where this plot point is coming from. They go on their date, but during the tour, there's an explosion in Quickville, and Nightstar has to rush off to the scene to help. She transforms into her Sonichu form, which she mentioned earlier that she had on page 7, and zooms off. The villain is Ray Wrights, a hyperdimension Neptunia character who represents Atari or something. In a text box, not actually in drawings, Nightstar opens a portal and sucks Ray into it. Then a portal opens under her and she falls in. Kuhn tries to save her, but can't. Magichan escorts Kuhn back to Canterlot High so he can be transported back to Equestria. Nightstar is lost in the void, just like Chris was at one point. Nightstar Mega evolves and battles Ray for 10 minutes, but loses. Ray harnesses her power to bring the kingdom of Atari, which is called Tari, I guess, to hover over Quickville. She tosses Nightstar to her death, but Magichan saves her, but not before Nightstar falls into a coma. The usual suspects arrive and defeat Tari, and it crashes miles away from Quickville. We don't get to see any of this, but instead, a sad Nightstar narrates it to us. During Nightstar's coma, Kuhn is taught Quickville tech and modernizes Equestria, including cloning and memory restoration technology. Nightstar then wakes up for literally no reason and the two move in together in Ponyville. Nightstar then jumps into another story, which started with her contacting IRL Chris just to chat. Her cutie mark starts glowing, and she seeks Twilight Sparkle for advice. This part of the story is heavily dependent on the plot of the Friendship is Magic movie. Nightstar and Kuhn discover that these two friends are having a feud, and one hates the villain of that movie, and the other refuses to believe that he was a bad guy but since he's dead, they can't really prove that he was the villain or did anything wrong. Then a pony named Tempest shows up. She was one of the villain's henchmen in the movie. So the villain in the movie, he's he's the Storm King, and he could probably control weather or something. Tempest wants to steal loot from his base, but it's inaccessible to anyone but the dead Storm King because it's surrounded by a storm. But since Nightstar can teleport, it's not a problem to her. 
Tempest says that they can search the base for records and she'll steal loot. So then they search the base for a while and eventually find the villain's captain logbook. Apparently Tempest had her horn cut off and the storm guy found it and didn't tell her and hid it in his drawer. So she finds that and gets mad. Then they set off a trap and get caught in a cage, but it's not really a big problem because Nightstar just teleports them out. They give the logbook to the guy who doesn't believe the villain was evil and he starts to read it. He realizes the error of his ways and he and his buddy confess their love for each other and kiss. Love is love. Back home, Nightstar is drawing her comic book, which is the ponified version of Sonichu, and contacts real life Chris for help. Real Chris then teleports into Equestria and assumes his pony form, which is identical to Nightstar because Nightstar is already his pony OC. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Then they transform into Rose Chews. Chris says in the next issue he'll explore Wild Sonichu's backstory and pick up his story about Count Graduon where it left off. Nightstar says that she will return. At the back of the book, we get a poster Chris wants us to cut out and keep. Nightstar is flying by levitating herself with Kuhn, and Chris is flying because he's an alicorn apparently, and he says, be kind to each other and keep a happy thought, zap it up. The end. And that kind of is the end. The next Sonichu books aren't the regular issues that we've grown used to. The next one, which is issue 13, Awakening of a CPU, is a depressing look into Chris's madness. And I don't mean that as a hyperbolic joke anymore. I don't mean haha isn't a grown man drawing bad comics about hedgehogs funny. I mean it gets really, really disturbing. What you are about to see goes beyond the disturbed mind of Christian Weston Chandler into the realm of the untamed cruelty of a group of individuals known as the Idea Guys. In the mid-2010s, interest in Chris had waned, and there were fewer people paying attention to him. The Idea Guys were able to manipulate Chris and take control of him, feed nonsense into his mind, and left massive, permanent damage. This issue of Sonichu, issue 13, is almost entirely retcons and lore added by the Idea Guys to make fun of Chris, and Chris believed it all to be real. Chris is currently still publishing the version that we're going to be looking at because he thinks it's all still real, although some of it is, in his words, mischronicled. That is why it's titled both Awakening of a CPU and also known as the Idea Guy Corruptions. In the video game series Hyperdimension Neptunia, there exist goddesses for each of the popular video game consoles, and Chris has come to believe that he is Goddess Blue Heart of the Commodore 64. He signs his name, Mrs. Christine Weston Chandler Sonichu Blue Heart. The Mrs. will be explained later. He adds a disclaimer that, while everything in this book did actually happen to Sonichu, it is very offensive. Written November 1st, 2017. Chris once again states that he isn't infringing on copyrights because everything in the book really happened. This isn't so much a comic book as it is prose with some occasional pictures, so I apologize that there won't be much to look at. If you recall back to Sonichu issue 0, Chris claimed that this series was Sonichu's story and nothing less. Chris is saying that this issue is about himself, Christine Weston Chandler, and that it is our story. Christine W. Chandler in An All True Story, Destined Prophecy. So the game Hyperdimension Neptunia takes place in a world called Game Industry. A soldier named John from that world contacted Chris and told him that his Sega Dreamcast was a link to the real world of Game Industry, because Game Industry exists in C197. That would mean that the Dreamcast can also take Chris to Quickville. The story of this comic is Chris's interpretation of real-life events, and John is one of the idea guys. In the story, Magichan teleports to Chris's side, and they turn on the Dreamcast and feel its power. Monica from Doki Doki Literature Club then kidnaps CPU Neptune, who is the goddess of a fictional Sega console, the Sega Neptune, which was never released in real life. Silvana Rosechu was able to rescue her, but on November 4th, Count Graduan invaded Quickville. Chris and Magichan were able to beat back Count Graduan and Kurome, the villain of the Hyperdimension Neptunia series, with the help of John and the Sailor Scouts from Sailor Moon. Sailor Jupiter saved John from German, presumably Nazi, soldiers. John and Kurome then had a final stand. In the story of Hyperdimension Neptunia, 
Karom is half of a goddess, and the other half is inside Chris or something. So Chris merges his half with Karom, and it turns her into a full, good goddess. And that ends that arc of the story. Monica, however, survived, and is joined by Akan, the villain from the movie Hardcore Henry. Akan kidnaps Silvana Rose Jew, so John and fictional Christine wage a three-day battle to get her back. Akan then attacks Quickville directly, and gains control of the Quickville Mall. He sat in the mayor's chair and declared himself ruler, but author Chris sent a big comet to destroy the mall and killed Akan. He then used his goddess powers to restore the mall from the rubble. But it turns out, Akan wasn't dead, and started living in C-197's 14 Branchland Court, which is the fictional version of Chris's home. This is purely speculation, but what I believe is happening here is the real-world John, whose name is Joshua, is having a tug-of-war with Chris as to what is happening in C-197. Joshua tells Chris that Akan has invaded Quickville and taken over the mall. Chris then says that he killed Akan with a comet. Joshua then says that Akan survived. They go back and forth and back and forth, and because Chris both believes everything Joshua says, but also doesn't want anything bad to happen, we just get this nonsense, this lack of progression in the story. John is then confronted by Monica. In Doki Doki Literature Club, Monica is self-aware, and Chris says that she can wipe people's memories. Chris is, of course, immune to this ability for some reason. Count Grajewan, who has been the villain of the comic up to this point, is obviously evil, but apparently he is not so evil that he would side with Akan so he signs a peace treaty with Chris. Somehow, Chris's army wins, and they all march the bad guys to Count Grajewan's prison camps. Not accepting defeat, Akan opens a time portal and sucks in Sonichu and Christine. Christine gets lost in time, and Sonichu appears in Africa. Doc Brown from Back to the Future takes Sonichu and returns home. Chris then retcons his story and says that the US lost the Cold War in C-197, meaning that this entire time, in every issue of Sonichu, they have been living in a world where the USSR won the Cold War. Apparently, this change in history, and also the existence of Pokémon and Power Rangers and a Sonichu and all that stuff, does not stop Hillary Clinton from running for president in 2016. But, in this universe, she wins, and she has Vladimir Putin as her vice president. She falls ill a few months into office, and Putin becomes the president of the United States. Quickville, which is so heavily policed by Magichan that people who smoke cigarettes are instantly arrested, apparently has a problem with the Russian Mafia and the Japanese Yakuza, and they start gang wars. Ian Brandon Anderson, apparently having recovered from the head injuries Chris inflicted on him in Sonic Jr. 10, becomes Quickville's sheriff. Alice and Amber also becomes ill, because women can't be leaders or something, and the new mayor of Quickville is Brendan Fraser. Chris then has a retcon, and says that the fictional version of Chris, back in 2007 after Megan wronged him, which is a weird way of saying that he wanted to rape her, Chris says that the fictional Chris took away Megan's powers and revoked women's rights in Quickville, and then banished Megan. If you look at the timeline, Megan was with Chris when he entered the time void, so the only time that Chris could have revoked women's rights is directly after that. That's also the speech, according to Chris, that he announced that he was trans, meaning he was taking away women's rights while also announcing that he was a woman. Megan was banished to Last Station, which is the Hyperdimension Neptunia version of PlayStation. There, she becomes CPU Red Heart. Chris says he was taught how to control his new powers by the Sailor Scouts and Twilight Sparkle. John, who is the savior of women's rights, then went back in time to prevent Chris from abolishing women's rights. I love this panel of Chris kicking his past self in the balls. More on his journey later. In the early 90s, before the Sailor Moon anime was brought to the United States, an American company decided they wanted to make their own American adaptation. It had live-action segments a la Power Rangers and also American-style animated segments. Chris believes both canons of the show to be real in C-197. In Chris's comic, the American versions of the Scouts were drafted into the U.S. Army and then deemed too dangerous. 
so they had to go on the run, and four of the five of them died. One of them by suicide. Their spirits then gave Chris their powers, but it still was not enough to transform him into a Sonichu. Nightstar, who was Chris's pony OC, then tried to make a clone of Chris so that Chris could go and live in Quickville and someone could still take care of Barb, but she accidentally made a bunch of clones of the 2000 era Chris, and they were all lustful. Meanwhile, on John's time travel journey to return women's rights, in the year 2000, Chris was indoctrinated by Nazi ideology, so he gave his Sonichu medallion to Hitler, who is still alive somehow, and this allowed Hitler to become immortal. Nazi Chris had to then kill that dimension's good Chris, but then he took his medallion back, and Hitler turned to dust or something. In order to make Chris not lustful anymore, Chris was taken to Islam by John, and he is excised. Chris draws someone shouting Alu Akbar and shoving a Sonichu medallion into Chris's butt. This makes Chris not lustful anymore, but women's rights still haven't been restored. Chris's Sonichu medallion in the year 2000 is then mailed to him, but is intercepted by North Korea. In the present, Chris learns that the ancient prophecy is destiny, and that if he goes against it, everybody will die. The prophecy also explains that Chris and his father Robert were actually born from the rainbow energy when Sonic and Pikachu collided. This means that Chris is actually a Sonichu in real life. He claims that there were 69 eggs that sprouted from the rainbow. Chris calls himself the Chosen One. Chris calling himself God Counter. Well, this isn't actually Chris calling himself God, it's the idea guys, so I'll let this one slide. Because Chris now believes that he himself is God, he is upset that the people in Quickville are Christian. Angelica Rosechu then converts to Islam, then Satanism. Here, Chris depicts her covered in blood. Blake becomes a Muslim extremist who worships Osama bin Laden, and Wild Sonichu began to grow weed. Chris says he doesn't mind the weed, but Wild's meth lab is too far. Bubbles Rose Chew is now transgender and transracial, identifying as a black man. Punchy is in an insane asylum and hates fat people. Chris takes offense to this. Rose Chew, it turns out, is also trans. She was actually male as a Pikachu and a Raichu, and even as Rose Chew. She didn't have surgery until 2008 to become female, which was after the issue of Sonichu where she attacks the guy in the Forest Hand Garbage Building and we see her naked so this is a major retcon. Chris then apologizes for attacking trolls over the years who drew Rosichu with a penis, conceding that they were in fact correct. Chris then apologizes for acting angry on Facebook over the revelation that Rosichu was male, which apparently upset the real Rosechu. He blames this on Silvana being kidnapped and John's bragging about how much sex he's had with his five wives. He is already married to five women! A lesbian couple wants him to help them make a baby. He has a daughter with one of his five wives, and yet he still continues to mate and sleep with countless other women. Chris also states that he is not fond of sex at all, which is a side effect of his hormone medication. Blanc, one of the CPU goddesses, then takes Chris on a pretend date to get him used to dating, and Chris immediately asks for sex. This angers her, and so Chris changes the topic to books. He talks about R.L. Stein's Goosebumps and Fear Street, but Blanc isn't interested in those, and instead wants to talk about Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Blanc also questions why Chris voted for Hillary, and Chris says it's because she was more mature than Trump. Blanc asks Chris if he's read something more grown up than R.L. Stein, and Chris says that he likes The Giver, which is usually read in elementary schools. Chris calls it a complex story about manipulating people to keep them from the horrors of the real world, and he does not see the irony of him saying that at all. Blanc asks Chris why he doesn't have a job, and Chris says that it's because people Google him and then don't hire him. Also, if he makes more than $900 a month, he loses his disability money. Quickville borders the country of Australantina. Australatina. What? and one of the Quickville soldiers pooped on the border, so the Australatina soldiers killed him, and this sparked another war. Meanwhile, Jamps de Sonichu was on trial for sexually assaulting Punchy. Chris is on Jamps' side, and he was found not guilty. 
This caused riots, and people burned down buildings in Quickville. The Austro-Latinas attacked during the riots, and this caused Simoneless tunnels underneath the city to collapse, forming a ravine between the east and west halves of the city. The Austro-Latinas took over the western half, and Quickville kept the east. But unfortunately, in the war, every single one of the Quickville soldiers died. The Russians, who are allies to Quickville, because remember, Quickville is in America, and America is currently being ruled by Putin, uh, they leave because their army's been defeated, and so then the Nazis join the Australatinans. The Nazis wipe out almost all of the wild Pokémon around Quickville. Real World Chris has to send in his level 100 Pokémon from his games in the real world to aid Sonichu in fighting the Nazis. Apparently, after all of his years of playing Pokémon, he only has two of them. Also, Sylvana is dead, so now Magichan is married to Mewtwo, and they're gay. Chris tries to end the war by meditating in our world, but he accidentally creates Anibras Saffron Chandler. Arenebus is Sabrina backwards. Arenebus then immediately goes shopping and tries to find a girlfriend-free boy. The Nazis capture most of the 71 special Sonichu. I don't know where those two additional ones came from, because last time we heard there were 69. One of the Sonichus they capture is Simonla, and they burn her alive. Chris then says that fictional Christine back when he was fictional Chris, was so lustful and obsessed with girls because he absorbed some of the real-world Chris's sins. So he was 150% Chris. Also, the villain Akan is now Jesus or something. On December 17th, 2017, Chris renounces Christianity and now worships the CPU goddesses because they are all real in Quickville. Chris then notes that John and he have been funneling funds into Quickville by playing heists in Payday 2. The Chris clones, remember those? Nightstar made them? The Chris clones are running around Equestria, and they turn into blobs, and they scream, Jule! And they all get lured into an open field, and they're killed with napalm. Meanwhile, the CPU goddesses beat back all the Nazis. Chris then explains that these special Sonichus are like phoenixes. They infinitely die and are reborn. So Sylvana Rosechu is reborn with her full memories. And Chris's father, who is dead in real life, is then reborn as a Sonny, with all of his memories, and he now lives in Quickville. This is how Chris copes with death. Patty isn't dead, she's the mayor's assistant. His father isn't dead, he's an immortal Sonichu in Quickville. Monica is working with the Nazis now, and John convinces Chris to read The Man in the High Castle, which is a book about the Germans winning World War II. Chris has the power to be anywhere and can dissolve the Nazis with a single drop of his blood, and he does this whenever they misgender him. I don't know why he doesn't do this to all of them all the time, but whatever, he does it when they personally wrong him. Chris writes a handwritten letter to the My Little Pony character Discord, asking him to help defeat the Nazis, but Discord says no. Chris then travels to Equestria and freezes Discord in stone, and then Discord decides to help. I'm pretty sure this is torture. So Discord kills all the remaining Nazis. Chris infects the remaining Nazis, even though there shouldn't be any left, with his blood, making them impure, so they retreat to Germany and disband. They are also all now Sonichus. This is Sonichu Hitler. Chris then states some fun facts about Sonichus, like their Pokedex numbers start at 978 and go to 985. The current Pokedex ends at 890 as of the recording of this video, meaning that it's very likely that the next generation of Pokemon will reach 978 and that Chris will then have to wreck on this again. Chris says that Sonichus age one year every two years, and that special Sonichus, meaning the ones whose eggs were formed of the rainbow, age once every five years, and thus he is 21 years old. I don't know how that math works, but okay. So Nightstar, Chris's pony OC, had her tail cut off, and her family are now in prison. Chris heals her, and she becomes half pony, half Sonichu. Then she kills some Nazis. All the Rose Chews and all the female Sonichus, like Roberta, are captured, and they're being raped and impregnated by Nazi soldiers. John and Sonichu arrive and liberate them, and it's, it's very violent and also poorly drawn. Chris's mother, Barb, is also there, 
as is 14-year-old Zapina. We then get a flashback to the 2011 real world of California. Chris's father, Bob, visits Ted Bundy, the serial killer, and together they travel to Quickville, where they are reborn as Sonichus in full. Robert Chu then meets Sonichu, even though they already met when he was alive in this one picture where Chris drew all the Sonichus together with his parents photoshopped in from that one issue where Chris turns to trans. And then everybody cries about how much they've missed him. Robert calls Sonichu his grandson. Ted Bundy is also now a Sonichu and a defender of Quickville, and Chris actually thinks that he was framed for murder in real life and he still believes that to this day. The remaining Nazis, including Hitler, are all Sonichus of different shapes and types, so they can never unify under an identity anymore because they're all different. Roberta Sonichu, Sonichu and Rose Chu's trans son, who is still a teenager, and Rose Chu, then give birth to the children of their Nazi rapists. They lay three eggs and their children are healthy. On the next page, Magichan explains in a simple text box that he is bi and is now married to Mewtwo and Silvana. Soon, those three are going to marry Chris as well, and Chris's future human wife. Also, Magichan had a mental breakdown, which caused a tear in reality to form. Chris decides that it's up to him to close it. He transforms into his Sanchu form, and we see that Chris's heart is 111% filled. His love quest is now over. He mega evolves into his angelic form, and then flies into the tear in reality. It took like, like three minutes for him to close it. I don't know why this plot point is even here. Magichan, in his broken mental state, puts Chris's future wife, identified as 5PB, into a coma. He then was rushed to the hospital, and they replace part of his brain with machinery to depower him, so that this can't happen again. There's three sentences about how Robotnik tried to change the ancient prophecy, and Chris then had to time travel to stop him, but none of that amounts to anything. Chris then yells at Magichan, and is angry at his actions, despite it being stated that none of this was on purpose. He said it was hard to draw stuff for Magichan, and he should be thankful. And, he is super upset that Magichan wiped 5BP's memories of Chris. Chris then says he intended on marrying Magichan and 5PB. But now, he will happily marry Magichan and Mewtwo and Silvana. Then they kiss. Chris tells us that he became bi because of Nightstar's boyfriend, Kuhn. If Nightstar is part of Chris, and Nightstar is dating a guy, then that means that Chris should date guys. Chris is now getting married to Magichan and Krizel Rosechu. Krizel is a Rosechu that Chris invented a week before writing this page. She was the idea guy's idea, and they explicitly made her 15 years old in order to blackmail Chris into admitting that he was a pedophile. Sonichu has a gun and wants to kill the CPU goddesses. Chris arrives and tells Sonichu that he's sorry for upsetting Rosechu and being mad that she's trans, and he tells Sonichu that he shouldn't have been a bad role model because Sonichu has inherited Chris's old prejudices. Also, Sonichu is autistic now. Chris tells Sonichu that he was not brainwashed by the CPUs, and that he's embracing his Sonichu half, which involves sleeping in a puddle of his own pee. He's even moved past his hatred of Xboxes. My son, my son, my son, please come back to me. You are not this. You are not a war-making and hateful thing. You are Sonichu. My good son and hero of Quickville, I love you, my son. Then they kiss. I promise I will have sex with you later, Sonichu. But right now, you and I have some mistakes to undo and amend for. Let's go, my son. You got me too turned on for me to let you go without sex now. Now, come here, you woman, and let me come in. Chris doesn't want to do this, so he ties Sonichu up with his own tail and then leaves to clean up other problems in Quickville. So Chris goes back in time and makes sure America wins the Cold War. Then he states the national anthem of Quickville is Aretha Franklin's Think. Issue completed April 10th, 2018. Chris drew a special comic about his wedding. Magichan, who's already legally married to Mewtwo and Silvana, marries Krizel and Chris. Chris shows his heart level at 200%. It's March 26th, 2018, and Chris tells the congregation that he vows to be a more consistent chronicler. Despite this, Sanchu Issue 13 is the final complete installment of the series as of the recording of this video in June 2020. They all kiss, and Chris looks very happy. At the end of the issue, 
Chris writes a few pages from his perspective after the Idea Guys were removed from power. People from the Kiwi Farms were able to convince Chris that most of what the Idea Guys said didn't happen, but some of their influence still exists over Chris. He still believes that he is a CPU goddess, still thinks that he's married to Magichan, he identifies as bisexual, and he still thinks that he can visit our sister dimension. The Idea Guys extorted $6,000 from Chris by threatening to leak information that they forced him into giving them. Chris says that he has had the last laugh, because their interference has only made him more psychically strong. Chris believes he is the representative of the Commodore 64, and is CPU Blueheart of Kama and Quickville. He ends the book by saying there is danger coming to Quickville. Ray writes, a hyperdimension Neptunia villain, is trying to take over the world. Chris asks the company that makes Commodore to make a new console to give him strength, and asks for our prayers to allow him to defeat Ray Wrights. The next issue of Sonic U, issue 14, is another uncolored wall of text, just like this one. It is also unfinished. My next segment will be issue 14, which introduces Jacob Sockness's Jacoba, and is about the dimensional merge. Sonichu issue 14 is only 25 pages long. It is mostly text with sparse, uncolored drawings. As such, I will be reading it more often than usual instead of summarizing. Sonichu issue 14, The Unfinished Awakening of a CPU Book 2, began June 2019. Welcome to our combined dimensions of 1C211987. My name is Christine. In February 24, 1982, I was born in this dimension 1218. Yet I had literally come into this world from an event of the future year of February 1st, 2003, the chaotic rainbow of Station Square and Quickville. It turned out that I am one of the special Sonichus, but one with great destiny. I ended up learning about my species and close Sonichu and Rosechus and the city of Quickville, Virginia in the nation of Quickville, Virginia in the United States of America. And not only that, but of the dimension of C-197, where nearly all fictional original characters exist, live, and coexist. The first Sanju and Rosechu became my best friends forever, who I care about a lot. Yet the special Sanju, Magichan, a psychic type, was my literal guardian angel, and guided me, and cared for me a lot. Christine has always had powers, and her destiny was laid out. I go beyond my best to keep her safe. And I ended up delightfully marrying Magichan, my destined Krizel Rose Chew, and even Sylvana Rose Chew, and the one and only Mewtwo, who also mentored Magichan after he hatched. I truly love them all. Which leads up to previously in Book 1. October 2017, I learned of my Sega Dreamcast being this world's counterpart of the spiral console of C197 that had the past CPU of Planetoon. U Uizami, Uizami Tenushubi, Tenushubi, um Umizame, uh, this person. My Dreamcast had a piece of Uizame, and the same seal as the Spiral Console. I absorbed the seal into me. I ended up meeting and getting well acquainted with the CPUs, Neptune, Blanc, Noir, and Vert, and the others of game industry. Got to know Quickville and my fellow Special Sonichus and Rosechus better. At times, I even personally participated in super-heroically saving many days. There were a number of bad instances as well, but I'd feel better staying with the positives. But, long story short, Dimension 1218's Idea Guy, aka Joshua Wise, and his OC, Johnson Wiles of C197, forced catastrophe and chaos freaking Nazis upon C197 that in April 2018, I was able to undo the carnage and worst of the events that transpired. They even terrorized C-197's Equestria and everyone there. I had a piece of the Infinity Stone, the Aether Reality Stone, that I used to undo that bunch of mess and punished Johnson for his part. After that, a few months later, I found my further destiny, as I had found and accepted into myself the soul and memories of the last past CPU of the Commodore consoles and the nation of Kama, Scarlet. So, for over a year now, as I write this page, I am the present CPU of the Commodore consoles, Blueheart. Now, since then, my psychic and electric superpowers have been developing and growing stronger and better. But the biggest development has been the dimensional merge between here, 1218, 
and where our OCs live, C197. Before, one is not tangible to the other. After, you can see Dr. Wolf and his OC now shaking hands. Heavy things and events have been happening, and I have been one of the central deity conduits for the merge. I have been feeling, and not to remotely sound pessimistic, lots of electricity flowing throughout my body daily. Numb, yet fully functional body. My soul mind and energy projected everywhere, and heavy energy from the heart to the aura, and as well, even the loud, long, thunderous belches could not help but boom out of me. And I have had lots of deja vu moments, so I know we remain on track of the sequence of events, and I feel the pressures more as the completion of the dimensional merge comes closer. It has been rough, but I knew these were the circumstances when I agreed, steadfast and true, to continue and do my part in all of this. I have no intention backing down, and I shall keep myself composed and together as best as I can and do. One more thing I shall state with love. You can definitely have faith in Magichan Sanachu, along with the others to keep me safe and well-guided and alive. I even, seriously, have been in better interactivity with him, tangibly, at least to me, for years. Long before Idea Guy came around, he personally came over, talked with me, and we shared many meditation sessions together. Why, even at BronyCon 2017, at the Grand Galloping Gala, Magichan was my escort and bodyguard the whole weekend. Even though, to most, it appeared I was dancing a duet solo, I was literally dancing with Magichan, my guardian angel. This was before I learned how much he loved me, but I've loved and appreciated him a lot before I first kissed him half a year later, so it was very good, indeed. But that dance, we treasure that moment a lot, at least one of us was able to wear comfy shoes at the gala that night. And then to note the three heart attacks in a minute that I fulled myself back from and survived two nights ago from today's date of June 26th, 2019. And me handwriting this page, the remainder of this book remains in progress, as does the completion of the dimensional merge and the full tangibility to physically transform into my Sanju and CPU forms. I pray the completion of this page moves us all into full mutual tangibility between 1218 and C197. This book continues on by my power and hand in time with right here, right now. Chris then signs the page. The next page, page 8, is blank. The book picks up again on page 11, so I assume that Chris left pages 8 and 9 and 10 blank for when the merge happens. Friday, June 28th, 2019. At noon, after completing the rebuild and refurbishing of the Kama Basilicom, uh, Basilicoms are churches in Hyperdimension Neptunia, now in Quickville. My and Scarlet's Sherisite Sher was reactivated by our old friend and ally, Beth Stevenson, who activated it the first time back in 1979. Beth Stevenson is a executive producer of My Little Pony. Some technical difficulties are possible and expected, waiting for that. Also, I went to see my physician for the follow-ups after Monday's night traumas. He called it a gastro-related problem and recommended I take Tums as needed. Also, I wowed him with my psychic powers. Now he is a witness as well. Sunday, June 30th, 2019. Nearly a week now, I have been, while able to comfortably fall deep asleep, I had lost my ability to regain consciousness and fully lucid dream as I have before. Even though I remain very much self-aware during my dreams, I find myself feeling too tired to actively deviate and do freely as I would normally, as opposed to going with the flow. I ended up stuck in the flow, and more recently, Emmanuel, Jesus, Buddha, the CPUs, and even the other deities entered my dreams trying to help me recover, as well as remind me of my goddess abilities in sitting meetings and talks with me. This morning, Magichan took a more direct approach. I was half asleep awake, and we took a closer look in my mind ending up at the vault door in my subconscious. We needed access to the door in the back of my subconscious, which on the other side was a literal subspace and subdimension that I shared with all the other deities in the cosmos. In the center is our round table and thrones for each and every one of us, more than what I drew here. I needed to find my way here, consciously, deep in my dreams. A demon, Jacoba apparently usurped the throne of God of the Galaxy and Creation, Destructions, or some <laughs> like that. 
Heavy, such an antagonist. I called in a favor from Mary Stew and Gary Stew. They both killed and exiled Jacoba and claimed the throne. They planned to bestow the title later to someone most worthy and trustworthy. They left an indestructible statue of themselves on the throne. I also get a vote as to who fills the seat. Even though this was in C197, in sequence, within less than 48 hours from the death and exile of C197's Jacoba, 1218's Jacoba, from all timelines, permanently died and faded from existence, making Mary and Gary the temporary gods throughout everywhere. Okay, starting around the start of the weekend, July 31st, I hit the hay around 6pm, so I could at about 2 or 3.30am after receiving the payday, do the grocery shopping at Walmart. According to my Fitbit, I awoke at 9.58pm, way too soon, and I was half asleep. I felt like I was sleepwalking, but did not literally. Heavy lucid dreamed that night. My psychic headaches were going off heavily that night too. I found why in reading about Jacoba wanting to attack Quickville. Fortunately, that's not likely to happen. Among other details, I read that night from my friends and allies. Yada yada yada. I meditated, and awoke to full conscious rest at about 1.30am. Did my shopping later, and then Magichan, Krizel, Silvana, and I started off for Bronicon 2019. August 1st, 2019. Bronicon Day 1. Come and get it. So we four leave, packed luggage and pre-thought schedule on hand. For Baltimore at 5.30 a.m., I grabbed breakfast and gas at Sheets. There was heavy traffic on I-66 East. During the drive, for an hour or two, I felt and caught visions of my staff-wielding magic counterpart, with a small army of dark magic-filled individuals. Fortunately, Count Graduan was there to keep the house safe all weekend. He and all of our present large defense team, and Mewtwo as well, defend the house very well. Chris was after the hand-sized stones that surround my bed. Magichan told me to take them all with us, and Graduan and Mewtwo, with Magichan, quickly teleported himself there and then back to us, in the van. Overpowered Magichan and his army. What? Anyway, about 10am, we arrived in Baltimore's convention center, parked, made our way in, and picked up our badges. So then Chris enters BronyCon, and he eats his first ever churro, he meets a bunch of his fans, and gives the brony analysts some fan art that he drew. It should be clear that this is neither a fictional comic book nor an exaggerated autobiography. It's like Chris's diary, but Chris is delusional, thinking that he had a battle in his car on the way to BronyCon, but it was really just a daydream. On day two of BronyCon, Chris says that he was able to practice Spanish with a family and some hotel staff that put a smile on their faces. During the gala, Chris says that he slow danced with Magichan and Krizel. Later, there was a panel of YouTubers called the Brony Analyst who play Team Fortress and use their brony personas. Chris daydreamed about joining them, and he claims that he was the red spy in Team Fortress 2. He tells them, sorry not sorry, but that is what actually happened in Equestria. Chris then met Lauren Faust, who's the showrunner for Friendship is Magic, and he asked her about the relationship between ponies and humans as depicted in early generations of My Little Pony. He also gave her Sonichu issue 12.9. Chris does not state what her answer to his question was. Chris went to a panel that sorted ponies into Magic the Gathering colors by their temperament. Chris then took a personality quiz and found himself to be white-blue. White usually stands for lawfulness and blue for intelligence, so... so... no. August 4th, 2019. Bronicon Day 4. I had five art pieces left for the analysts and Quartzes. Since I missed the chance to talk with them, I wrote kind notes on the back of each of the arts. I found Silver Quill and asked him to deliver them for me. He very kindly accepted, and I bought a writing quill pen from him. It looks very good under my hairband on my head. I also was interviewed by my friend Noah and his sweetie. Lovely, kind people, the both of them. This is the uh, this is the same Noah who would later bring Chris, when he was possessed by Sonichu, into his home studio and make fun of him for hours during a live stream. I showed them around the vendor hall, for some of the favorite authors and people to interview. Then, my loves and I went up for the Bettering Yourselves panel, followed by going down for Rebecca Choilette's autograph. Choilette's, Choy, I don't know. And I sang the chorus of Embrace the Magic for her too. Then we left on a content and satisfied note to enjoy a hearty meal and a hanging out with H. Winslow and his kind group of friends. 
and then we made our way home. Magichan had to help me drive through temporary possession. That's great. That's great. Chris is being possessed by Magichan to drive. Love it. That's the end of the issue. It's a work in progress, but has no conclusion, and is mostly just Chris going to BronyCon. Silent 2 does not appear on the issue at all. Chris also drew a Friendship is Magic the Gathering card in the corner of the most recent page. I will cover this issue again if Chris ever finishes it. <laughs> Most of this section will focus on the fan comic Rose Chu's story, which Chris has made mostly canon. Rose Chu's story is a retelling of the beginning of Sana Chu from Rose Chu's perspective, and is also unfinished. Let's begin with that. So Chris is a being of creation, but he is in danger of being corrupted by darkness. So his goodness split from him and forms Liquid Chris, the lumped dregs that remained, his laziness, his hubris, his shameless lust. These formed the being we now know as Solid Chris. Chris's ego was so big that he used what little power he had left to make a being to endlessly worship him. But because he has no creativity, he had to combine two already existing ideas. Cut to a Pichu, who has been raised by a trainer named Kel for most of her life. The Pichu is now a Raichu, and she loves Kel very much. But Kel has caught a lot of other Pokémon, and she has given them all names, like David, her Dragonite. But this Raichu doesn't have a name. Raichu is then struck with a rainbow beam and becomes Rose Chu. This is my story, and nothing less. Chapter 1. Fallen Rose Chu is practicing in the woods a week after the rainbow incident, but she can't seem to use her elemental powers. She's upset that the inability to battle means Kel will care even less about her. She starts to walk home, and Sonichu peeks out from the bushes to look at her. He follows her home, and we see that Kel doesn't understand why Rose Chu is upset at all. The audience can also tell that all of this is just in Rose Chu's head. Rose Chu says that she wishes there were other Pokémon like her. Kel tells her how she should date David, just like she does in the Genesis of the Love Hogs issue of Sonichu. He's also about three times my size. Then Sonichu knocks on the door and asks for food. Rose Chu is excited that she found another Pokemon like her, and she drags him inside, and we get a recreation of Chris's drawing of these events. Rose Chu even quotes Chris's, You can call me anytime, line but she passes it off as her stumbling nervously instead of thinking that it's actually a good pickup line. They chow down on Brunswick stew, and Sonichu tells Rose Chu that he killed the perfect chaos monster with a thunderbolt. This upsets Rose Chu because it means that she is actually still alone in her inability to use her abilities. Kel wants to keep Sonichu at the cabin for a week until the Pokemon professor can arrive, thinking that Sonichu is too strong to capture. She wants Rose Chu to flirt with him, to get him to stay. Then it gets kinda awkward. So as you might remember, the Idea Guys convinced Chris that Rose Chu was born male and is trans. So Rose Chu tells Kel that she was born male, which is why she's a male Pikachu tail. She only became female when the rainbow energy hit her. Kel promises she'll do anything for Rosie if Rosie gets Sonichu to stay, but Rosie quickly gets tired of Sonichu's shtick. Cut to Liquid Chris leaning over a laptop. He's talking on the phone to one of his allies. They've been tracking Sonichu and Rose Chu, trying to find more creatures that were created by Solid Chris. They say Solid is too powerful to be confronted directly, and they need to gather an army. Rose Chu starts basically babysitting Sonichu, and he's so nice that she starts falling in love with him, but he's totally oblivious. One night they're sitting under the moon, telling each other purposefully bad pickup lines like, I could see us doing Meowth to Meowth, and as often as birds tweet, you are my lovely heart sweet. Yes, that has to be recontextualized as to being a bad pickup line. 
Sanachu tells Rosechu that if Kel puts her in a PC box, he'll zap her to the extreme. Then they kiss under the fireworks. So Rosechu and Kel are walking and arrive at Quickville. Rosechu's speech bubble cuts off the A in Virginia, so it spells virgin, and that's kind of kind of funny. So they're here because Kel has a surprise for Rosie. That surprise is a Pokemon gym battle. But Rosie still doesn't have her powers, but she hasn't told Kel this, so that's a problem. It turns out that Chris is the gym leader, and Kel ignores Rosechu's protests, and she sends her out to face him. Chris falls on the ground, and Kel laughs, and says that he better get used to being on the ground because they're about to beat him into the dirt. And Chris says, no, it is you who will be gonna be on in the ground soon enough. Cut to the battle's announcer, who owns a mini Sonichu named, of course, Jamsta. So Kel is sending out other Pokemon before Rosechu, and is just utterly destroying Chris. Rosechu gets excited that she might not have to battle. Chris sends out his Blaziken, and Dragonite gets him down to 1 HP. Kel decides to send out Rosechu to deal the last blow to show off that she owns a Rosechu. Rosechu starts trying to explain to Kel that she can't use her powers, and Chris tells Blaziken to attack Rosie. The Blaziken smashes her face in, and then Kel sends out Dragonite, and he finishes off Blaziken. Back home, Kel tells Rosie that everyone chokes up once in a while. Then, Rosie explodes and tells Kel what's actually on her mind. She's worried that Kel will put her in the PC box forever because she can't use her abilities anymore. In response, Kel stomps on and breaks Rose Chu's Pokeball, meaning that she can never be captured again. Kel then decides to tell Rosie why she never gave her a name, and the chapter ends. Chapter 2 Lost Rose Chu has a bad dream about a large purple Pokemon, and then the next day goes to hang out with Sonichu. Sonichu is upset that she was hurt in the gym battle, and he freaks out. They go back to Kel's house, and they tell Sonichu that the professor is coming by later that day. Kel is going to the Pokemon Center to release all her Pokemon to good homes, and Rosechu and Sonichu are going to go to the mall to get new clothes for Rosechu. Kel tells Rosechu not to spend over a hundred dollars, and she tells Sonichu to make sure that she doesn't overspend. This is the same thing that happens in Chris's original Sonichu comic. Cut back to Liquid Chris, monitoring Sonichu. They're measuring his speed. There's no telling how powerful he really is. Liquid asks why Solid Chris chose to give an already-owned Pokémon Sonichu powers. He questions why Chris would make it so that she couldn't use Thunderbolt. His partner suggests that it's because Chris is sexist. Liquid says they have time because Chris is busy trying to find the Sonichu balls. Then, a bombshell is dropped on us. His partner is Mao, one of the Asperchu Four. At the mall, Sonichu tells Rosechu that his parents disowned him after he became Sonichu, which is also canon in Chris's series. But he's found a new father. Then Chris walks by, and Sonichu calls him Father. Sonichu tries to get Chris to explain to Rosie how he's Sonichu's father, but Chris obviously doesn't want to, and so he mashes the elevator button to try to escape. Sonichu tells Rosie that Chris is her father too, and then the two go to the food court to eat. Sonichu's burger comes with pickles. He tries them, and he hates them, of course. Sonichu starts choking on the pickle. Then, Zapdos crashes through the ceiling, Nate Cirque on his back, looking for Chris. He captures Rosie, and Sonichu has to fight back. The two do battle, and Rosechu calls Kel for help. Rosechu punches Zapdos, and it drops her. Sonichu catches her, and then the Zapdos flies away, and Sonichu chases it. Sonichu zaps Zapdos and defeats it. Nate Cirque is concerned, so he sends out Raikou and rides away on it. Chris comes in, and he sort of griffs on Sonichu's success. He pretends that he deserves the glory, too. Kel gets mad at Chris because Chris is claiming to have discovered Sonichu's, and Kel believes that she discovered them when Rosechu evolved. Chris claims he created Sonichu, and this makes Kel even more angry. Kel is pissed because the Pokemon professor wanted to charge her money to look at the Sonichu's and give her credit. She decides that it's time to move back home to Kanto and leave Quickville, which upsets Rosechu because she's in love with Sonichu, and Sonichu is obviously staying because Chris is the mayor of Quickville. 
Sanju doesn't understand why she wants to leave, so Roshu starts telling him Kel's backstory. At 10 years old, Kel became Pokemon Champion in Kanto. Her mom didn't really care about Kel's Pokemon dream, and wanted Kel to go back to school. Kel says there's a whole system for trainers going to school, but her mom refuses to let her use it. I'm not going to pay for this program just so you can keep chasing Pokemon. Kel says she doesn't want to go to college, she wants to be a Pokemon Champion. Her mom asks her how she'll make money. Interning for Professor Oak? She says Oak and other professors exploit trainers, and Kel says that's not true, they help trainers, and that her mom just blames them for what happened to Dad. If you want someone to blame for Dad's death, you should blame yourself. Then Kel's mom slaps her across the face. This page was drawn in March 2017, and then this page was drawn in August 2019. Kel's mom has a flashback of the cave collapsing, and she's trying to save her husband. Then she cries and realizes that she hit her daughter. Then, nothing, because this is the end of the comic. The writer stopped updating it, and the most recent page is from 2019. Sorry for the cliffhanger. So Chris began to copy Rose Chu's story for his own issue number 15 in July 2019. He recreated the classic cover of issue number 0, but he's now depicting himself as female. Let's see if you can catch some of the parallels. This panel of Pichu and her family is taken directly from Rose Chu's story. So Pikachu, the male one that becomes Sonichu later, is five miles from Station Square. It only took over ten years for Chris to fix that typo. Pikachu is supposed to be turning his head to look at something behind him, but it just looks like his head is on backward. Chris's drawing of Pikachu and other people's characters is still just as disturbing as I said it was in issue zero. This is their full story, and truly nothing less. So Chris has changed it from being Sonichu's story to their story, adding Rosechu in as a main player in the story. He also claims it's their full, true story, meaning it's basically just a retcon. So Sonic hits Pikachu, with the added detail that it's just outside a YMCA, and now 67 Sonichu eggs are born from the Rainbow Energy. The Rainbow Energy also hits a Raichu many miles away, and she transforms into Rose Chu. So Sonichu starts fighting the perfect chaos monster. These drawings are kind of worse than the original, and Chris also stops coloring it six pages in. Sonichu and Sonic defeat the perfect chaos monster, and Sonichu goes home to find his parents gone. He finds what looks like a Pokeball with the words, Made by Al-Qaeda written on it. The implication is that Al-Qaeda caught his parents. This goes against Sonichu saying his parents disowned him after his transformation. Sonichu heads south to New Jersey, and then takes a train further south to Virginia. Since the train is heading right for Quickville, and Chris needs Sonichu to end up outside Rosechu's house, he devises an excuse to have Sonichu get off the train. And that excuse is a laboratory exploded and derailed the train so Sonichu ran away. That's, uh, that's, that's very heroic. Thank you, Sonichu. On this page, Chris colors Rose Chu's shirt, which makes her look like a hot dog. Remember how the entire plot of Rose Chu's story was that Rose Chu couldn't do electricity, so she's upset that she might be sent to the PC forever? I look super different. My only consolation is that I still have my personality and ability to store electricity. But my cheek sack output hardly works, and these new legs are tough on me. I'm slowed down and offbeat. I don't know if Kel will keep me on her team the way I am now. Please, Kelly, not the PC. So yeah, plot point stolen directly from Rose Chu's story, and panel stolen directly from Rose Chu's story, and Kel saying she's happy that Oak said she's the first to discover Rose Chu's. The next page is a flashback to when Rose Chu evolved and when Kel discovered she could talk, then halfway down the page it flashes forward to where we just left off. Kel says Rosie should date David, her Dragonite, and Rosie says, Dragonite is about three times my size. So after three rewrites of this page, finally the double entendre is gone, and we understand that Chris literally just meant that the Dragonite is physically too large for her. Sonichu knocks on the door, and Rosie lets him in. My name's Rosie, but you can call me anytime, etc, 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 it's the same scene. Chris notes that Sonichu is 3 feet 5 inches tall, and that their ears are 7 inches tall, making them 3 foot 10. Chris states that this makes Kel 5 foot 10, 2 feet taller than Sonichu and Rosechu. You'll note that a lot of the panels are spaced better than Chris's normal drawings. He has a lot of background details and proper word bubble placing, because he's copying from Rosechu's story. 
Kel serves them stew, and Sanju gulps it down just like he did in Rose Chu's story. Rose Chu thinks to herself that since evolving into Rose Chu, she's been able to handle hotter food. And I guess that this is Chris justifying that in Rose Chu's story, Sanju was able to gulp down the hot food. Because I guess he just didn't understand that that scene in Rose Chu's story was trying to depict that Sanju had bad manners. And Chris either didn't understand this or didn't want Sanju to have bad manners. So now he's added the ability to Sanju's and Rose Chu's that they can eat hot food. Rose Chu asks Sanju if he's seen any changes in his abilities, and Sanju says he feels stronger, so Rose Chu is upset because she feels weaker. She doesn't say anything about this, and in Rose Chu's story, this is the cause of a lot of tension. Her unspoken lack of confidence eventually bursts to the surface over time. Sanju being clueless is an important part of the story, but Chris doesn't want to depict his main character, Mary Sue, as bad mannered, so Sanju thinks to himself that he should leave Rosie to herself so that she can feel better. And Chris notes that, wild animals typically can read body language to communicate, some of which are empathetic of the other. Sanju is smart like that. You can be too. So Sanju gets up to leave, but Kel doesn't want him to leave, just like in Rose Chu's story. So she makes dessert. Kel scans Sanju with her Pokedex, and it says Sanju is 4 feet tall and 120 pounds, which puts him as obese on the BMI chart. Sanju decides to put a spoon on his nose to cheer up Rose Chu. Chris traces this panel again from Rose Chu's story. So then Kel and Rose Chu talk about Rose Chu being born male. It's basically the same conversation with Kel saying that Rose Chu's sex was never important to their training, and Rose Chu pointing out that she has a male tail. Seriously, Kel, you never once noticed my tail is pointed, much less my wee wee. <sighs> Rose Chu is upset that Kel never paid attention to her and brings up how Kel never gave her a name. And your aunt Patrice is not an excuse. Chris, Chris, what, what, what does that mean? Is Chris implying that Kel having a period is an excuse for not giving Rose to a name over many years of her owning her? Is this some reference that no one but Chris understands, or is it actually that? Why is this in here? What am I doing with my life? Sonichu can run on water. Sonichu is Jesus. We cut back to Kel and Rose Chu making a deal. Unlike in Rose Chu's story, we have no idea what this deal is. In Rose Chu's story, the deal was to make sure that Sonichu stayed for a week even if it meant flirting with him. Rose Chu asks Sonichu's favorite color, and this is the exact same scene as in Rose Chu's story. Sonichu stays at their house, and while in bed he takes off his shoes and Chris notes that Sonichu's do have toes. That, that's, just, that's just great. Chris also notes that zap buds were created when lightning zapped a field. Just, just a field. Not like special lightning or any other special field. It's just lightning hit a field and that created zap buds. Because it's, it's, you know, it's very uncommon for lightning to hit grass. Chris copies more panels from Rose Chu's story, but he destroys its competent storytelling by spoiling to the reader that Rose Chu's, despite not having electricity stacks in their cheeks, can shoot electricity from their hands. That ruins the entire plot and destroys any conflict. Sanchu and Rose Chu fall in love over time, just like in Rose Chu's story, and Chris cuts to a Lux Ray, Rose Chu's father, and Magichan watching over them as guardian animals, or guardian angels, or something, one of those two. Chris then copies the entire Meowth to Meowth scene, and has Rose Chu say that the as often as birds tweet, you are my lovely heart sweet line is awful. The next page is also copied directly from Rose Chu's story. Then they kiss. Sanju picks up Rose Chu and they run back to his room, lock the door, draw the curtains, and Rose Chu gets naked and shows off to Sanju that she's trans. Sanju implies that Rose Chu has both sex organs, and then, as a narrator, says, Yep, I accepted Rosie as she was back then. She would become all woman with the surgery before her birthday in 2008. Bluntly, her dick became useless in 07, dormant as it became. It never popped out again, and it started being like an aching appendix. This is, uh, this is rated Y7 for, uh, for everyone, for kids. Sonichu then has a dream that he has to go to the Quickville Mall to find Chris. So, Sonichu wakes up and goes, alone, and he finds him. This is how Chris draws himself there. He's, he's never going to be consistent, is he? Chris bows to Sonichu, and tells him that their guardian angel is Magichan, and that he, Chris, had been in contact with his self-counterpart in the real world. Chris adds gigantic bubbles of text that all amount to him saying, you have your powers because it's destiny and Sonic hit you while he was in supersonic form. 
Chris also tells Sonichu that Rose Chu will get her powers back soon, meaning that including that plot point in this reimagining of Rose Chu's story means nothing. Chris explains that he has to catch Sonichu so that no one else can catch him, but that he promises to never trap him inside his Pokeball. Magichan then explains the multiverse to Sonichu, saying that they were all created by Chris Chan from the real world 1218, and that Sonichu should call Chris his father, although he alludes to the fact that he might change someday when Chris becomes trans. Sonichu is confused, and Magichan says he'll explain more in a moment, but Chris is late to a Pokemon gym battle, so he tells Sonichu to go out and zap to the extreme. I will. Thank you, father. I'm glad that after 15 issues, we're finally reaching the moment depicted on the front cover of issue zero. Magichan tells Sonichu that, at that very moment, Chris of 1218 is writing what they're saying, and Sonichu is amazed by this. Then Magichan tells him that, at many points in the future, the people are reading what they speak. Hey, hey, that, that's us. That's me and you. It's you, the viewer. Yay. Sonichu then sees Kel and Rosechu lower down on the page, and Magichan tells him to ignore them. Kel says, if you were a male before your transformation, would that mean that Sonichu is gay? Oh, please. Only you humans worry about that kind of stuff. Rosechu says it's been hard learning to walk on two legs, and it's been hard getting used to having both a penis and a vagina. She wishes she could meet another Rosechu. Then, Bubbles' Rosechu falls out of the sky for no reason, and Rosechu asks her if she's a girl, and Bubbles says that all Rosechus are girls. Bubbles then freaks out upon learning that Rosechu was born a Pichu, and says that it was foretold throughout generations that the first Rosechu and Sonichu would be born as such. Apparently, Magichan told her this psychically. Then Bubbles runs off because she's busy. Rosechu and Kel arrive at the Welcome to Quickville sign, and Chris doesn't have the blocking to make it say virgin, so obviously he missed that joke in the original. This is page 50, by the way. We're 50 pages into this comic. Chris then jumps to page 64, obviously bored with Rosechu's storyline, because he wants to get back to Sonic Juice. But then he left this room here to maybe come back and revisit Rose Juice. Magitan tells Sonichu that Team Rocket attacked his Pikachu village, and their wheezing used a gas attack to kill Sonichu's parents. This was something that the Idea Guys told Chris that Chris didn't realize was a Holocaust reference. Then the issue ends. That's as far as Chris got with Sonichu 15. It's still a work in progress, but Chris hasn't touched it in about six months as of the recording of this video. Much like the comic it's ripping off, it ends with no conclusion, only halfway completed. Maybe Chris will finish it one day, but until then, there is, surprisingly, another issue of Sonichu to talk about. Loving you is easy cause you're beautiful. Making love with you is all I wanna do. Loving you is more than just a dream come true. And everything that I do is out of loving you. La 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 do 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 do. No one else can make me feel the colors that you bring. Stay with me while we grow old. And we will live each day in the springtime. Cause loving you has made my life so beautiful. And every day my life is filled with loving you. Loving you, I see your soul come shining through. And every time that we you. I'm more in love with you. La 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 do 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 do. I love you.
Sonnet 2 issue 16 began production in 2017, and we have no idea how far into production it is. The cover is traced or copied from the Panda Halo art that was used for Sonnet 2 number 10. This is the Count Graduan issue that Chris promised back in issue number 11, but it's been delayed due to the Idea Guy's hold over him. We only know of its existence at all because Chris spilled brown paint over the first four pages. He then sold those four pages online as collector's items. If he's ever going to redraw them is a mystery, and if they're ever going to be canon, although I don't even know what Sanchu canon is anymore, after he redraws them is unknown. So let's get into what little content there is, Sonichu issue 16. Count Graduan, if you remember, was an ancient evil who fought alongside Mary Lee Walsh against Chris's Native American ancestors hundreds of years ago, and his spirit was trapped inside of an orb, then Chris broke the orb, and Count Graduan still exists as some sort of force and is now Chris's ally. But apparently he looks like this. Graduan tells us he's going to be the narrator of his backstory and the many lives he's lived. Chris decides that he wants to use the issue 13 format of some random pictures and boxes of text instead of trying to make it resemble an actual comic. Graduan was first born in 1433 Britain. At age 15 he learned how to use a sword and fought against the French in the Hundred Years' War. A French soldier mortally wounded him, and Graduan spoke a curse that he would one day return. This is very similar to the backstory of Demise from The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. This French soldier looks a lot like Link, and with that hat I feel it has to be on purpose. Keep in mind that Chris already has a Ganondorf type character named Clawdorf. In the afterlife, someone approaches Graduan. Nothing is over for you yet. Chris notes that it's not God and not Satan, it's a man in a chicken mask. Graduan is confused by this. He is then reborn in 1733. He says that living through this time of technological advancement was intriguing. He joins the British Army in America and is involved in the Boston Massacre, killing colonist civilians. Then he fought in the Revolution and went back to London when it ended. He moved in with a Jewish family and practiced magic for 10 years before dying of old age. Graduan was born again in 1887. He fights in both World War I and World War II, and it says he killed a lot of French and German soldiers. Does that mean that he switched sides between the wars? Or what? Does, does that mean that Chris doesn't know which sides the countries fought on in the world wars? Or did the idea guys lie to him and confuse him? That's not entirely clear. Graduan is apparently most well known for Operation Market Garden in World War II, which Chris does not elaborate on and just says is a failure. Operation Market Garden was a real thing in World War II, and it was a failure, but it just it doesn't explain how Count Graduan was involved in it at all. And that's it. Chris has to finish multiple issues of Sonichu before getting back to this one, and at the moment he doesn't seem interested in writing his comic books at all. So, uh, why isn't this video over? Because ponies. There's a fan game from My Little Pony called Twilight Sparkle's Secret Chip Fic Folder, and as far as I can tell, the card game is essentially open source, like Anybody can just make new cards for it, and people sell their homemade cards at conventions and stuff. So Chris made multiple sets out of the characters from his Sonichu universe and his version of Equestria. He made new art, and got his friends and followers to make new art for his set, and he's been working on that for months at this point. He said on Twitter that to him, the card game is the same as the comic book, because it's moving along the story of the Sonichu characters. So like there's a card where Chris yells at the executives of Hasbro to make new seasons of My Little Pony. So to Chris, this actually happens in the Sonichu universe. Let's look at some cards. Most TCG cards have something called flavor text. It's extra non-game affecting text on a card that says something about the game's universe. Sometimes it's a quote or a description. So like a Pokemon card will have a Pokedex entry, or a magic card will say something like, Bullis remade this place in his image. He has the advantage here. We must approach carefully. Jace Bellerin. So Chris puts flavor text in his game, too. The point of this game is to ship My Little Pony characters, and shipping means putting characters into relationships. So like, when you read Magichan's flavor text, you think you can just ship me with anyone? I ship myself with my loved ones, my allies, and friends, and my neighbors. So Magichan is saying that he everyone around him, which is actually true in Sonichu. 
There's a Robert card for Chris's father, who he thinks is alive in Quickville. He served in the U.S. Army stationed in the Signal Corps during the Korean War, and was employed by General Electric for 25 plus years. He transitioned into a Sanju form in late 2016 in C-197. He is helping out at the Quickville Basilicom and in battle. If you don't think that this was insane and unhealthy, Chris has another Bob card where he draws him next to a picture of Barb, saying that he visits often. Chris drops lore about Princess Zelina, saying that she and Darkbind actually exist in the Zelda universe, saying that Zelina is friends with Zelda and trained under her. Blake's megaform is Silver Blake Sonichu, and he is able to insta-teleport and appear behind his foes to take them out in a single sweep. The description of Blake is literally, teleports behind you, nothing personnel, kid. There's a Lego Sonichu card, which just… just why? This one, Chris photoshopped a character from My Little Pony on top of one of his drawings. Chris believes that he can see the future and has had prophetic dreams before, so of course he thinks that Magichan can tell the future. He was told that Friendship is Magic would last until Season 14, and then it ended in Season 9. So now we have the card for My Little Pony Friendship is Magic Seasons 9-14. through 14. Here on Discovery Family, see the main six return for more epic and developing adventures. See more ponies come in from the background and beyond to make the impacts. And see how came to be the frowned table of friendship. Don't miss My Little Pony Friendship is Magic Season 10, coming in April 2020, only on Discovery Family. Discovery Family, channel and at Hasbro Inc. So yeah, this is just Chris wishing for things, and he's angry that they aren't happening. When Chris retconned the names of characters like Wes and Mary Lee Walsh, he also changed the name of some fictional characters. Dr. Robotnik became Ren Skysor. But between the time when Chris made that change, and when he decided that Ren and Robotnik exist side by side in the dimensional merge, the character didn't appear in a new comic, so I never covered him. But uh, this is him. Chris decided to let his fans make their own cards. I think through his Patreon, maybe? Anyway, here is Aspertu kissing Sonichu. Here's one of Blue Spike, a troll who pretended to be one of Chris's girlfriends. You have Liquid Chris, Chris's shirt, Chris arriving in Kitasuna with Jacob Sockness, and then there's a lot more that the Quickie hasn't archived, and I'm not going to pay for Chris's cards to view them all. It is currently July 2020, and this is the end of Sonichu. I will update this series more the next time Chris completes an issue. I will not be making incremental updates if Chris puts out a few more pages or something, but I probably will be talking about those more in my weekly Chris Chan series, if they ever happen. Thank you for watching. I began production on this video in February 2019. I've been working on it for 17 months. The script for this video is about 110 pages long, and it looks like it's come out to about five and a half hours. The amount of work that I put into this was just insane, and the mental anguish of having to read and then try to understand Sonichu is unfathomable. I really just have to say thanks for sticking with me throughout this whole thing, watching all the videos, being there for the premieres with me, those were awesome, and especially thanks to all the patrons who donated to me while I was doing this. I don't care if you're not a patron of mine anymore, I'm still going to give you a shout out now. A Humble Narcissist. Ah, Tacos. Angel. Ash Perler. Blue Coon. Elijah. Evan. Greedy. Hunter. Hypercube Labs. Jose. Joseph. Caitlin. Parlin. Poe. Randy. Shadow Nexa. Snotling. Steve, twitch.tv slash Suma Breakup, Benjamins, Yellow Fever, and Zen Shi, and a special shout out to Shiny Flame 307. I would also like to thank everybody in the comments and on the live streams who corrected me and gave me more information about the videos after I had published them. That way I could correct them in this large video. And also a special thank you to the Quickie, where I got a lot of information from, and where I got the pictures that I use in the background of these videos from. I will continue to update you on Chris Chan, and I will continue to update you on Sonichu when more information comes out. Please, stay tuned. Sonic shoes, absolute lightning, hey,
shallow color Feeling the condensation Living in my nation Lemon makes lemonade And mellow color Traveling without a map Is like traveling with no map Take a chill pill and dance Yellow is a mellow color Mellow Hopefully they won't make a play as yellow Somehow for Sonic Shoe and friends will zip and zap. This little monkey, he likes to play around. He eats a bunch of bananas. Never put a banana in your pajamas. Yellow is a mellow color. Yellow is a mellow color. Yes, it is. It's a mellow color. Sonic Chew zaps the lighting. A mellow color. Yellow is a mellow color. Yes, it is. It's a mellow color. Sonic Chew zaps the lighting.